Part One, Chapter One of The Gambler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Gambler by Catherine Cecil Thurston. An eight mile drive over rain washed Irish roads in the quick falling dust of autumn is an experience trying to the patience, even to the temper, of the average Saxon. Yet James Milbank made neither comment nor objection as mile after mile of roadway spun away like a ribbon behind him as the mud rose in showers from the wheels of the old-fashioned trap in which he sat, and the half-trained mare between the shafts swerved now to the right, now to the left, her nervous glance caught by the spectral shapes of the blackthorn hedges or the motionless forms of the wayside donkeys lying asleep in the ditches. Perhaps this stoicism was the outcome of an innate power to endure. Perhaps it was a merely negative quality, illustrating the lack of that doubtful blessing, imagination. But whatever its origin, it stood him in good stead, as he covered the long stretch of flat country that links the southeastern seaport of Muskiri with the remote fishing village of Carrig Moor and its outlying district of Orristown. His outlook upon Ireland, like his outlook upon life, was untinged by humor. He had seen no ground for amusement in the fact that he had been the only passenger to alight from the train at the Muskiri terminus, and consequently no ground for loneliness in the sight of the solitary vehicle dimly silhouetted against the murky sky that had awaited his coming. The ludicrous points of the scene, the primitive railway station with its insufficient flickering lights, its little knot of inquisitive idlers, its one porter, slovenly, amiable, incorrigibly lazy, all contributing the unconscious background to his own neat, conventional, totally alien personality, had left him untouched. The only individual to whom the picture had made its appeal had been the solitary porter. As he relieved Milbank of his valise and rug on the step of the first-class carriage, an undeniable twinkle had gleamed in his eyes. "'Fine soft night, sir,' he had volunteered. "'Tim Burke is outside for you.' For a second Milbank had stared at him in a mixture of doubt and displeasure. A month's pilgrimage to the ancient Celtic landmark had left him, as it has left many a Saxon before him, unlearned in that most interesting and most inscrutable of all survivals, the Celt himself. He had surveyed the face of the porter cautiously and half distrustfully. Then he had made a guarded reply. I am certainly expecting a... a conveyance, he had admitted, but I have never heard of Tim Burke. Why, then Tim has heard of you, the other had replied with unruffled suavity. Isn't it the English gentleman that's going to stop with Mr. Ashland over at Orristown that you are? Sure, Tim told me all about you and I knew the minute I sat eyes on you, let alone there was no one else in the train. Without more ado he had hoisted Milbank's belongings to his shoulder and lounged out of the station. "'Here ye are, Tim Man,' he had exclaimed as he deposited the articles one after another under the seat of the trap with a lofty disregard of their owner. "'Tis a soft night and a long road you have before you. Is it cold the mare is?' He had paused to eye the impatient young animal before him with the Irishman's unfailing appreciation of horse-flesh. Here Milbank, feeling that some veiled reproof had been suggested, had broken in upon the monologue. "'I hope I haven't injured the horse by the delay,' he had said hastily. The train was exactly twenty-two minutes behind its time. Then, for the first time, the old coachman had bent down from his lofty position and sure what harm if it was sir he had exclaimed voicing the hospitality due to his master's guest what hurry is there at all so long as it brought you safe true you are tim the porter had interjected softly and seizing milbank's arm he had swung him into the trap precisely as he had swung the luggage 
a few seconds previously. "'Thank you, sir,' he had murmured a moment later. "'Good night to you. Good night, Tim. Safe road.' and drawing back he had looked on with admiration while Burke had gathered up the reins and the mare had plunged forward into the misty, sea-scented night. That had been Milbank's first introduction into the district where he proposed to spend a week with a man he had not seen for nearly thirty years. As the trap moved forward, leaving the straggling town with its scattered lights far behind, his thoughts temporarily distracted by the incidents of his arrival, reverted to the channel in which they had run during the greater part of the day. Again his mind returned to the period of his college career when, as a quiet student, he had been drawn by the subtle attraction of contrast into a friendship with Dennis Ashland, the young Irishman whose spirit, whose enthusiasms, whose exuberant joy in life had shown in such vivid colors beside his own neutral-tinted personality. His thoughts passed methodically from those eager early days to the more sober ones that had followed Ashland's recall to Ireland, and thence onward over the succeeding tale of years. He reviewed his own calm, if somewhat lonely, manhood, his aimless delving first into one branch of learning, then into another, his gradually dawning interest in the study of archaeology an interest that, fostered by ample leisure and ample means, had become the temperate and well-ordered passion of his life. The retrospect was pleasant. There is always an agreeable sensation to a man of Milbank's temperament in looking back upon unruffled times. He became oblivious of the ruts in the road and of the mare's erratic movements as he traced the course of events to the point where, two months before, the discovery of a dozen gold platters and as many drinking vessels embedded in a bog in the county Tyrone had turned the eyes of the archaeological world upon Ireland, and he, with other students of antiquity, had been bitten with the desire to see the unique and priceless objects for himself. The journey to Tyrone had been a pleasant experience, and it was there, under the mild exaltation of the genuine find, that it had suddenly been suggested to his mind that certain ancient ruins, including a remarkable specimen of the Irish Round Tower, were to be found on the southeast coast not three miles from the property of his old college friend. Whether it was the archaeological instinct to resurrect the past, or the merely human wish to relive his own small portion of it that had prompted him to write to Ashland must remain an open question. It is sufficient that the letter was written and dispatched, and that the answer came in hot haste. It had reached him in the form of a telegram running as follows, Come at once, and stay for a year, stagnating to death in this isolation, Ashland. An hour later another, and a more voluminous message, had followed in which, as if by an afterthought, he had been given the necessary directions as to the means of reaching Oristown. It was at the point where his musings reached Ashland's telegrams that he awakened from his reverie and looked about him. For the first time a personal interest in the country through which he was passing stirred him. He realized that the salt sting of the sea had again begun to mingle with the night mist, and judged thereby that the road had again emerged upon the coast. He noticed that the hedges had become sparser, that wherever a tree loomed out of the dusk it bore the mark of the sea-gales in a certain grotesqueness of shape. This was the isolation of which Ashland had spoken. With an impulse extremely uncommon to him, he turned in his seat and addressed the silent old coachman beside him. "'Has your master altered much in thirty years?' he asked. There was silence for a while. Old Burke, with the deliberation of his class, liked to weigh his words before giving them utterance. "'Is it, Mr. Dennis, changed?' he repeated at last. Then, almost immediately, he corrected himself. "'Sure, tis Mr. Ashland I ought to be saying, sir, but the old name slips out. Though the poor master is gone these twenty-nine year, the Lord have mercy on him, I can never get it into me head that tis to Mr. Dennis we ought to be looking.' More than once, during his brief stay in Ireland, 
Millbank had been confronted with this annihilation of time in the Irish mind, and Burke's statement aroused no surprise. "'Has he changed?' he asked again in his dry, precise voice. Burke was silent while the mare pulled hard on the reins, and having regained his mastery over her, he looked down on his companion. "'Is it changed?' he said. "'Sure, why wouldn't he be changed? With the father gone, and the wife gone, and the children growing up. Sure tis changed we all are, and going down the hill fast, God help us.' Milbank glanced up sharply. "'Children,' he said. "'Children!' Burke turned in his seat. "'Sure, tisn't to have the old stock die out you'd be wantin', he said. You'd travel the round of the county before you'd see the like of Mr. Dennis's children, though tis girls they are. Girls! Milbank's mind was disturbed by the thought of children. Dennis Ashland with children! The idea was incongruous. Two of them, said Burke laconically. Dear me, dear me, and yet I suppose it's only natural. How old are they? Burke flicked the mare lightly, and the trap latched forward. Miss Clodaw is turned fifteen, he said, and the youngster is going on ten. Twas ten year back come next December that she was born. Sure, I remember it well. And six weeks after, Mr. Dennis was following her poor mother to the churchyard beyond in Carrickmoor. The Lord keep us all. "'Twas she was the nice quiet creature, and Miss Nance is the livin' stamp of her. But God bless us, tis Miss Clodaw that's her father's child." He added this last remark with a force that at the time conveyed nothing, though it was destined to recur later to Milbank's mind. "'But your master,' the stranger repeated. The momentary diversion of the children had ceased to hold him. Again the vision of Ashland. Ashland, the impetuous hero of past days, had risen intangible, mirage-like, and yet compelling from his native stretch of rugged country. But Burke made no reply. All his energies were directed to the guiding of the mare down a steep incline. For a space Millbank was conscious of a dangerously accelerated pace. Then the white piers of a large gate sped past them, and he was aware of the black shadow of overhanging trees. Something unusual, something faintly prophetic and only vaguely comprehended, touched his prosaic nature at that moment. He was entering on a new phase of life. Without conscious preparation he was to see the world from a new point of view. With a fresh spur of anxious curiosity he turned again to Burke. "'But your master,' he asked, "'has he changed much?' will I see a great alteration. For an added space the old man remained mute while he piloted the trap up the sweep of avenue with that irresistible desire for a fine finish that animates every Irish driver. Then, as they spun round the final curve, as the great square house loomed out of the mist, he replied without slackening his vigilance. Is it changed? he repeated half to himself. Sure, if the Almighty doesn't change a man in thirty year, it stands to raisin that the devil must. End of chapter one. Chapter two. To English ears the reply was curious. Yet with all its vagueness, all its racial inclination towards high color, it held the germ of truth that frequently lies in such utterances. With native acuteness it threw out a suggestion without betraying a confidence. An instant after it was spoken there was a final flourish of the whip, a scrape of wheels on the wet gravel, a straining and creaking of damp leather, and the trap drew up before the big white house. Millbank caught a fleeting suggestion of a shabby door with pillars on which rested a square balcony of rusty iron, a number of unlighted windows, a general air of grandeur and decay curiously blended. Then the hall door opened, and a voice whose first note roused a hundred memories rolled out across the darkness. "'Is that you, James? Come in, come in. Keep the mare in hand, Burke. Steady now, James. Let me hold the rug and give you a hand down. She's a little rogue and might be making a bolt for her stable. Well, you're as welcome as the flowers in May. Come in, come in.' It was over in a flash, the arrival the tempestuous greeting, 
the hard grip of Ashland's hand, and the two men were facing each other in the candlelit hall. "'Well, you're welcome, James,' Ashland repeated. "'You're welcome. Let me have a look at you. I declare it's younger you are.' He laid his hand heavily on the other's shoulder and uttered this obvious untruth with all the warmth and conviction that Irish imagination and Irish hospitality could suggest. "'But you've perished after the long drive. Burke,' he called through the open door. "'Burke, when you're done with the mare, come round and carry up Mr. Milbank's baggage. Now, James.' He wheeled round again, catching up a silver candlestick from the hall table. Now, if you come upstairs, I'll show you where we're going to billet you. With long, hasty steps he crossed the hall, his tall figure casting gaunt shadows on the bare and lofty wall. We're a trifle unsophisticated here, he went on with a loud, hard laugh, but at last we'll give you enough to eat and a bed to lie on. After all, a decent dinner and a warm welcome are the bone and sinew of hospitality the world over, unless they include a drop of something to put life into a man. He paused, turning round upon his guest. By Jupiter, that reminds me. Have a small drink before we go another step, just to take the cold out of you? Milbank, who was close behind him, glanced up. He saw his host's face more clearly than he had seen it in the hall. His answer, when it came, was hurried and a little confused. No, Dennis, no, he said. Nothing, nothing, I assure you. Ashland laughed again. Still the same stickler, he said. How virtues cling to a man. He turned and began to mount the stairs. Then, reaching the first door on the wide corridor, he paused. Here's your habitation, he said. Burke will bring up your belongings and get you whatever you want. We dine in a quarter of an hour. He nodded and was turning away when a fresh thought struck him. You may as well take this candle, he said. We haven't arrived at the civilization of gas. You might stumble over something looking for the matches. This is practically a bachelor establishment, you know, without any bachelor comforts. Once more he laughed and thrusting the candle into his guest's hand hurried away across the landing. In silence Milbank took the candle and, holding it uncertainly, waited until his host had disappeared. Then slowly he turned and entered the large bare bedroom. For a moment he hesitated, his eyes wandering from the faded window hangings to the stiff old-fashioned furniture. Finally, laying aside the candlestick, he sat down upon the side of the forbidding-looking four-post bedstead. What motive prompted him to the action he could scarcely have defined. He was strangely moved by the scene just gone through, stirred in a manner that he could never have anticipated. For the moment the precise matter-of-fact archaeologist was submerged, and the man, dry, narrow, pedantic perhaps, but nevertheless capable of human sentiments, was uppermost. The sight of Ashland, the sound of his voice, and the touch of his hand had possessed an alchemy all their own. The past, that years of separation had dimmed and tarnished, had gleaned out from the shadows and taken shape before his eyes. The influence, the fascination that Ashland had once exercised, had touched him again at the first contact of personalities. But it was an altered fascination. The alloy of doubt and apprehension had tainted the old feeling. The question he had been prompted to ask Burke had answered itself at the first glimpse of his host's face. Indisputably, unmistakably, Ashland had changed. And in what lay that change? That was the question he put to himself as he sat on the bed, unconsciously noting the long, wavering flicker of the candle flame against the faded wallpaper. He had aged but the change did not lie with age alone. Something more relentless and more corroding than time had drawn the worn, discontented lines about the mouth, kindled the unnatural, restless glitter in the eyes, and changed the note of the voice from spontaneous vitality to recklessness. The change lay deeper. It lay in the heart and the soul of the man himself. With a sensation of doubt, of puzzled doubt and inexplicable disappointment, he rose, crossed the room, and, drawing the curtains over the windows, shut out the dark 
damp night. End of chapter two. Chapter three. It was nearly three quarters of an hour later that a tremendous bell clanging through the house announced that dinner had been served. A wash, a change of clothes, and a half hour of solitude had done much for Millbank. He felt more normal, less alienated by unfamiliar surroundings than he had done in the first confused moments that had followed his arrival. The vague sense of disappointment and apprehension, the vague suspicion that Ashland had undergone an immense alteration still tormented him, as half-apprehended evils ever torment the minds of those who see and study life as a thing apart from human nature. But the immediate effect of the feeling was less poignant. He unconsciously found himself anticipating the next glimpse of his old friend with a touch of curiosity, and when the announcement of dinner broke in upon his meditations he was surprised at the readiness with which he obeyed the summons. His first sight of the dining-room came pleasantly to his senses, numbed by the long ride and the bare coldness of his bedroom. It was large and lofty, three long curtained windows occupied one of its walls, while from the others numerous pictures of the dead and gone Ashlands looked out of their canvases from tarnished gold frames. The mahogany furniture, though of an ugly and ungainly type, was massive, and over the whole room, softening its severity and hiding the ravages of time, lay the warm red glow of a huge peat fire and the radiance of a dozen candles set in heavy silver sconces. He stood for a moment in the doorway, agreeably conscious of the mingled shadow and light. Then his attention was attracted to two figures already occupying the room. Ashlim himself was standing by the hearth, his back to the fire, his feet apart, while by his side, in evident nervous embarrassment, stood a little girl of nine or ten. Instantly he saw his guest, Ashland put his hand on the child's shoulder and pushed her forward. "'Here's the youngest shoot on the old tree, James,' he cried with a laugh. "'Shake hands with him, Nance.' Somewhat uncertainly and very shyly the child looked up and smiled. She was extremely pretty, with a gypsy-like prettiness new to Millbank. The only attribute she had inherited from her father's family was the clear olive skin that distinguished all the Ashlands. Her dark brown hair, her deep blue eyes, her peculiarly winning smile had all come to her from her dead mother. With an embarrassment almost equal to her own, Millbank extended his hand. The average modern child he ignored with comfortable superiority, but this small girl with her warm smile and her overwhelming shyness was something infinitely more different to deal with. He shifted his position uneasily. How do you do? he hazarded. How do you do, Nance? The little brown fingers stirred nervously in his clasp, and the child, still smiling, made some totally unintelligible reply. With a boisterous laugh, Ashland ended the situation. Easily known you're not a father, James, he cried. Why, you'd have given her a kiss and clinched the business fifty seconds ago. But you're starving. Where's that scamp clo? He turned again to the little girl who had drawn nearer to him for protection. She replied, but in so low a tone that Millbank heard nothing. A moment later he was enlightened by Ashland's loud voice. "'Did you ever hear of a thing like that, James?' he exclaimed. "'What would you say to a daughter who rides races on the strand in the dark of an October evening, with a mist enough to give your horses their death? Upon my word!' his face reddened. Then suddenly he paused and laughed. After all, what's bred in the bone, eh, James?' he said. "'I believe I'd have done the same myself at fifteen, maybe worse.' He checked himself, laughed again, then sighed. But catching Millbank's eye, he threw off the momentary depression and turned once more to Nance. "'Tell Hannah we won't wait any longer like a good child,' he said. "'There's no countin' on that scallywag.' As the child went quickly to the door, he motioned Millbank to the table and took his own place at its head. No ceremony here, he said. This is Liberty Hall. Taking up a decanter, he poured some sherry into his friend's glass, then, filling his own, drank the wine with evident satisfaction. 
"'Gradual decay is what we're suffering from here, James,' he went on. "'Everything in this country is too damned old. The only things in this house that have stood it are the wine and the silver. The rest, the woodwork, myself, and the linen are unsound, as you see.' He laughed again with a shade of sarcasm, and pointed to where a large hole in the damask tablecloth was only partially concealed by a splendid salt-cellar of Irish silver. Accumulated time is the disease we're suffering from. Tisn't the man who uses his time in this country, but the man who kills it who's mastered the art of living. Oh, we're a wonderful people, James. He slowly drained and slowly refilled his glass. As he laid down the decanter, the door opened and Nance appeared and quietly took her place at table. Almost immediately she was followed by Burke in a black coat and wearing a clean collar. For a second Millbank marveled at the domestic arrangements that could compress a valet, a butler, and a coachman into one easing-going personality. The next his attention was directed to two enormous dishes which were placed respectively before his host and himself. "'Just hermit's fare, James, the product of the land,' Ashland exclaimed as Burke uncovered the first dish, revealing a gigantic turkey. "'Will you cut yourself a shave and a ham?' With a passing sense of impotence, Millbank gazed at the great glistening ham. Then the healthy appetite that exposure to the sea air had aroused lent him courage, and he picked up a carving knife. But the execution of the ham was destined to postponement. Scarcely had he straightened himself to the task than a quick bang of the outer door was followed by hasty steps across the hall, and the last member of the household appeared upon the scene. Almost before he saw her, Millbank was conscious of her voice, high and clear with youthful vitality, softened and rendered piquant by native intonation. "'Oh, father, such a gallop, such fun, and I won! The bay cop was nowhere beside Polly. Larry was mad!' The string of words was poured forth in irresistible excitement before she had reached the door. Once inside she paused abruptly, her whole animated face flushing. "'Oh, I forgot,' she said in sudden naive dismay. She made a quaint picture as she stood there in the light of the candles and the fire, her slight, immature figure arrayed in a worn and old-fashioned riding habit, her hair covered by a boy's cloth cap, her fingers clasping one of her father's heavy hunting crops. But it was neither dress nor attitude that drew Milbank's eyes from the tasks before him, that incontinently sent his mind back thirty years to the days when Dennis Ashland had seemed to stand on the threshold of life and look forth, as by right divine, upon the pageant of the future. There was little physical likeness between the girl brimming with youth and vitality and the hard, prematurely aged man sitting at the head of the table, but the blood that glowed in the warm olive skin, the spirit that danced and gleamed in the hazel eyes, was the same blood and the same spirit that had captivated Millbank more than a quarter of a century before. The unlooked-for sensation held him spellbound, but almost rudely the spell was broken. Scarcely had Clodagh's exclamation of dismay escaped her than Ashland broke into one of his boisterous laughs. "'Forgot, did you?' he cried. "'Well, twas like you. Come here.' He put out his hand, and as he did so, a sudden expression of pride and affection softened his hard face. "'Here's the wildest scapegrace of an Ashland you've met yet, James,' he said. "'Shake hands with him, Clo,' he added in a different voice. "'He's a symbol, if you only knew it. He stands for the great glory we must all leave behind us, the glory of youth.' His voice sank suddenly to a lower key, and he raised his glass. "'Go on, child,' he added more quickly. "'Shake hands with him. Tell him he's welcome.' But Clodagh's flow of speech had been silenced. With a suggestion of the shyness that marked her sister, she came round the table as Millbank rose. She made no remark as she proffered her hand, and she did not smile as Nance had done. Instead her bright eyes scanned his face with a quick, questioning interest. In return he looked at her clear skin, her level eyebrows and proudly held head, and his awkwardness vanished as he took the slight muscular hand still cold from the night mist. "'How do you do?' he said. "'I've been hearing of you.' 
Again Clodagh colored and glanced at her father. "'What were you telling him, father?' she asked with native curiosity. Once more Ashland laughed loudly. "'Listen to her, James,' he said banteringly. "'Her conscience is troubling her. She knows that it's hard to speak well of her. Isn't that it, scamp? Confess now.' Clodagh had again passed round the table, and having thrown her whip and cap into a chair, had seated herself without ceremony in the vacant place that awaited her. "'Indeed it isn't,' she replied with immense unconcern. But an instant later she repeated her question. "'What was it, father? Can't you tell me?' Ashland lifted his glass and studied the light through his sherry. "'Ah, now listen to her, James,' he exclaimed again delightedly, "'and women will tell you they aren't inquisitive.' Clodagh flushed. The little sister, seeing the flush, was suddenly moved to assert herself. "'Twasn't anything, Clo," she said quickly. "'He only said you were a scallywag.' Then, as all eyes turned in her direction, she subsided abruptly into confused silence. "'There you are again, James. Look at the way they stick together. A poor man hasn't the ghost of a chance when the two of them join forces. One of them ought to have been a boy, if only for the sake of equality.' He shook his head and laughed afresh, while Burke deposited the last plate upon the table, and dinner began in earnest. That dinner, like his drive from Muskiri, was an experience to Millbank. More than once his eyes travelled involuntarily from the candle-lit table, with its suggestion of another and an earlier era, to the high walls where the fire cast long shadows of ruddy light and long tongues of shadow upon Ashland's ancestors, painted in garments of silk and lace that had once found a setting in this same sombre room. There was something strangely analogous in these dead men and women and their living representatives. The thought recurred to him again and again as he yielded to the pleasant influences of good wine and wholesome food pressed upon him with unceasing hospitality. It was not the first time he had pandered to his taste for past things by comparing a man with his forefathers, but the result had never proved quite so profitable. In their uncommon setting Ashland and his children would have appealed to the most unobservant as uncommon types. Viewed by the eyes of a student they became something more. They became types of an uncommon race, of an uncommon class. With the spur of the old fascination and the goad of the newborn misgiving, he glanced again and yet again from his host's hard, handsome features to the pictures, from the pictures to the warm-colored faces of the children. The study was absorbing. It supplied him with an agreeable undercurrent of interest while the ham and turkey were removed, and Ashland, with much dexterity, distributed portions of an immense apple pie deluged in cream. It still occupied his mind when, cheese having been placed upon the table and partaken of, Burke proceeded to remove the cloth. At the moment that the polished surface of the table was laid bare, his glance, temporarily distracted from its study of the nearer pictures, was attracted and arrested by one portrait that hung in partial shadow above the carved chimney-piece. It was the picture of a tall, slight boy of sixteen or seventeen years, dressed in the black satin knee-breeches, the diamond shoe buckles, and powdered cue of a past generation. Something in the pose of this painted figure, something in the youthful face, caught and held his attention. In unconscious scrutiny he leant forward to study the shadowed features. Then Ashland, suddenly aware of his interest, leant across the table. "'That was just what I meant, James, by saying one of them should have been a boy,' he said sharply. "'Haven't I justification?' He nodded half earnestly, half in malicious humour, towards the picture above the fire. For a moment Millbank was at a loss. Then, all at once, he comprehended his host's meaning. His gaze dropped from the picture to Clodagh sitting below it. Above the dark riding habit and above the satin coat it seemed that the same olive skin, the same level eyebrows and clear hazel eyes confronted him. "'I see,' he said quietly, "'I see. A very peculiar case of family likeness.' He spoke affably, casually, in all innocence, 
but scarcely had the words left his lips than he precipitately wished them back. With a loud laugh, Ashland struck the table with his hand. "'Ah, good!' he exclaimed. "'Good! Now, Chloe, what have you got to say?' But with a gesture quite as vehement as his own, the girl raised her head. "'I say it's not true,' she said. "'It isn't true. I'm not like him.' She glanced from her father to Millbank with sudden kindling eyes. "'I'm not like him,' she repeated. "'I won't be like him.' Ashland leant back quickly in his chair. He was still laughing, but a shade of temper was audible in the laugh. "'Do you hear that, James?' he said. "'We of the present generation are altogether too good for the past. A slip of a girl nowadays thinks herself vastly superior to a great-great-grandfather who was the finest horseman and the most open-handed man in Munster. That's the attitude of today.' He moved aside as Burke re-entered the room and laid a decanter of port and two glasses on the shining mahogany table. "'My great-grandfather, Anthony Ashland,' he went on deliberately, "'was as fine a specimen of the Irish gentleman as ever lived. I don't care who denies it. Have a glass of port, James?' An appreciation of good wine was the one thing he left his descendants. There was an awkward silence while he filled the two glasses and pushed one towards his guest but Milbank's ease of mind had already been upset. He held no key to the disconcerting situation, and it puzzled and perplexed him as his first impression of his old friend had done. Both possessed elements that he vaguely knew to be hidden from his sight, out of focus from his present point of view. For a space he sat warily fingering his glass, but making no attempt to drink. Without openly seeming to observe it, he was conscious of Ashland's half-humorous, half-aggressive mood, of the nervous attitude of the younger girl, and of Clodagh's flushed face. To a newly arrived guest the position was strained. With growing embarrassment he glanced from the rich dark wine in his glass to its reflection in the polished surface of the table. Finally the awkwardness of the prolonged silence moved him to speech. A great-grandfather who was a judge of wine is always worthy of consideration, he murmured amiably, as he lifted the glass to his lips. I'm afraid mine was a teetotaler. But his feeble attempt at humor was not destined to be successful. It drew a laugh from his host, but it was a laugh that found no echo. You're right, James, Ashland cried. By Jupiter, you're right. Anthony Ashland was the finest man in the county, and I'm proud of him. He was the worst man in the county and the greatest fool. The words, so sudden and unexpected, came from Clodagh. For several seconds she had been sitting absolutely still, but now she lifted her head again, her face flushed glowing, her bright eyes allowed with a quick enthusiasm the hot temper that she had inherited from her race. With a swift movement she turned from her father to Millbank. Do you think it great to be a fool and a gambler? she demanded. Ashland set down his glass noisily. "'Anthony Ashland was no gambler,' he said. "'He was a sportsman.' Clodagh's lip curled. "'A sportsman!' she exclaimed. "'Is it sport to keep gamecocks, to play cards, and throw dice, to squander money that belongs to other people, to mortgage your property, and to—to—to to, to kill your brother?' The last words burst from her impetuously, impulsively. Then suddenly she paused, shocked by her own daring. The silence that followed was short. With equal impetuosity Ashland pushed back his chair and rose. "'By gad, Clo, that's going too far,' he cried. "'I'll not hear my great-grandfather called a murderer. All the same he killed his brother. In a duel. Gentlemen had to fight in those days. Because of cards. Because they quarreled over cards.' Then, with a fresh change of expression, she appealed again to Milbank. Do you think that's sport, she asked, to get no good out of ordinary things, to get no pleasure out of dogs or horses except the pleasure of making them fight or race so that you can bet on the one you think best? She stopped breathlessly, and Millbank, desperately at a loss, gazed from one angry excited face to the other. But he was saved the trouble of finding an answer, for immediately Clodagh ceased to speak, Ashland's loud laugh broke in again. "'Bravo!' he cried boisterously. 
all the eloquence and all the lack of logic of your sex. But don't put those propositions to Millbank. Put them to yourself when you've reached his age. If you can't tell at fifty-five why poor human creatures play and kill and make fools of themselves, you'll have been a very lucky woman. For an instant his voice dropped, the despondency, the restless ennui that Millbank had previously noticed falling like a brief shadow over his anger. But the lapse was brief. With another laugh and a shrug of the shoulders he turned suddenly and, crossing the room, opened the door. Burke, he called loudly across the hall. Burke, bring more candles and another bottle of port and the cards. At the words Clodagh rose. Father, she exclaimed below her breath. Then her voice faltered. The involuntary note of protest and appeal was checked by some other emotion. With a swift movement she crossed the hearth, picked up her whip and cap, and without another word or glance walked out of the room, followed noiselessly by Nance. Ashland continued to stand by the door until the figures of his children had disappeared. Then he turned back into the room. "'James,' he said suddenly, "'perhaps you don't think it, but one hair of that child's head is more precious to me than life. She's an Ashland to the tips of her fingers. She's the whole race of us in one. The very way she repudiates us is proof enough for any man. I tell you the whole lot of us, lock, stock, and barrel, are looking at you out of her eyes.' Again he paused, then again he shook off his passing seriousness, with nervous excitability, reseating himself at the table as Burke entered. "'Ah, here we are,' he cried. "'Here we are. Come along, Burke, and show the light of heaven to us. Now, James, for any stakes you like, and at any game, what shall it be? P.K., or will we say euchre for the sake of the days that are dead and gone? Very well, euchre let it be, for any stakes you like.' It's the land of beggars, but by gad you'll find us game. Pass me your glass for another taste of port. End of chapter three. Chapter four. The unpleasant sensation of moving in the dark remained with Millbank while Ashland, still noisily excited, arranged the stakes, cut for the deal, and having won the cut, distributed the cards. By nature he was lethargic and placid. By habit he was precise methodical and commonplace. The advent into this new atmosphere, with its inexplicable suggestions and volcanic outbursts, left him distressed and ill at ease. He was the type of a man who, in every relation of life, likes to know exactly where he stands. Having once satisfied himself upon that point, he was usually content to follow the routine of existence without trouble to those around him but until it was fully defined he was a prey to a vague uneasiness. So absorbed was he by the trend of his own speculations that for the first five games he gave but small consideration to the play. Then, however, his host jogged his attention with no uncertain hand. Pausing in the shuffling of the cards, he glanced across the table. "'You've been playing like an old woman, James.' Are your wits wool gatherin' that you've let me win every blessed game? Millbank looked up. Forgive me, he said hastily. Forgive me, I was thinking. Thinking that a broken down devil of an Irishman isn't high enough game to fly at? Ashland laughed. Well, I'll put some life into you. I'll double the stakes. What do you say to that? He leant back in his chair, balancing the pack of cards in his hands. Millbank, with suddenly awakened observation, saw that his eyes glittered with excitement and that his lips were set. "'Double the stakes?' he echoed doubtfully. "'Oh, certainly, if you think it will improve the game. For myself I rarely play for money. I always think that the cards are sufficient in themselves, I suppose,' Ashland laughed. "'Don't you believe it, James, or if you do, I'll teach you better. Come along, in for a penny, in for a pound. Are you agreeable?' For a moment Milbank was thoughtful. Then he became conscious of the other's impatient glance. "'Why, why, certainly,' he said. "'Anything you like. Spoken like a man.' Ashland impulsively threw down the cards, and then gathered them up again. "'I see the embalming process isn't completed yet. The antiquarians have left a shred or two of frail humanity in you. Well, we'll have it out. We'll put an edge on it. Come along.' He leaned forward, the reckless brightness deepening in his eyes. 
but Milbank hesitated. "'Hadn't we better settle up the first score and start afresh?' he said. "'How do we stand?' He put his hand in his pocket, but the other waved the point. "'Is it payin' at this hour of the night?' he cried. "'Give me a pencil and I'll jot down our difference, if you're conscientious. But the balance will be on the other side before the candles are burned out. The devil forgot to bring luck to the Ashlands since poor Anthony went below. But come along, man, come along. Here's to the youth of us.' He drained his glass and turned again to the business of cards. During the next half-dozen games neither spoke. With deep absorption Ashland followed the run of the cards. Once or twice an exclamation escaped him. Once or twice he paused to replenish Milbank's glass or his own. But in every other respect he had eyes and thoughts for nothing but the business at hand. Milbank, on the contrary, gambler neither by instinct nor training, was infinitely more interested in his opponent than in the play. As he watched Ashland a score of recollections rose to his mind, recollections that time and advancing age had all but effaced. He recalled the numberless occasions upon which the Irishman, in the exuberance of youth, had sat over a gaming-table until the daylight had streamed in across the scattered cards, the heaped-up cigar-ashes and the empty glasses, he reviewed the rare occasions on which his cajoleries had drawn him from his own mild pursuits to be a sharer in these prolonged revels, and with the memory came the thought of the headache, the sick sense of weariness that had invariably lain in wait for him the following morning. A wondering admiration for Ashland had always held a place in these jaded after sensations, a species of hero-worship for one who could turn into bed at four in the morning and emerge at nine with all the vigor and vitality of the most virtuous sleeper. He had never fully realized that to men of Ashland's stamp dissipation, excitement and action are potent stimulants, calling forth all the superfluous nervous energy that by nature they possess. While the tide of life runs high about such men, they are borne forward buoyed up by their own capacity for living and enjoying. To them existence at high pressure is a glorious exalted state exempt from satiety or fatigue. It is the quieter phases of existence, the phases that to ordinary men mean rest, peace, domestic tranquillity, and domestic interest that these exuberant ardent human beings have cause to dread. An hour went by and still the idea of a past, curiously reflected and curiously contradicted, absorbed Milbank's perceptions. Then, gradually but decisively, it was borne in upon his mind that his absorption was blunting his common sense. He was playing execrably. It has been said that he was no gambler, but neither was he a fool. With something of a shock he realized that he stood a loser to the extent of seven or eight pounds. With the realization he sat straighter in his chair. It was not that he grudged the money. He was generous and could afford generosity. It was rather that that admirable quality which urges the Englishman to play a losing game was stirred within him. "'By Jove, Dennis,' he said, "'I must look to my laurels. I used to play a better game than this.' Ashland's only answer was a laugh, a laugh from which all the bitterness had dropped away leaving a buoyant ring of absorption and delight. Under the stimulus of excitement he had altered. He was exalted, lifted above the petty discontent, the pessimism, the despondency that tainted his empty days. And so for nearly two hours they played steadily. Then Milbank paused and drew out his watch. "'I don't know what sort of hours you keep in Ireland,' he hazarded, "'but it's nearly twelve o'clock. Ashland had paused to snuff one of the candles that had begun to gutter. At the other's words he glanced up in undisguised surprise. "'Ours?' he repeated. "'Why, any, or none at all. You don't know the glory of having something to sit up for.' He paused for a second in a sort of ecstasy. "'You don't know it. You can't know it. You have never felt the abomination of desolation.' He laughed feverishly and gathered up the cards afresh. "'Come, James, your deal.' and in this manner the night wore on. In the early stages of their play Ashland's luck stuck to him determinately, 
but by degrees his opponent's more cautious and level play began to tell, and their positions were gradually reversed. By one o'clock Millbank had made good his losses and even stood with some trifling amount to his advantage. Here again he had mildly suggested a cessation, but Ashland, more intoxicated by bad than he had been by good fortune, had demanded his revenge and called loudly through the quiet house for more candles and more wine. But with the fresh round of play the luck remained unaltered. Millbank continued to win. With a sleepy face but no expression of surprise, Burke responded to his master's call, replenishing the light and setting the port upon the table, but the players scarcely noticed his entrance or departure. Ashland was playing with desperate recklessness, and Millbank, without intent or consciousness, was slowly falling under the influence of his companion's excitement. As minute succeeded minute, and Ashland sat rigid in his seat, cutting, dealing, marking the result of each game upon a strip of paper, the elder man became more and more the satellite of thirty years ago, less and less the placid archaeologist for whom the follies of the present lie overshadowed by the past. He forgot the long journey of the afternoon, the peculiar incidents of his arrival. A slight flush rose to his usually bloodless cheeks. He found himself watching the run of the cards with a species of reflected eagerness, roused to an unaccustomed elation when the advantage fell to him. At three o'clock they played the last round, and it was only then, when the last card had been thrown on the table and he had risen stiff from long sitting, the winner of something like twenty pounds, that he realized how completely he had been dominated by this resurrected influence, dominated to the exclusion of personal prejudice and even personal comfort. So strong was this impression of past influences that he was roused to no surprise when, glancing at his companion, he saw him temporarily rejuvenated, his expression alert, his whole face vivified by the night's excitement. Again a touch of the old sympathy arose within him. The reckless, cynical man before him was momentarily effaced. The bright personality of long ago seemed to fill the room. "'Good night, Dennis,' he said gently, holding out his hand. Ashland caught it enthusiastically. "'Good night, James, good night. And once more a thousand welcomes and a thousand thanks.' You have been a drop of water in the desert to a parchin man. Good night and pleasant dreams to you. I'll reckon up my losses in the morning and write you a check. Good night. Millbank responded to the pressure of his fingers. Don't trouble about the money, he said. Any time will do. Any time. But you're turning in yourself? We'll be upstairs together. But Ashland shook his head. Not yet, he said. Not after this. I'll take a turn across the fields and have a look at the night on the water. I feel too much awake to be smothered by sheets and blankets. It isn't often we feel life here, and the sensation is glorious. He drew up his tall, powerful figure and stretched out his arms. Then almost at once he let them fall to his sides. But what moonshine this is to you, you prosaic Saxon, he exclaimed. Let me light you to bed. He laughed quickly and, picking up one of the massive candlesticks, moved towards the door. For an instant Millbank lingered in the dining-room, grown dimmer with the departing lights, then, hearing his name in his host's voice, he hurried after him into the hall. Ashland was standing at the foot of the stairs, the glowing candles held aloft. Above him the high ceiling loomed shadowy and indistinct. Behind him the dark wainscoted wall threw his figure into bold relief. It would have demanded but a slight stretch of fancy to picture him as his satin-coated great-grandfather grown to a dissipated maturity as he stood there, the master spirit in this house of fallen greatness. As Millbank reached his side he laughed once more, precisely as Anthony Ashland might have laughed, standing at the foot of the same staircase nearly a hundred years ago. The taint of heredity seemed to wrap him round, to gleam in his unnaturally bright eyes, to reverberate in his voice. "'Up with you, James!' he cried. 
I needn't put your hand on the banister like I have to do with some of my guests. You never yet drank a swerve in your steps. Well, I don't blame you for it. It's men like you that keep heaven a goin concern, while poor devils like me are pavin' the lower regions. Good night to you. With a fresh laugh he thrust the great candlestick into the other's hand and turned on his heel. Millbank remained motionless while Ashland passed across the hall and opened the door, letting in a breath of fresh damp air that set the candle flames dancing. Then, as the door closed again, he turned and put his hand on the banister. It was with a feeling of unreality, mingled with the borrowed excitement still at work within him, that he began his ascent of the stairs. The natural fatigue consequent on the day's journey had been temporarily dispelled, and sleep seemed something distant and almost unattractive. As he mounted the creaking steps, moving cautiously out of consideration for the sleeping household, he found himself wishing incontinently that he had offered his company to his host in his stroll towards the sea. As the desire came to him he paused. He could still overtake Ashland. He hesitated, glancing from the closed door of his bedroom to the hall lying below him in a well of shadow. Then suddenly he raised his head, attracted by a sound, subdued and yet distinct, that came to him through the silence of the house, the sound of light, hasty footsteps on an uncarpeted corridor. In the wave of surprise that swept over him he forgot his recent excitement, his recent wish for action and fresh air. Lifting the candlestick above his head he peered along the passageway that stretched away beyond his own door. But the scrutiny was momentary. Almost at once he lowered the candles and drew back as he recognized the figure of Clodagh coming towards him out of the gloom. She was wearing a flowing old-fashioned dressing-gown of some flowered material. One strand of her brown hair had been loosened and fell across her forehead, shadowing her eyes into something of the beauty they were yet to wear. And as Millbank looked at her he realized with a stirring of something like embarrassment that a touch of promise, very gracious and infinitely feminine, had replaced the first half-boyish impression that he had received of her. But if he felt embarrassment it was evident that she was conscious of none. As she came within a few yards of him she halted for an instant to assure herself of his identity. Then, her mind satisfied, she stepped straight onward into the light of the six candles. "'Oh, I'm so glad,' she said quickly. "'I was afraid for a minute that it was father.' "'I've been waiting up for you,' she added hastily. "'I couldn't go to sleep till I'd seen you.' Millbank was confused. Moved by an undefined impulse, he extinguished three of the six candles. "'Indeed,' he said. "'But it's very late. You must—you must be tired.' He glanced uncertainly round the landing, as if seeking a chair to offer her. Then an idea struck him. "'Will you come downstairs?' he suggested. The fire is still alight in the dining-room. You, you must be cold as well as tired." He looked hesitatingly at her light gown. But Clodagh shook her head. "'We mustn't go down,' she said. "'He might come in and find us, and then we'd have a row. He and I, of course, I mean,' she added politely. Then, as if impatient of the preamble, she plunged into the subject she had at heart. "'Mr. Milbank,' she said, "'will you promise me not to—' not to after tonight milbank's face looked blank not to what he asked oh not to encourage him not to play with him he's ruining himself and ruining us all couldn't you guess it from dinner from the quarrel we had oh he's so terribly foolish her voice suddenly trembled but he was laboring under the shock her revelation had given him good heavens he stammered i had no idea no idea of such a thing no, I know you hadn't. I was sure you hadn't. Her voice thrilled with quick relief. No, no, certainly not. But tell me about it. Dear me, dear me, I had no idea of such a thing. Oh, it began ages ago, before mother died. Burke says twas the life, the quiet life, after England. He came home, you know, when his father died, and he found the place in a bad way. He has never been rich enough to live out of the country and he has never stopped frettin' for the things that aren't here. But while mother lived he kept pretty good. 
"'Twas after she died that he seemed not to care. First he got gloomy and sad. Then he got reckless and terrible. People were frightened of him. His friends began to drop away. She paused for a moment, glancing down into the hall to assure herself that all was quiet. It's been the same ever since. Sometimes he's gloomy and depressed. Other times he's wild like tonight. And when he's wild he's mad for cards. Oh, you don't know what it's like. It's like being a drunkard, only different and worse. When he's like that he'd play with anyone, for anything. Last week he had a dreadful man, a horse-dealer from Muscarie, staying here with him for three days. They played cards every night, played till three or four in the morning. Father lost all the ready money in the house and nearly emptied the stables. Milbank stood before her horrified and absorbed. An understanding of many things before obscure had come to him while she was speaking, and with the knowledge a sudden deep pity for this child of his old friend, a sudden sense of guilt at his own blindness, his own weakness. "'Miss Clodagh,' he said quickly, in his stiff, formal voice. Then he paused as she raised her hand with a sharp gesture of attention. A heavy step sounded on the gravel outside the house. There was an instant hesitation. Then Clodagh leant forward with swift presence of mind and blew out the three remaining candles. "'You understand now?' she whispered. "'Yes,' he murmured below his breath. "'Yes, I understand.' A moment later he heard her flit down the corridor and heard Ashland open the heavy outer door. End of chapter 4 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com Part one, Chapter five of The Gambler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter five. Thus it was that James Milbank entered on his first night at Oristown. The surprise, the excitement, and the culminating incident of the evening would have been disturbing to a man of even more placid temperament, and rebel as he might against the weakness, he lay awake considerably longer than was his wont in the uncomfortable canopied bed, listening to the numberless infinitesimal sounds that break the silence of a sleeping house from the faint occasional cracking of the furniture to the scurrying of a mouse behind the plaster walls. Then gradually, as his ears became accustomed to these minor noises, another sound unnoticed in the activity of the early hours obtruded itself softly but persistently upon his consciousness. The subdued and regular breaking of the sea on the rocks below the house. A slight sense of annoyance was his first feeling, for it was many years since he had slept by the sea. Then quietly, lingeringly, soothingly, the rhythmical persistence of the sound began to tell. Imperceptibly, the confusing ideas of the evening became pleasantly indistinct. The numberless contradictory feelings blurred into one delightful sensation of indifference and repose. With the salt, moist air borne to him through the open window, and the great untiring lullaby of the ocean rising and falling upon his senses like the purring of a gigantic cat, he fell asleep. His first sensation upon waking the next morning was one of pleasure, the placid unquestioning satisfaction that comes to the troubled mind with the advent of a fine day. To his simple taste the sights and sounds that met his waking consciousness were possessed of an unaccustomed charm. With daylight the room that last night had held grim and even ghostly suggestions took on a more human and friendly air. The ancient mahogany furniture seemed anxious to reflect the morning sunshine. The massive posts of the bed with their drapery of faded rep no longer glowered upon the intruder. Each object was bathed in and rejuvenated by the golden warmth, the incomparable mellow radiance of sea and sky that flowed in at the open window. For a while he lay in contemplative enjoyment of this early untainted atmosphere 
while the sounds of the awakening day gradually rose above the soft beating of the outgoing tide falling upon his ears in a pleasant primitive melody of clacking fowls joyous yelping dogs and stamping horses for a space he lay still then the inevitable wish to take active part in this world created from the darkness and the silence of the night aroused him and slipping out of bed he drew on a dressing gown and walked to the window the sight that met his eyes was one of infinite beauty the delicacy the poetry the subtle unnameable charm that lie in the hollow of nature's hand were over land and sky and sea the warmth and wealth of summer stretched before him but summer mellowed and softened by a golden autumnal haze there are more inspiring countries than ireland countries more richly dowered in vegetation countries more radiant in atmosphere and brilliant in coloring but there is no land where the hand of the maker is more poignantly felt where the mystic spirit of creation the wonderful tender pathetic sense of the beginning has been so strangely preserved as milbank stood at the open window his eyes travelled without interruption over the wide green fields neither lawn nor meadow that spread from the house to the shore owning no boundary wall beyond the low shelving rocks of red sandstone that rose a natural barrier against the encroachments of the tide and from the fields his gaze wandered onward drawn irresistibly and inevitably to the sea itself the watchful tyrannical guardian of the silent land it lay before him like a tremendous glassy lake stretching in one untroubled sweep from Orristown to the point three miles away where the purple headland of Carrigmore completed the semicircle of the bay. The silence, the majesty of that sweep of water, was indescribable. From the rim of yellow sand where the indolent waves were lapping to the misted horizon, not one sign of human life marred the smoothness of its surface. Across the bay at Carrigmore a few spirals of smoke rose from the cluster of pink and white cottages lying under the shadow of the round tower on the long sandy strand a couple of bare-legged boys were leisurely raking up the seaweed that the waves had left and slowly piling it on a waiting donkey butt but the sea itself was undisturbed it lay as it might have lain on the first day of completed creation mystical sublime untouched milbank was no poet yet the scene impressed him the extraordinary sense of an inimitable and impenetrable peace before which man and man's mere transitory concerns are dwarfed if not entirely eliminated touched him vaguely it was with a tinge of something bordering upon reluctance that he at last drew his eyes from the picture and began to dress but once freed from the spell of the ocean his mind reverted to the other interest that lay closer at hand he found himself wondering how his entertainers would appear on a second inspection, whether, like his room, they would take on a more commonplace semblance with the advent of daylight. The touch of irrepressible and human curiosity that the speculation aroused gave a spur to the business of dressing, and it was well under the twenty minutes usually devoted to his neat and careful toilet when he found himself crossing the corridor and descending the stairs he encountered no one as he passed through the hall and catching a fresh suggestion of sunshine through the door that stood hospitably open he paused for an instant to take a cursory glance at the gravelled sweep that terminated the drive and the grassy slope surmounted by a fringe of beeches that formed the outlook from the front of the house then he turned quickly and recrossing the hall passed into the dining room none of the household had yet appeared but here also the daylight had worked changes. The curtains were drawn back, permitting the view of fields and sea that he had already studied from his bedroom to break uninterruptedly through the three lofty windows. The effect was one of extreme airiness and light, and it was quite a minute before his gaze turned to the darker side of the room, where the portrait of the famous Anthony Ashland hung above the fire. Realizing that he was alone in the big room, he crossed to the table where breakfast was already laid, the remains of the enormous ham rising from an untidy paper frill to defy the attacks of the largest appetite. 
in the brilliance of the light the fineness of the table linen and its state of dilapidation were both accentuated as was the genuine beauty and intrinsic value of the badly kept silver but milbank had no time to absorb these details for instantly he reached the table his eye was caught by a folded slip of paper lying by his place with a touch of surprise he stooped forward and picked it up then a wave of annoyance almost of guilt succeeded the surprise as he realized that it was a check made out in ashland's straggling handwriting for his losses of the night before as he fingered it uncomfortably a vivid remembrance of his interview with clodaw rose to his mind he thought of the poverty suggested rather than expressed by the girl's words he thought of the muskiri horse-dealer who had all but emptied the stables with a puckered brow he studied his own name scrawled across the check then with a sense of something like duplicity he hurriedly pushed it under his plate as he heard the hall door close and footsteps sound across the hall a moment later ashland followed by his two daughters entered the room all three greeted him in turn then ashland crossed to the fire and proceeded to stir it to a blaze while nance and clodagh passed to their appointed places both girls looked pleasantly in keeping with the fresh morning their rich youthful coloring having nothing to fear from the searching light nance was dressed in a very clean blue frock that accentuated the color of her eyes but clodagh was again attired in the old-fashioned riding habit though this time the boy's cap was absent and the sunshine caught reflections in her light brown hair. "'I hope you don't mind my being dressed like this,' she said as she took her seat. "'I always have a ride in the mornings, and I generally tidy up for breakfast, but I'm riding a race at ten with Larry, my cousin, you know, so twouldn't be worth while to change today.' She spoke quite naturally, encountering Milbank's eyes with no suggestion of embarrassment for last night's adventure. He met her glance for an instant, then his own wandered guiltily to the corner of the check protruding from under his plate not at all he said hurriedly not at all i hope i may be permitted to see the race clodagh smiled of course if you like she said but it won't be much to look at she added this with a quick glance that ineffectually attempted to gauge the guest's taste and powers of appreciation twill be grand murmured nance softly and i know who's going to win nonsense said clodagh i won in the practice last night but the strand was wet and the cob is only sure on hard ground but nevertheless she flushed and threw a quick look of appreciation and affection at her loyal little partisan what are you two chattering about said ashland standing up from the fire and straightening his shoulders is it your notion of hospitality to keep a stranger waiting for his breakfast faith we knew better in the old days eh james he laughed and passed round the table. Flodoff presided at the old-fashioned silver urn, and either her confidences of the night before or the prospect of her coming contest affected her, for she forgot the diffidence that had marked her at the dinner of the preceding evening, and talked brightly and with interest on a variety of subjects. Finally, as she handed Milbank his second cup of tea, she touched upon the object of his visit. "'Twas to see the ruins at Carrigamore, not us, that you came, wasn't it?' she said, with a shade of humour. He returned her glance seriously. "'Oh, no,' he said. "'At least—' "'Ah, now you've let it out,' she cried with a laugh. "'I knew it. I said so. Didn't I, Nance? I knew no one would come here just to see us.' Ashland laughed. "'On my soul,' he cried, "'you haven't learned your market value yet, Clo. If I were a girl I'm hanged if I'd rate myself lower than a fourth-century ruin.' he laughed afresh. But Clodagh displayed no embarrassment. She was too unversed in the ways of coquetry to see or resent the point of the remark. "'Aye,' she said naively, "'what have I to do with it?' After this there was a trifling silence, at the end of which Ashland looked quickly at his guest. "'By the way, James,' he exclaimed, "'we were too well amused last night to look ahead. I never thought of asking you about to-day.' have you any pet plans or schemes is it to be a pilgrimage to st galen or what do you say to a day in the saddle there's a meet not five miles away and if a good gallop pleases you i have as neat a little horse for you as ever carried a saddle what do you say 
of course if you think the round tower is likely to collapse or be demolished by a tidal wave i won't raise a finger but milbank laughed my dear dennis he said quickly don't you trouble on my account he danced deprecatingly over ashland's sporting attire don't you trouble about me i never was a sportsman as you know i'll go to my own hunting and you go to yours don't let me interfere with any plans you may have formed i enjoy a solitary excursion but ashland's face darkened oh no he objected after a short pause oh no if you're not game for it then the meat is off so far as i'm concerned i can't have you roaming about the country by yourself oh no i hope i remember my obligations milbank looked distressed with a genuine feeling of embarrassment he turned from one face to the other my dear dennis he objected feebly i must really beg of you not another word not another word ashland ostentatiously helped himself to some ham i hope james that whatever our environments we still understand the traditions of hospitality if you don't feel on for it there's no hunting for me to-day after this there was another unpleasant pause ashland attempted to hide his chagrin but his face was unmistakably dark with disappointment for a space milbank toyed with his breakfast then he spoke again but my dear dennis if you will only allow me he ventured but before ashland could reply clodagh's voice broke in oh you needn't bother so much father she said easily you go to the meet and i'll take mr milbank to carrigmore i'll drive him over in the pony trap or we'll walk whichever he likes best she spoke fluently and gaily and it was difficult for milbank to reconcile the high buoyant tones of her voice with the serious note struck by her the night before filled with relief however at her timely interruption he was satisfied to let the discrepancy go unregarded excellent he cried an excellent idea miss clodagh here's your difficulty solved dennis your irish sense of chivalry won't allow you to deprive me of so charming a guide clodagh laughed frankly if it still the compliment and ashland's face brightened perceptibly oh well as you're so amiable he said magnanimously i don't mind admitting that twould have been a bit of a sacrifice to give up the hunt though if i hadn't been overruled by the majority i'd have swallowed the ruins without a grimace he laughed with restored good humour and turned to his daughters when you're done with breakfast clo he said run around to the stables and tell bert he need only saddle the bay with the decision that he was after all to enjoy his day's sport his spirits had risen and despite the fact that the daylight revealed many evidences of last night dissipation that would have been visible thirty years ago milbank was pleased and reassured by his appearance his movements were energetic his expression alert he suggested one who was interested and attracted by life and the elder man was too unimaginative too single of purpose in his own concerns to suspect that the energy the suggestion of anticipation were due to his own presence in the house to the promise of excitement and diversion that the presence offered with the definite arrangement of the day's plans a fresh energy had descended on the party and but a few minutes passed before clodagh and nance rose from the table and left the room then as the two men were left alone milbank put into action the resolution that had been gradually maturing in his mind not without a certain trepidation not without an embarrassed distaste for the task he bent forward in his precise manner and drawing the check from beneath his plate began to smooth it out dennis he said i found this on my plate when i came downstairs ashland looked up hastily and laughed he had all the irishman's distaste to money as a topic of conversation he was as sensitive in the offering of it to another as in the accepting of it for himself oh that's all right he said quickly not another word about that james not another syllable but milbank continued to finger the check dennis he began again a shade of nervousness audible in his voice i am uncertain how to say what i want to say i am extremely anxious not to offend you and yet i feel i fear that you may take offence before replying 
Ashland drained the cup of strong tea that stood beside his plate. Then he glanced again at his companion. "'What in thunder are you driving at?' he asked good-humoredly. Milbank looked down. "'That's what I want to explain,' he answered without raising his head. "'And you must not allow it to offend you. I want you, for the sake of old friendship, to let me tear this check up. I was excited last night. I infringed on one of my set rules, that of never playing cards for high stakes. It is for my own sake that I ask permission to do this. It will put me right with myself. He laughed deprecatingly. For a second there was no indication that his labored explanation had been even heard. Then, with alarming suddenness, Ashland brought his hand down upon the table, ripping out an oath. "'And where the devil do I come in?' he demanded. "'Is it because you see the place going to rack and ruin that you think you can insult me in my own house? I'd have you to know that when an Ashland needs charity he will ask for it.' In the spasm of rage that had attacked him his eyes blazed and the veins in his forehead swelled. Then, suddenly catching a glance of the consternation on his guest's face, he controlled himself by an effort and with a loud laugh pushed back his chair and rose. "'Forgive me, James,' he said roughly. "'You don't understand. You never did understand. It's the cursed pride of a cursed country. The less we have to be proud of, the more damned proud we are. We have a sense of humor for everything in creation except ourselves.' Again he laughed harshly. Then again his mood changed. "'James,' he said seriously, "'put that check in your pocket and if you value my friendship, never mention it again. We may be a bad lot. We may be all close says of us, fools, rakes, spendthrifts, but no Ashland ever shirked his debts of honor. The words were bombastic, the sentiment false, but the natural dignity and distinction of the man, dissipated failure though he might be, were unmistakable as he stood with high head and erect figure. By the ironic injustice of such circumstances, Milbank, honest, prosaic, incapable of a dishonorable action, felt suddenly humiliated. With shamefaced haste he muttered an apology and thrust the check into his pocket. At the moment that he did so, Clodagh re-entered the room. "'It's all right, father,' she exclaimed. "'The bay will be round in a second, and Larry has come. Are you ready, Mr. Milbank?' He responded with instant alacrity. It was the second time that morning that she had unconsciously come to his relief. "'Oh, quite,' he said, "'quite ready. Shall we start?' "'This minute, if you like. Good-bye, father. I hope it will be a good run.' She crossed the room quickly, then paused at the door. "'Remember, the race will be nothing at all worth seeing,' she added, glancing back over her shoulder at the guest. End of Chapter 5 Chapter 6 Without ceremony or apology, Clodagh led Milbank to the stables by the shortest route which entailed the traversing of several long and windy passages and the crossing of the great draughty kitchen where Hannah, the housekeeper, cook, and general mainstay of the establishment held undisputed sway. As they entered her domain she was standing by an open window engaged in the cleaning of a saucepan, an operation to which she brought an astonishing amount of noisy energy. At the sight of the stranger she dropped the knife she was holding and made a furtive attempt to straighten her ample and somewhat dirty apron. "'I wish I, Miss Clodagh,' she began in a voice that trembled between chagrin and an inherent sense of hospitality. "'Isn't that a queer thing for you to be doing now, to be bringing the gentleman down here and me in the middle of me pots? Not but what you're welcome, sir, though tis no fit place for you,' she added, with a glance that summed the intruder up from head to heel. Milbank laughed a little awkwardly. "'So long as you make no objection,' he said with amiable haste, "'I see nothing to find fault with.' But Hannah gave an incredulous shake of her head. "'Ah, you do be saying that,' she replied sagely. "'But tis a queer place you'll be fine in Orristown after England.' She added this in a persuasive tone, making a tentative cast for the stranger's sentiments. But before the fish could rise to her bait, her attention was claimed in another direction. A pellet of mud, aimed with extreme accuracy, came flying through the open window and hit her on the cheek. Milbank glanced round quickly. Clodagh laughed. 
and the victim of the assault gave a gasp, pushed her saucepans aside, and thrust her head through the window. "'Wait till I catch you, Master Larry,' she cried across the yard. "'How can I be doing the work of six women and three men with the likes of you traipsing about? Upon my word, I'll tell on you. I'll tell your uncle on you. Long threatening comes at last.' But the only response that greeted her was a smothered laugh from the stables opposite a laugh which Clodolph involuntarily echoed. Instantly Hannah wheeled round from the window. "'Ah, Miss Clodagh, isn't it a shame for you?' she exclaimed tremulously. "'Isn't it a shame for you now to be encouraging that brat of a boy? George is a third time he thrown his marbles of mud at me this morning. So signs I'll spake to the master, I will so.' She gave her apron a defiant tug. Milbank stood uncertain and embarrassed, nervously curious as to Clodagh's next move. With a certain misgiving he saw her face brim over with delight. Then with a sense of complete amazement he saw her step suddenly to the side of the indignant Hannah, throw one arm impulsively round her neck, and give her a hasty kiss. "'Indeed you won't speak to him, Hannah, and you know you won't,' she said in her most beguiling tones, "'and you'll make a griddle cake for lunch just to show you aren't angry.' "'Come on, Mr. Milbank. Larry is waiting.' As they crossed the kitchen, Hannah defiantly passed the corner of her apron across her eyes and ostentatiously resumed her interrupted work. At the door Clodagh looked back. "'Hannah,' she said persuasively. Hannah began to scrape her saucepan. "'Go on with ye now, Miss Clodagh,' she cried. "'Sure tis a pair of ye that's there. I'm out with ye.' "'But the griddle-cake, Hannah?' let betsy over at mrs ashland's make griddle cake for ye maybe she wouldn't put up with master larry as aisy as me of course betsy would make a griddle cake at any time said clodagh promptly only we couldn't eat it after yours for a moment hannah made no response then she gave another disdainful whisk to her apron and attacked the saucepan with renewed force clodagh said nothing but took a step forward her cheeks were bright and her eyes danced with mischief and amusement. As her foot touched the paving stones of the yard, Hannah raised her head. "'I suppose twill be at one you'll be wanting the lunch?' she said in a suddenly lowered and mollified voice, and Clodagh responded with a laugh of triumph and delight. Outside in the sunshine of the yard she laughed again. "'Hannah is an old duck,' she said. "'She is always getting as cross as two sticks.' and then forgetting all about it. Nobody could help teasing her. But where's Larry gone to? Larry! Larry! There was a pause, a stamping of horses' hoofs, and the sound of a voice whispering affectionate injunctions to an unseen animal. Then young Lawrence Ashland emerged from the stables, leading his chestnut cob. He was a well-made, long-limbed boy of fourteen, with skin as smooth and eyes as clear as Clodagh's own. "'Hello, Clo!' he exclaimed. "'That was a straight shot, wasn't it? Was she mad?' "'Pretty mad,' responded Clodagh. "'This is Mr. Milbank. He came last night.' Young Ashland eyed the stranger frankly and without embarrassment. "'You're not at the meet?' he said with involuntary surprise. "'I'd be there, only Mother doesn't let me hunt yet. She thinks I'd break my neck or something,' he laughed. "'But I'll go to every meet within twenty miles when I'm a man,' he added. "'There's nothing as good as hunting except sailing.' Are you much of a sailor? Milbank looked back into the bright, fearless eyes and healthy, spirited face, and again a touch of aloofness of age damped him. There was a buoyancy in this boy and girl, a zest and enthusiasm outside which he stood the undeniable alien. Yes, I am fond of the sea, he responded, but probably not as you are fond of it. Try as he might to be natural and pleasant, his speech sounded still the his words stayed. The boy looked at him doubtfully. "'Didn't know there were two ways of doing it,' he said, rubbing his face against the cob's sleek neck. But Clodagh came to her guest's rescue. "'Larry doesn't deserve any credit for liking the sea,' she said. "'His father was a sailor. You go on to the fields, Larry,' she added. "'You'll find Nance waiting there. I'll saddle Polly in a second and be after you with Mr. Milbank. Run now. You're only wasting time.' Larry hesitated for a moment, then he nodded. "'All right,' he acquiesced, "'only don't be long.' Instantly he was gone, Clodagh handed her whip to Milbank, 
and darted into the coach-house, reappearing with a saddle over her arm and a bridle swinging from her shoulder. "'You are not going to saddle a horse yourself?' he exclaimed in consternation. "'Let me call one of the men. Please let me call one of the men.' Clodagh laughed. "'There is no one to call,' she said. "'Burke is the only proper manservant we keep, and he drove into Muscari for provisions as soon as he brought the bay round for father. You don't think I'd let any of the labourers touch the horses?' As she said this she laughed again, and, nodding gaily, passed into one of the stalls. After she had disappeared, Milbank stood silent, listening with an uncomfortable embarrassment to the soft whinnying of the horse, the soft murmuring of Clodagh's voice, the straining and creaking of leather that reached his ears. At last, yielding to his instincts, he stepped forward and spoke again. "'Miss Clodagh, let me help you,' he said. "'I'm afraid I'm rather useless, but you might let me try.' Again Clodagh's soft, humorous laugh answered him. "'It's done now,' she said, "'and anyway I've known how to saddle a horse since I was twelve. Stand back a little, please.' He drew back hastily, and she let out a small grey mare. "'She isn't much to look at,' she explained, "'but she's grand to go, and I know she's going to win. She must win.' She kissed the animal impulsively on the soft, quivering nostril. Together they threaded their way between the scurrying fowls and innumerable dogs that filled the yard, Clodagh leading the mare, Millbank keeping close to her side. "'What's this race for?' he asked as they passed through the arched gateway. "'A mere trial of strength?' Clodagh's eyes widened. "'Oh, no,' she said. "'That would be silly. There are stakes, of course.' larry's telescope against my irish terrier the telescope belonged to uncle lawrence and is a beauty but it's nothing at all to nick nick is a pedigree dog six months old with the finest coat and the loveliest head you ever saw if i lost him but here she stopped it's unlucky to say that isn't it she added quickly of course i'm not going to lose him again she turned and fondled the mare and a moment later they came into view of the long level fields that lay between the house and the sea, and saw the erect figure of Larry clearly silhouetted against the sky, as he sat as cob with the ease of the born horseman. It took Milbank but a few minutes to place himself in a safe and advantageous position on a ditch that, dividing two of the fields, was to form the last jump of the race and once ensconced in this pleasant and not uncomfortable seat he watched the cousins move across the fields to the point where little nance was waiting to arrange the preliminaries he saw clodagh mount the grey mare observed the one or two inevitable false starts then became conscious with a quickening of interest that the race had begun had he been possessed of the humorous quality he would undoubtedly have been drawn into a smile at his own position as it was, he saw nothing ludicrous in the idea of an elderly student seated on an Irish ditch playing umpire to a couple of children. As the horses started, he merely settled himself more securely in his seat and drew out his handkerchief in obedience to the instinct that some expression of enthusiasm would be demanded by the winner. He could not picture himself raising a cheer as the conqueror sailed past him but his dignity affably bent to the idea of a friendly wave of a handkerchief. A slight breeze was blowing in from the sea, and the intense freshness of the atmosphere again obtruded itself upon him as he watched the horses swing towards him across the fields, the thud of their hooves upon the grass gaining in volume with every stride. For a space they galloped neck to neck. Then, slowly, almost imperceptibly, Clodagh drew away. For a couple of seconds the distance between the animals became noticeable. Then young Ashland, urging the chestnut, regained his lost position, and to Milbank's eyes the two were again abreast as they crossed the last field. Once more he settled himself in his place of bandage. Something in the freshness of the morning, something in the youth and vitality of the competitors, gave the race an interest and attraction it would otherwise have lacked. With a reluctant sensation, half curiosity, half the alien's unaccountable attraction towards conditions of life other than his own, he found himself straining his eyes towards the two slight figures moving towards him across the short grass. 
nearer and nearer they came, maintaining their level positions. Then, as the last ditch came clearly into view, the gray mare seemed to gather herself together for the short final gallop and the jump. Leaning forward, he saw Clodaw straighten herself in the saddle as each stride increased the advantage she had gained. Unconsciously, with the nearer pounding of the hoofs, the excitement of the moment touched him. But it touched him with disastrous results. As the mare neared the ditch, he suddenly leant forward, losing the balance he had so carefully preserved. The action was instantaneous, and it was but the work of another instant to grasp the sturdy weeds that topped the ditch and regain his position. But unwittingly the harmless incident had changed the result of the race. As he involuntarily steadied himself, the handkerchief, held in readiness for the victor, slipped from his hand and fluttered down upon the grass. It fell at the feet of the gray mare. She paused in sudden alarm, then hunched herself together and shied away from it as from a ghost. No harm was done. Clodagh kept her seat without a tremor. But in that second of lost time the cob drew level with his rival, then sailed triumphantly over the ditch. For Millbank there was a moment of horrible suspense, and a succeeding relief that drove all thought of the race and its result far from his mind. Immediately the field was clear, he scrambled from his position and hurried to where Clodagh was soothing the still-frightened Polly. "'Miss Clodagh,' he began, "'I am so sorry. I assure you it, it was not my fault.' Clodagh was bending low over the mare's neck, her flushed face partially hidden. She made no reply to his confused and stammering speech. "'Miss Clodagh,' he began afresh, "'you are not angry?' You don't think it was my fault. Clodagh laughed a little tremulously. Of course not, she said. How can you be so silly? I hadn't had her properly in hand, that was all. As she finished, young Ashland cantered back, halting on the further side of the ditch. His face was also flush, and his eyes looked dark. Look here, he said, eyeing Milbank. What did you mean by balking her like that? What were you doing with your beastly handkerchief? Twas no race, Clo but Clodagh looked up. "'Oh, yes, it was,' she said. "'It was all mine own fault. I hadn't Polly in hand. I should have pulled her together and sent her over with a touch of the whip. Apologize, Larry. T'was a fair race.' But Larry still hesitated, his glance straying doubtfully from one face to the other. "'Honor bright, Clo?' he asked at last. Clodagh nodded. "'Then I'm sorry, sir,' he said frankly, "'for saying what I said.' Millbank made a murmur of forgiveness, and a moment later Nance appeared upon the scene, breathless and full of curiosity. As Larry entered upon a voluble account of the finish in reply to her eager questions, Clodagh wheeled the mare round and trotted quickly across the fields in the direction of the house. For a moment or two Millbank stood irresolute. Then a sudden impulse to follow the mare and her rider seized him and ignoring Nance and Larry, still absorbed in heated explanation, he took his way slowly across the green and springy turf. His crossing of the field was measured and methodical, and he had barely come within sight of the arched gateway of the yard when Clodagh reappeared, this time on foot. The tail of her habit was tucked under one arm, the struggling form of an Irish terrier was held firmly under the other. She came straight forward in his direction, and, reaching him, would have passed on without speaking. But he halted in front of her. "'Miss Clodagh,' he said, "'you are hurt and disappointed.' Clodagh averted her eyes. "'I'm not,' she said shortly. "'But I see that you are.' "'No, I'm not.' "'Miss Clodagh, you are. Can't I do something?' Then at last she looked at him. Her cheeks were burning, and her eyes were brimming with tears that only pride held back. "'It isn't the old race,' she said defiantly. "'It's—it's it's Mick.' Two tears suddenly welled over and dropped on the red head of the dog, who responded with an adoring look and a wild attempt to lick her face. "'Oh, I've had him since he was six weeks old,' she cried impulsively. "'I reared him and trained him myself. He knows every word I say.' Millbank suddenly looked relieved. "'Is that all?' he exclaimed cheerfully. 
is that all we'll soon put that right keep your dog i'll settle matters with your cousin he glanced back across the fields to where larry was walking the cob to and fro but clodagh's face expressed intense surprise but you don't understand she said mick was the stake twas a fair race and larry won mick is is larry's now he laughed a little oh nonsense you raced for fun yes for the best fun we could get she said seriously that's why we staked what we cared most about don't you understand for the moment her grief was merged in her unaffected surprise at his lack of comprehension but milbank was staring at her interestedly the scene at the breakfast-table and with it ashland's offended pride and ridiculous dignity had risen before him with her soft surprised tone her wide incredulous gaze with total unconsciousness she was voicing the sentiments of her race an ashland might neglect everything else in the world but his debts of honour were sacred things he looked more closely at the pretty distressed face at the brimming eyes and the resolutely set lips and simply because you staked him he said you intend to lose the dog clodagh caught her breath and a fresh tear fell on mick's head then with a defiant lifting of the chin she started forward across the field twas a fair race she said in an unsteady voice End of chapter six chapter seven whatever clodagh may have felt upon the subject she made no further allusion to the loss of her dog an hour after the race milbank standing at his bedroom window caught a glimpse of larry riding slowly across the fields towards the avenue with the evidently unwilling mick held securely under his arm and a few minutes afterwards a noisy bell clanging through the house informed him that luncheon had been served the two girls were already in the dining-room when he entered clodagh had changed her riding habit for a neat holland dress her hair was smoothly plaited and only a lingering trace of the morning's excitement burned in her cheeks as the guest entered she came forward at once and pointed to his chair with a pretty touch of gracious hospitality where is your cousin he said as he responded to her gesture she flushed momentarily gone she answered laconically then conscious that the reply was curt she made haste to amend it he's gone to lunch she added and fan wanted him back she's a great invalid and always worrying about him i suppose invalids are never like other people will you please help yourself she smiled and indicated a steaming stew sufficient to feed ten hungry people that hannah acting in burke's absence had planted heavily upon the table we always begin lunch with meat clodagh explained but we always finish with tea and whatever hannah will make for us to eat if you stay long enough you'll be able to tell all hannah's tempers by what we get at lunch when she's terribly cross we have bread and jam when she's middlin' we get soda bread but when she's really and truly nice we have a currant loaf or brittle cake she glanced round mischievously at the red face of the factotum hannah who had been wavering between offence and amusement suddenly succumbed to the look sure tis a queer notion you'll be given him of the place she said amicably joining in the conversation without a shade of embarrassment if i was you i wouldn't be tellin' a gentleman that i loves the whole work of the house to one poor old woman and goes gallivantin over the country mornin noon and night instead of learnin myself to be a good housekeeper so signs tis miss nance that'll find the husband first with a knowing glance at milbank and a shake of the head she left the room banging the door behind her clodagh laughed the insinuation in hannah's words and look passed unnoticed by her she swept them aside unconcernedly and proceeded with an inborn tact an inborn sense of the responsibilities of her position to fill her role of hostess and entertain her guest so successful was she in this new aspect that milbank found himself thawing even growing communicative under her influence as the meal progressed long before the appetizing griddle cake and the heavy silver teapot had been laid upon the table he had begun to feel at home to meet nance's shy friendly smiles without embarrassment to talk with freedom and naturalness of his small personal ambitions 
his own unimportant individual researches in his pet study of antiquity. A reticent man, when once his reticence has been broken down, makes as egotistical a confidant as any other. Before they rose from the table he had been beguiled into forgetting that the Celtic zeal for the entertainment of a guest may sometimes be mistaken for something more that irish children with their natural kinship to sun and rain dogs and horses men and women may assume but cannot possibly feel an interest in monuments of wood or stone no matter how historic or how unique this erroneous impression remained with him until the time arrived for clodagh to pilot him to carrigmore and filled with the knowledge of having a sympathetic listener he harked back to his earliest experiences while he covered the two miles of firm yellow sand with his young hostess walking sedately beside him and half a dozen dogs setters retrievers and sharp-nosed terriers careering about him in a joyous band he entered upon minute and technical details of every archaeological discovery of the past decade he recounted his personal opinion of each he even unbent to the extent of relating a dry anecdote or two during that delightful walk in the mellow warmth of the afternoon. It was only when the long curve of the strand had at last been traversed and the rocks of Orristown left far behind that discoveries, opinions, and stories alike faded from his mind in the nearer interest of the Carrigmore ruins even to the pleasure-seeker there is something symbolic and imposing in the tall gray symmetrical tower that tops the hill above carrigmore and faces the great sweep of the atlantic ocean something infinitely ancient and impressive in the crumbling ruins of the church from whose walls the rudely carved figures look down to-day as they look down in primitive christian times when carrigmore was a centre of learning and its tower a beacon to the world of faith to millbank a student of such things they were a revelation he scarcely spoke as he climbed the steep hill and entered the grass-grown churchyard and once within the precincts of the ruin all considerations save the consideration of the moment faded from his thoughts with the mild enthusiasm that his hobby always awoke in him he set about a minute examination of the place hurriedly unstrapping the satchel in which he carried his antiquarian's paraphernalia. During the first half-hour Clodagh sat dutifully on one of the greys, alternately plaiting grasses and admonishing or petting her dogs. Then her long-tried patience gave out. With a sudden imperative need of action she rose, shook the grasses from her skirt, and, picking her way between the half-buried headstones, reached Milbank's side. "'Mr. Milbank,' she said frankly, "'would you mind very much if I went away and came back for you in an hour? You see, the ruins aren't quite so new to me as they are to you. People say they've been here since the fourth century.' She laughed and called to the dogs. But Milbank scarcely heard the laugh. There was a flush of delight on his thin cheeks as he peered through his magnifying glass into one of the carved stones. He waited a moment before replying. Then he answered with bent head. "'Certainly, Miss Clodagh,' he said abstractedly, "'certainly. But make it two hours, I beg of you, instead of one.' And with another amused laugh Clodagh took advantage of her dismissal. Milbank's absorption was so unfeigned that when Clodagh came running back nearly three hours later, full of remorse for her long desertion, he greeted her with something amounting to regret. Twice she had to remind him that the afternoon was all but spent, and the long walk to Orristown still to be reckoned with before he could desist from the fascinating task of completing the notes he had made. At last, with a little sigh of amiable regret, he shut up his book, returned the magnifying glass to his satchel, and slowly followed her out of the churchyard. They had covered half a mile of the smooth strand across which the first long shadows of evening had begun to fall, before the glamour of the past centuries had faded from his consideration, permitting the more material present to obtrude itself. Then at last, with a little start of compunction, he realized how silent and uninteresting a companion he must seem to the girl walking so stately beside him. 
and with something of guilt in the movement he withdrew his eyes from the long wet line of sand where the incoming tide was stealthily encroaching miss clodagh he said abruptly what are you thinking of with frank spontaneity she turned and met his gaze i was wondering she said candidly when you'd forget the round tower and remember about father he started roused to a fresh sense of guilt you you mustn't think he began stammeringly but clodagh laughed oh don't bother about it she said easily i wasn't really thinking for a while he remained silent watching the noisy dogs as they ineffectually chased the seagulls that wheeled above the unruffled waves then at last urged by his awakened conscience he half paused and looked again at the girl's bright face miss clodagh he began i feel very guilty i am very guilty clodagh glanced back at him how she said simply because last night i unconsciously did what you disapprove of i played with your father for high stakes and i am ashamed to say that i won a large sum of money for an instant the brightness left her glance she looked at him with the serious eyes of the night before much she asked impulsively twenty pounds milbank felt himself color then he rallied his courage but that isn't all he added quickly i have something worse to confess when i came down to breakfast this morning i found a check lying on my plate i felt intensely remorseful as you can imagine and determined to make reparation after breakfast i broached the subject to dennis i begged him to allow me to cancel our play by tearing up the check he was furiously angry and i instead of showing the courage of my opinion was actually weak enough to succumb now what punishment do you think i deserve he paused looking at her anxiously for a while she looked steadily ahead absorbed in her own thoughts then slowly she looked back at him with interested incredulous eyes don't english people pay when they lose she asked after a long pause again he colored why yes he said hurriedly yes of course only only what nothing nothing it was only that i thought you wanted i wanted you not to encourage him i never wanted you to think that he isn't a gentleman she made the statement with perfect naturalness as though the subject was one of common everyday discussion according to her code of honor she was justified in putting every possible bar to her father's weakness but where the bar had proved useless where the weakness had conquered and the deed she disapproved of had been accomplished then the matter to her thinking had passed out of her hands her judgment ceased to be individual and became the judgment of her race as she looked at milbank's perplexed concerned face her expression changed and she smiled the smile was gracious and reassuring but below the graciousness lay a tinge of tolerant indulgence we won't talk about it any more she said i don't suppose you can be expected to understand and suddenly raising her head she whistled to the dogs during the remainder of the walk milbank was very silent perplexed and yet fascinated by the problem his mind dwelt unceasingly upon this strange position into which the chances of a day or two had thrown him the bonds that drew him to his entertainers and the gulf that separated him from them were so tangible and yet so elusive in every outward respect they were his fellow human beings they spoke the same language wore the same dress ate the same food and yet unquestionably they were creatures of different fiber he felt curiously daunted and curiously attracted by the peculiar fact to appreciate the difference between the englishman and the irishman one must see the latter in his native atmosphere it is there that his faults and his virtues take on their proper values there that his innate poetry his reckless generosity his prodigal hospitality have fullest scope there that his primitive narrowness of outlook his antiquated sense of honor and his absurdly sensitive self-esteem are most vividly backgrounded outside his own country he is merely a subject of a great empire possessing perhaps a sharper wit and a more ingratiating manner than his fellow-subjects of colder temperament but in his natural environment 
he stands out preeminently as a peculiar development the product of a warm-blooded intelligent imaginative race that by some oversight of nature has been pushed aside in the march of nations milbank made no attempt to formulate this idea or any portion of it as he paced steadily forward across the darkening sands but incontinently it did flash across his mind that the girl beside him claimed more attention in this unsophisticated atmosphere than he might have given her in conventional surroundings she was so much part of the picture so undeniably a child of the sweeping cliffs the magnificent sea and the hundred traditions that encircled the primitive land in her buoyant youthful figure he seemed by a curious retrograde process of the mind to find the solution to his own early worship of ashland ashland had attracted him ruled him domineered over him by right of superiority the hereditary half-barbaric superiority of the natural aristocrat the man of ancient lineage in a country where yesterday and the glories of yesterday stand for everything where to-day is unreckoned with and to-morrow does not exist reaching the end of the strand he turned to her quickly with a strange sensation of sympathy almost of oppression miss clodagh he said gently as she began to ascend the heaped-up boulders that separated the road from the beach miss clodagh i grant that i don't quite understand as you put it but i knew your father many years before you were born and i think that gives me some privilege on one point i have quite made up my mind i shall not play cards again while i am in your house as he spoke clodagh paused in her ascent of the boulders and looked at him in the softly deepening twilight her eyes again held the mysterious promise of great beauty and in their depths a shade of respect of surprised admiration had suddenly become visible as she gazed at him her lips parted involuntarily i didn't think you were so plucky she said then abruptly she stopped glancing over her shoulder from the road behind them came the clicking thud of a horse's hoofs and a moment later the voice of ashland hailed them out of the dusk end of chapter six recording by tom weiss tom's audiobooks dot com part one chapter eight of the gambler this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tom weiss the gambler by catherine cecil thurston it would be futile to deny that the unexpected sound of ashland's voice brought a tremor to the mind of his guest it is disconcerting to the most valiant to be confronted with his antagonist in the very moment that he has laid down his challenge and at best milbank was no hero nevertheless he recovered his equanimity with credible speed and exchanging a quick glance with clodagh scrambled hastily over the remaining stones and reached the road as he gained it ashland pulled up sharply and dismounted from his big bony horse with all the dexterity of a young man with a loud laugh of greeting he slipped the bridle over one hand and linked the other in milbank's arm hello he cried now who'd have dreamt that i'd meet you like this i'm ashamed of you james pon my word i am philandering across the strand in the fall of the evening as if you were still in the twenties it's with me you should have been we had the deuce of a fine run he paused to push his hat from his hot forehead and to rearrange the bridle clodagh who had followed milbank slowly stepped eagerly forward as she caught the last words oh father she cried tell us about it who was there was the sport good did the bay carry you well in her suddenly awakened interest it was clear to milbank that the vital question she had been discussing with him the opinions he had expressed upon it his very existence even were obliterated from her mind her natural youthful exuberance responding to the idea of any physical action as unfailingly as the needle answers to the magnet 
and again the faintly poignant sense of aloofness and age fell upon him as he listened uncomprehendingly to Ashland's excited flow of words and watched the bright, ardent face of the girl glowing out of the shadows. They made a curious trio as they covered the stretch of road that led to Orristown and passed between the heavy moss-grown piers of the big gate entering the deep shade of the avenue. With an instinctive care for his horse, Ashland went first, cautiously guiding the animal over the ruts that time and the heavy rains had ploughed in the soft ground. Behind him came Clodagh, Millbank, and their following of dogs. Once again the thought of what the evening held came unpleasantly to Millbank's mind as the shadow of the gaunt beech trees and the outline of the great square house brought the position home to him afresh. Lack imagination as he might, he realized that it was no light task to thwart a man whose faults had been cultivated and whose peculiarities, racial and personal, had been accentuated by a quarter of a century of comparative isolation. But instinctively, as the thought came to him, he turned to the girl whose erect figure had grown indistinct in the gathering gloom. "'Miss Clodagh,' he whispered, "'though I may not understand, are you satisfied to trust me?' There was a pause. Then, with one of the sudden impulses that formed so large a part of her individuality, Clodagh put out her hand and for an instant her fingers and Millbanks touched. To everyone but Ashland the dinner that evening was a strain, but the silence or the uneasiness of the others was powerless to damp his enthusiasm. His appetite was tremendous, and as he ate plentifully and swallowed glass after glass of sherry, his excitement and his spirits rose. With the ardor of the born sportsman he recounted again and again the details of the day's hunt dwelling lovingly on the behavior of the dogs and horses and the prowess of his own mount in particular. Finally he rose from the table with a flushed face, though a perfectly steady gait, and crossing the room pulled the long bell-rope that hung beside the fireplace. "'Now for our night, James,' he cried. "'Now for my revenge.' "'Clear the table, Bert,' he added, as the old man appeared in answer to the summons. "'Get out the cards and bring enough candles to light us all to glory. He gave a boisterous laugh, and, turning with a touch of bravado, stood facing the picture of his great-grandfather. Instinctively, as he turned his back upon the party, little Nance grew nearer to her sister, and Clodagh glanced at Milbank. As their eyes met he involuntarily stiffened his small spare figure, and with a quick nervous manner nodded towards the door. For a moment Clodagh hesitated, her fear for her father's self-control dominated by her native interest in an encounter. Then Nance decided the matter by plucking hurriedly at her sleeve. "'Don't stop, Clo," she whispered almost inaudibly, her small expressive face puckered with anxiety. "'Don't stop. I'm frightened.' The appeal was instantly effective. Clodagh rose at once and with one arm passed reassuredly round the child's shoulder, slipped silently from the room. For some moments after the two had departed, Ashland retained his position, and Millbank, intently watchful of his tall figure, held himself nervously in hand for the coming encounter. At last, when the cloth had been removed, the candles renewed, and the cards placed upon the table, Ashland turned, his face flushed with anticipation. "'That's good!' he exclaimed. "'That's good! With a bottle of port and a pack of cards a man could be happy in Hades. Not that I'm forgetting the good comrade that gives a flavor to the combination, James. Not that I'm forgetting that!' His smile had much of the charm, his voice much of the warmth that had marked them long ago, as he drew his chair to the table and picked up the cards. Millbank straightened himself in his seat. "'Come along, man, draw up draw up to the table. What shall it be? Euchre again? Are you agreeable to the same stakes? Ashland talked on, heedless of the strangely unresponsive demeanor of his guest. As he ceased to speak, however, Millbank took the plunge he had been contemplating all day. In the silence of the room, broken only by the faint, comfortable hissing of the peat in the fireplace, and the rustling of the cards as Ashland mechanically shuffled them, 
he pulled his chair forward and laid his clasped hands on the table. Dennis, he said in his thin, quiet voice, I am sorry, very sorry to disappoint you, but I cannot play. Ashland paused in the act of shuffling and laid the cards down. What in the name or fortune are you talking about? he asked. His tone was indulgent and amused. It was evident that the meaning in the other's words had not definitely reached him. It is not a joke, Milbank interposed quickly. I cannot. I do not intend to play. Then, for the first time, a shadow of comprehension crossed Ashland's face. But it was only a shadow. With a boisterous laugh he leant forward and filled the empty glasses that stood upon the table, pushing one across to Milbank. "'Have a drop of port, man,' he cried. "'Twill give you courage to cut.' He lifted and drained his own glass, and setting it back upon the table, refilled it. But Milbank remained immovable. His thin hands were still clasped, his pale face looked anxious. "'Go on, James. You're not afraid of a drop of wine?' Again Ashland laughed, but this time there was an unpleasant ring, audible in his voice. Mechanically Milbank lifted his glass to his lips. No, he said with embarrassed deprecation. No, I'm more afraid of your displeasure. I, I'm exceedingly sorry to disappoint you. But once more his host laughed. Nonsense, man. I know your little scruples and your little conscience, and I'm not scared of either. Never meet the devil halfway. He covers the ground too quickly as it is. He caught up the cards again and, forming them into a pack, held them out. Cut, he said laconically. Milbank drew back, and his lips came together in a thin line. Come on, cut. The color of Ashland's face became a shade deeper. Still the other sat rigidly still. For a moment their eyes held each other, then suddenly the blood surged into Ashland's neck and face. Do you mean to say that you refuse to play? he asked slowly. That you refuse to give me my revenge? Milbank met the attack unsteadily. My dear Dennis. But before the words had left his lips, Ashland flung the cards upon the table with a force that sent a score of them flying across the room. And may I ask for your reasons? he demanded with an alarming calm. Milbank fenced. I do not wish to play, and I don't wish to be treated as a fool. The other altered his attitude. My dear Dennis, you surely acknowledge the right of free will? I do not wish to play cards, and therefore beg to be excused. What could be simpler? His manner was slightly perturbed, his speech hasty. There was the suggestion of a sleeping volcano in his host's unnatural calm. In the silence that followed, Ashland lifted his glass and emptied it slowly. I don't know about that, he said as he set it down. There are unwritten codes that all the free will in the world won't dispose of. One of them is that a gentleman who wins at cards cannot refuse his opponent the satisfaction of his revenge. But perhaps the etiquette has changed since my time. His manner was still controlled, but his eyes glittered. Milbank cleared his throat. My dear Ashley, he said, we are surely friends of too long standing to split hairs in this fashion. What is this revenge that you talk of? Nothing. A myth an imaginary justification of honor. A quick sound of contempt escaped Ashland. And what is every code and every sentiment in the world but an outcome of imagination? he cried. What is it but imagination that hurls us off from the beast? I'm satisfied to call it imagination. It tells me that I worsted it last night, and that I'm capable of better things if I try my luck again. I'm satisfied to follow its promptings and demand my revenge. For a while, Milbank sat miserable and undecided. Then, under the goad of the other's eyes, he did an ill-judged thing. Fumbling nervously for his letter-case, he rose from his seat and walked across to the fireplace. "'There is nothing for you to revenge,' he said agitatedly. "'There was no play last night. It's cancelled. I cancel it.' With tremulous haste he pulled out the letter-case, extricated Ashland's check, and dropped it into the fire. There was a pause, a pause of tremendous moment, in which he stood aghast at his own deed. 
Then Ashland turned on him, his face purple and convulsed with rage. "'You dare to insult me! You dare to insult me in my own house! You dare to imply that it was the money, the damned money, that I wanted to win back!' Milbank looked up sharply. "'Good God, no!' he exclaimed with unwanted vehemence. "'Such a thought never entered my mind. Then what's the meaning of all this? What is it our driving at?' ashland's hard handsome face was contorted by passion and his hands shook nothing it's driving at nothing it is simply that i do not wish to play and why not he suddenly rose his great body towering above the others why not my god i'll have an answer there is no answer no answer we'll see about that who's been lying to you about me who's been carrying scandals about me out with it out with it then unexpectedly milbank's trepidation forsook him he suddenly straightened himself no one he answered no one are you quite sure no one then what do you mean by this what do you mean by meddling in my affairs he took a menacing step forward with a fierce gesture he took another step forward milbank stood firm i have my reasons he said quietly your reasons have you ashland laughed harshly then i'll have my answer what do you mean by it for a second the older man remained silent and unmoved then a light gleamed in his colorless eyes all right he said you shall have it perhaps it is as well i came here expecting to see the boy i had known grown into a genial hospitable honorable gentleman instead i find him an undisciplined tyrannical egotist he said it quickly in a rush of unusual vehemence all his anticipations all his suspicions and their subsequent justification coupled with the new sense of protection towards the children of his early friend found voice in these words you are an egotist dennis he repeated distinctly a weak worthless egotist not fit to have children not fit to have a friend ashland stared at him for a moment in speechless surprise then indignation surmounted every other feeling with a fierce gesture he took another step forward his eyes blazing his hand menacingly clenched how how dare you he stammered how dare you by god if you were a bigger man i'd i'd he paused choked by his fury i know i know but i'm not afraid of you i'm not to be bullied into subjection milbank's temper difficult to rouse was stirred at last he gave his host glance for glance. "'You realize what you have said?' Ashland's dark face was distorted. His voice came unsteadily. "'Yes, I regret I have to say it, but I do not regret saying it. It is wholesome for a man to hear the truth.' "'Oh, it's wholesome to hear the truth, is it?' "'Yes, and I won't see you go to pieces for want of a word. You are a man with obligations, and you are neglecting your obligations. There are other things in life besides cards and horses ashland suddenly threw back his head my god you're right he cried and the other things are a damn sight worse i put a good horse before a self-righteous preacher every day milbank's usually pallid face flushed you mean that for me he asked quietly ashland shrugged his shoulders if you like he said if the cap fits for a moment milbank said nothing then once again he straightened his small thin figure very well dennis he said i quite understand with your permission i will say good-bye to you now and to-morrow morning i will catch the earliest train to muscarie he looked at his host steadily then through the temper that still mastered him a twinge of regret a sense of parting and loss obtruded themselves with all his intolerable faults ashland still stood within the halo and glamour of the past dennis he exclaimed suddenly but the appeal was made too late uncontrollable fury the one power which could efface his sense of hospitality possessed ashland his pulses pounded his senses were blurred with a seizing consciousness of insult and injury he turned again upon his desk you can go to hell for all i care he cried savagely for a second milbank continued to look at him then without a word he turned crossed the room and passed into the hall 
End of Part One. Part Two, Chapter One. It was on a windy March morning, three years after his summarily ended visit to Ireland, that James Milbank stood in the bedroom of his London flat. A perturbed frown puckered his forehead, and he held an open letter in his hand. Outside the dark sky and cold searching breeze proclaimed the raw English spring. Inside the partly dismantled walls of the room, the empty drawers and wardrobe, the trunks, bags, and rugs standing ready strapped, all suggested another and more inviting climate. Millbank was bound for the South. Three months earlier he had come to the momentous conclusion that a solitary life in London, spent no matter how comfortably, becomes a colorless and somewhat empty thing after a thirty-three years' experience. He had his club and his friends, but he was not a clubman born, and friends must be very intimate to be all-sufficing. The restlessness that sometimes unexpectedly attacks the middle-aged bachelor had fallen upon him. The suggestion that he craved new surroundings and new fields of interest had been slow in coming, and his acceptance of it had been slow. But steadily and inevitably it had grown into his consciousness, maturing almost against his will, until at last the day had dawned on which he had admitted to himself that a change was indispensable. The subsequent events had followed in natural order. His hobby had urged him to leave his own country for one richer in association. The damp cold of the English winter, coupled with the chilled blood of advancing age, had inclined him to the idea of southern Europe. The result of his triple suggestion was that he stood in his room on that spring morning in the last stages of preparation for a journey to Italy. He stood there with the discomfort of packing pleasantly accomplished and his belongings neatly surrounding him, yet his attitude and expression were those of a man who is faced by an unlooked-for difficulty. With a nervous gesture he shook out the letter that he held and began to read it hastily for the fourth time. It was a long letter written in a careless, almost boyish hand on thin paper and bore the address of Orristown, Ireland. It was dated two days earlier, and began. Dear Mr. Milbank, you will be very much surprised to get this, but I write for father, not for myself. He had a bad accident yesterday while out riding, and is terribly hurt and ill. The doctor from Carrigmore is with him all the time, and my aunt, as well as Nance and I, so he is well cared for. But he seems to get worse instead of better and we are dreadfully frightened about him. There is one thing he constantly craves for, and that is to see you. Ever since that night, three years ago, when you and he quarreled and you went away, I think he has been fretting about you. Of course he has never spoken of it, but I don't think he has ever forgotten that he treated you badly. This morning he talked a great deal about the time when you and he were young together. So much so, that I asked him if he would like to see you. The moment I spoke his face lighted up, but then at once it clouded over again, and he muttered something about never giving any man the chance of refusing him a favor. Dear Mr. Milbank asking you to come here, but I feel differently. I would risk anything a hundred times over on the chance of bringing you to him, and if you are in London please do come, if only for one night don't refuse, for he is very, very bad. Any time you send me a telegram, the trap can meet you either at Muscarie or Dunhaven. This is a dreadful letter, but I have been up all night and scarcely know what I am writing. Answer as soon as possible. Yours, Flodaw Ashland. Milbank scanned the letter to the last line. Then, as he reached the signature, the inertia that had pervaded his mind was suddenly dispersed. His own shock of sorrow and dismay, his own interrupted plans faded from his consideration, and in their place rose the picture of a great white house on the lonely Irish coast, of a sick, perhaps a dying man, of two frightened children and a couple of faithful, inefficient servants. With an energy he had not evinced for years, 
he crossed the room, stumbling over straps and parcels, and rang the bell with imperative haste. When a surprised maid appeared at the door, he turned to her with unwanted excitement. "'I have a telegram to send,' he said, "'one that must go at once.' The rest of that day, with its suddenly altered plans, its long railway journey from Paddington to New Milford, and its stormy night crossing from the latter point to the town of Waterford, was too beset with haste and confusion to contain any definite recollections for Milbank. It was not until he had taken his seat at eight o'clock next morning in the small and leisurely train that transports passengers from Waterford to the seaport of Dunhaven that he found time to realize the significance of his journey, and not until he descended from his carriage at this latter station and was greeted by old Burke, the Orristown retainer, that he fully appreciated the gravity of the incident that had occasioned it. There was no change apparent in Burke's familiar face save the gloom that overhung his expression. But this was obvious to Milbank at a first glance. "'You're welcome, sir,' were his opening words. Then the underlying bent of his thoughts found vent. "'Tis a sorrowful house you'll be finding,' he added in a subdued voice. Milbank glanced up sharply from the rug he was unstrapping. "'How is he?' he asked. "'Not worse?' Milbank shook his head. "'Twouldn't be wishing for me to give you the bad word,' he began deprecatingly. "'Then he is bad.' The old man pursed up his lips. "'Ah, I'm in dread tis for his long home he's bound,' he said reluctantly. "'Glory be to God and his holy ways. But tis of them two poor children that I do be thinking.' But Milbank's mind was occupied with his first words. "'But how is he?' he demanded. "'What is the injury? Has he an efficient doctor?' Again Burke shook his head. "'Doctors?' he said dubiously. "'Wish I, I don't put much pass on doctors. Not but what they might say Dr. Gallagher from Carrigamore is a fine hand with a knife. But sure when the Almighty takes the notion to break every bone in a man's body, tisn't for the like of doctors to be settin' up to mend them. With this piece of pessimistic philosophy he picked up Milbank's bags and rug and guided him through the small station into the open where the Orristown trap stood waiting in a downpour of rain. He imparted little more information during the long drive, and Milbank had to sit under his dripping umbrella with as much patience as he could muster while they ploughed forward over an execrable road. The gateway of Orristown, when at last it was reached, looked mouldy and forlorn in the chilly damp of the atmosphere, and as they plunged up the avenue at the usual reckless pace a perfect torrent of raindrops deluged them from the intersecting branches of the trees. Yet despite the gloom and the discomfort a thrill of something like pleasure filled Milbank as a whiff of pure cold air brought the scent of the sea to his nostrils and the turn of the avenue showed the square house, white and massive, against the grey sky. But he was given little time to indulge in the pleasure of reminiscence, for instantly the trap drew up, the hall door was thrown open, showing a face and a figure that sent everything but the moment and the business in hand far from his mind. It was Clodagh who stood there waiting to greet him. Clodagh, curiously changed, and grown in the three years that had passed since their last meeting. In place of the spirited, unformed child that he remembered, Milbank saw a very young girl whose boyishness of figure had disappeared in slight feminine curves, whose bright fearless eyes had softened into uncommon beauty. With a glow of relief lighting up her face, she stepped forward as the horse halted, and heedless of the rain that fell on her uncovered head, laid one hand on the shaft of the trap. "'Oh, it's good of you, it's good of you!' she exclaimed. "'We can never forget it.' Then the color flooded her cheeks, and her eyes filled. "'Oh, he's so bad,' she added. "'It's so terrible to see him, so terrible.' She looked up with alarm and impotence into Milbank's face. But it was not the guest, but old Burke who found words to calm her fear and grief. Leaning down from his seat, he laid a rough hand on her shoulder. "'Wist now, Miss Clodagh,' he said softly, "'wist now. Sure God is good. While there's life there's hope. Don't be believin' anything else. Sure what is he but a young man yet?' "'That's true, Bert, 
that's true clodagh exclaimed quickly won't you come in mr milbank she added you know how welcome you are once inside the hall she turned to him quickly and confidingly i can never forget that you've done this she said it's a really really generous thing but all my mind is full of father you can understand can't you her agitation her alarm her evident helplessness in presence of a contingency never previously faced all touched him deeply his tone was low and gentle as he responded i understand perfectly perfectly he said poor dennis poor dennis how did the thing occur oh just an accident just an accident about six months ago he took a fancy for riding late at night he used to ride for miles along the most dangerous paths of the cliff i knew it wasn't safe i said so over and over again but you know father she gave a little hopeless shake of her head on monday night he saddled one of the young horses at about ten o'clock and went out by himself it came to twelve and he hadn't returned then we began to get uneasy and at one o'clock we started to look for him after a search all along the cliff we found him wedged between two of the upper ledges of the rocks terribly terribly hurt she shuddered palpably at the recollection we didn't know we don't even know now quite how it happened but we think the horse must have lost his footing and fallen over the cliff throwing father for the poor thing was found dead on the shingle next morning twas a miracle that father escaped with his life but he's terribly injured she paused again as though the subject was too painful to be pursued milbank looked at her compassionately has he had proper medical advice he asked oh yes dr gallagher from carrigmore has done everything and we have a trained nurse from waterford that's right i must have a talk with the doctor but how is dennis now will he know me do you think oh yes ever since the first night he has been quite conscious he expects you he's longing to see you then may i go to him clodagh nodded and turning led the way silently up the remembered staircase on the landing the recollection of their curious interview on his first night at Oristown recurred forcibly to Milbank. He glanced at his guide to see if it had any place in her mind, but her thoughts were evidently full of other things. With a quick gesture that enjoined silence she led him down the corridor upon which rough fiber mats had been strewn to deaden sound. With that peculiar sensation of awe that serious illness always engenders, he tiptoed after her, a sense of apprehensive depression growing upon him with every step. As they neared the end of the passage, a door opened noiselessly, and two figures emerged from a darkened room. The taller of the two, a pale emaciated woman dressed in mourning, was unknown to him, but a glance told him that the latter was little Nance, grown to pretty, immature girlhood. On catching sight of him, she drew back with a passing touch of the old shyness, but conquering it almost directly she came forward and shook hands in silence. In the momentary greeting he saw that her vivacious little face was red and marred by tears, but before he had time for further observation Clodagh touched his arm. "'My aunt, Mrs. Ashland,' she whispered. Milbank bowed, and Mrs. Ashland extended her hand we meet on a sad occasion mr milbank she murmured in a low querulous voice my poor brother-in-law was always such a rash man but with some people you know there is no such thing as remonstrating even this morning when mr curry our rector from carrigmore came to have a little talk with him he was barely polite and it was only yesterday that we dared to tell him that dr gallagher insisted on having a nurse now what can you do with a patient like that Milbank murmured something vaguely unintelligible, and Clodagh stirred impatiently. "'Did you give him the medicine, Aunt Fan?' she asked. "'I did, but with great difficulty. My brother-in-law has always been averse to medical aid,' she explained to Milbank. "'He's never had any need of it,' Clodagh whispered sharply. "'Will you come, Mr. Milbank? He's quite alone. The nurse is resting.' With great dignity Mrs. Ashland moved away. I shall ask Hannah to get me a cup of tea, Clodagh, she murmured. I get such a headache from a sick room. Without replying, Clodagh turned again to Milbank. 
he's not to get excited she whispered and mind mind don't say that you think him looking badly she paused and laid her fingers lightly on his arm then with a swift movement she stepped forward drawing him with her into the big darkened room with its sense of preternatural quiet and its pungent suggestive smell of drugs and antiseptic dressings end of chapter one chapter two with a strange blending of curiosity and shrinking Milbank obeyed the pressure of Clodagh's hand and moved forward into the room. The cold March daylight was partly excluded by drawn blinds, but a glow from the fire played upon the walls and the high four-post bedstead. With the same mingling of curiosity and dread, his eyes fell at once upon this prominent article of furniture and remained fixed there in doubt and incredulity. For the moment his senses refused to acknowledge that the feverish, haggard face that stared at him from the pillows was the face of Ashland, Ashland, tyrannical, passionate, greedy of life. In the hours of agony that he had passed through, the sick man's features had become shrunken, causing his eyes to stare forth preternaturally large and restless. His hair had been cropped close to allow the dressing of a wound over the temple, and the tight white bandages lent a strange and unfamiliar appearance to his finely shaped head. With a sick sensation Milbank went slowly forward. The patient made no attempt to move as he drew near the bed, but his feverish bright glance seemed to devour his face. "'Here he is, father,' Clodagh exclaimed softly and eagerly. "'Here's Mr. Milbank. Now aren't you happy?' "'He's not able to move,' she explained, turning to the guest. "'It gives him terrible agony to stir.' Milbank had reached the bed, and with a sensation of awkwardness and impotence impossible to describe, he stood looking down upon Ashland. "'My poor Dennis,' he said, "'my poor, poor friend. This is a bad business. I had no idea.' Then he paused confusedly, remembering Clodagh's warning. "'But we'll see you laughing at it all before we're much older,' he added, in awkward haste to make amends. A gleam of something like irony crossed Ashland's watchful eyes. "'I'm done for this time, James,' he said feebly. "'I suppose I've had my day, and like every other dog, must answer to the whistle. I don't complain. I'm getting more than my deserts in seeing you again. You're as welcome as the flowers in you,' his voice failed. "'I know, I know. Don't trouble. Don't try to speak.' Milbank bent over him anxiously. But Ashland glanced back. "'Ah, but that's what I must do, James,' he said sharply. "'That's what I want you for. I have something that must be said.' Milbank turned to Clodagh. "'Is it right of him to excite himself?' he asked in distress. "'If it's anything that you reproach yourself with, Dennis.' But Ashland interrupted with a weak echo of his old intolerance. "'Send Clo away,' he said. "'There's something I want to say.' Again Milbank looked helplessly at Clodagh, but her eyes were fixed passionately on her father's face. "'He'll excite himself more if we cross him,' she said hesitatingly. "'I think I'd better go.' Still Milbank hesitated. "'But the doctor,' he hazarded, "'if the doctor insists on quiet.' She glanced at him quickly, her clear eyes brimming. "'Oh, I don't know,' she exclaimed. "'I can't cross him. I can't cross him. He's wanted you so badly.' She turned quickly towards the bed. Father, she said tenderly, won't you promise not to talk much? Won't you promise to take care? For answer, Ashland looked up, meeting her glaze. I'll promise, child. I'll promise. Run away now, and God bless you. He added the expressive native phrase in a suddenly lowered voice. Clodagh bent quickly and kissed his hot drawn face with passionate affection. Then, as if fearing to trust herself, she turned hastily and passed out of the room. Instantly the two men were alone. Ashland turned to his guest. James, he said agitatedly, I haven't thought much about the Almighty in these last years, but I give you my word, I have prayed that I might see you before I die. My dear Dennis, don't. I beg you not to excite yourself. I implore you. Ashland, made a harsh sound of impatience. Don't waste breath 
over a dying man, he said roughly. Then, seeing the distress in the other's face, he altered his tone. Don't take it to heart, James. It's the road we must all travel. They think there's life in me yet, but I know better. You may blindfold the sheep as much as you like, but twill know that you're dragging it to the slaughter. I tell you, I'm done for. As done for as if the undertaker had measured me for the coffin. He moved his head slightly and painfully, his feverish glance brightening. James, he exclaimed suddenly, I'm in a terrible position, but tisn't death that's troubling me. Dennis! Tis true. I'm not frightened of death. I hope I'm man enough to face a natural law. Twould have been better if I'd had to face it thirty years ago. Dennis, don't. I beg you to keep quiet. Quiet? I tell you there's not much quiet for a man like me. Tisn't what I'm going to that's troubling me, but what I'm leaving behind. I'll be paying me own score on the other side, but here tis others will be paying it for me. His burning eyes fixed themselves on Milbanks. But my dear old friend, don't talk to me, James. Don't waste words on me. I'm broke inside and out. I'm smashed. I'm done for. A spasm of pain, mental and physical, twisted his features. The weak, worthless egotist has come to the end of his rope. He tried to laugh. Milbank, in deep apprehension, laid his hand lightly on his shoulder. Dennis, he pleaded, don't talk like this. Don't torture yourself like this. Ashley groaned. Tis involuntary, he cried. Tis wrung from me. Every time they come into the room, every time I see the tears in their eyes, every time they kiss me, I tell you, I taste hell. Who? The children, my children. Another spasm crossed his face. You once told me I was not fit to have children, James. And you were right. By God, you were right. Dennis, I refuse to listen. I insist. I don't bother yourself. Tisn't of my damned health, I'm thinking. Then what is it? What is troubling you? The children. The children. I've been a blackguard, James. A blackguard. He moved his head sharply, regardless of the agony the movement caused. I tell you, I don't care what's before myself. I've always been a reckless fool. But tis the children, the children. What of the children? A sound of mockery and despair escaped Ashton. Ah, you may well ask, he said. You may well ask. Tis the question I've been putting to myself every hour since they laid me here. You know the world, James. You know what the world will be to two pretty, penniless girls. And they're so unconscious of it all. That's the sting of it. They're so unconscious of it all. They care for me. They cling to me as if I were a good man. And in five years' time they may be cursing the hour they were born. A fresh groan was wrung from him. A look of apprehension crossed Milbank's face. Oh, no, Dennis, he exclaimed quickly. No, things can't be as bad as that. Your suffering has told upon your nerves. Things can't be as bad as that. They are worse. I tell you these two children will face life without a penny. No, no, you exaggerate. Why, even if you were to die, they would still have the place. The place must be worth something. Ah, if they could only drug my conscience with that thought. But I can't, I can't. Before I'm cold in my grave, my creditors will be down on the property like a swarm of rats. No, no, yes, I tell you, yes. The children will be homeless as well as penniless. Milbank glanced about him in deep perplexity. There's your sister-in-law, he hazarded at length. Fan, Ashlyn made a contemptuous glance. Fan is as poor as a church mouse already. Lawrence had nothing to leave her. The Navy beggared him. No, Fan could do nothing for them. And anyway, she and Clodagh couldn't stand each other for a twelve-month. You may as well try to blend fire and water. No, there's no way out of it. I'm reaping the whirlwind, James. I'm reaping it with a vengeance. The fever of his suffering and the excitement of his remorse were burning in his eyes. In the three days of his illness his natural exuberance of mind had been directed towards one point, the tardily aroused knowledge of the future that awaited his children, and the consequence had been a piteous intermingling of realization and partial delirium. 
his agony and helplessness were pitiable as he turned to his friend. "'What am I to do, James?' he asked. "'What am I to do?' Milbank bent over him. "'Dennis, Dennis,' he pleaded. "'But what am I to do? Advise me while there's time. Tis for that I've wanted you. You've always been a good man. What must I do?' Milbank tightened his lips. "'You have friends,' he said. "'Ah, but how many, and where?' There was no response for a moment, as Milbank slowly straightened himself and glanced across the room towards the fire. Then, very quietly, he turned towards the bed. "'You have one here,' he said, in a low voice. For an instant Ashlyn answered nothing. There was an odd sound. Something between a laugh and a sob shook him. "'James!' he cried. "'James!' But Milbank leant forward hastily. "'Not a word, not one word. If thanks are due, it is from me to you. It is not every day that human responsibilities fall to an old bachelor of my age.' Ashland remained silent. Dissipated, blunted, degenerated though he might be, his native intuition was unimpaired, and in a flash of illumination he saw the grade of nobility the high point of honor to which this prosaic, unimaginative man had attained in that moment of need. With a pang of acute pain he freed his uninjured arm and shakingly held out his hand. "'There are no friends like the old friends, James,' he said in a broken voice. End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 Ashland scarcely spoke again during the early portion of that day. The immense effort of his explanation to Milbank left him correspondingly weak, though through all his exhaustion a look of peace and satisfaction was visible in his eyes. During the whole morning Milbank remained at his bedside, only leaving the rooms to partake, at Clodagh's urgent request, of a hurried meal in the deserted dining-room. At twelve o'clock the nurse resumed her duties and soon afterwards the dispensary doctor from Carrigmore drove over to see his patient. Before he came into the sick room Milbank left it, but when his examination over he departed with a whispered injunction to the nurse he found the stranger waiting for him in the corridor. Milbank stepped forward as he appeared and silently motioned him down the passage to his own room, inviting him to enter with a punctilious gesture. Dr. Gallagher, I believe, he said, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Milbank. I am a very old friend of your patient. With a slow but friendly gesture, the young man held out his hand. Oh, I know all about you, he said. I'm glad to make your acquaintance. His voice, with its marked Irish accent, was soft and pleasant, and his glance was good-natured. But his tanned skin and rough shooting suit suggested the sportsman rather than the medical practitioner. Milbank eyed him quickly. "'Then you won't misunderstand anything I may say.' Gallagher smiled. "'Not a bit of it,' he answered nonchalantly. "'And what's more, I think I know what it's going to be.' A shade of confusion passed over the Englishman's face. His understanding was still unattuned to the half-shrewd, half-inquisitive tendencies of the Irish mind. With a shadowy suspicion that he was being unobtrusively ridiculed, he became a degree colder. "'I am grieved beyond measure at Mr. Ashland's condition, Dr. Gallagher,' he said, "'and it has struck me, it has been suggested to my mind that possibly,' he stopped uncertainly, "'that possibly, that perhaps there ought to be another opinion.' Gallagher looked at him complacently. "'Well, maybe you're right. "'Tisn't because I condemn him that he shouldn't appeal to a higher court.' Milbank started. "'Then you think poorly of his chances.' Gallagher shook his head expressively. "'You despair of him.' A pang of unexpected grief touched Milbank. He realized suddenly how distant, vague, and yet how real a part the ideal of his youth had played in his life and thoughts, how deep a niche unknown to them both. Ashland had carved for himself. 
with a sense of loss altogether disproportionate to circumstances, he turned again to the doctor. "'Yes, I should like another opinion,' he said quickly. "'The best we can get. The best in Ireland. We can't get a man from town sooner than tomorrow, and time is everything. I suppose Dublin is the place to wire to? Not that I am disparaging you,' he added. "'I feel confident you have done everything.' Gallagher smiled. Oh, I'm not taking the fence. It's only human nature to think what you do. I'll meet anyone you like to name, but he'll say the same as me. And that is? That he's done for. Gallagher lowered his voice. He hasn't the stamina to pull through, even if we could patch him up. He's been undermining that big frame of his for the last ten years. No man nowadays can sit up half the night drinking port without paying heavily for it. Many a time driving home from a late call, I've seen the light in these windows at three in the morning. Millbank pulled out his watch. But these Dublin doctors, he said, tell me their names. Gallagher pondered a moment. Well, there's Dowden, Gregg, and Merrick, he said. And, of course, there's Molyneux. Molyneux is a magnificent surgeon. If any man in Ireland can make a suggestion, he will. But, of course, it's he. Milbank interrupted sharply. Molyneux let it be, he said decisively. Wire for him when you get back to Carrigmore. Wire urgently. The expenses will be my affair. What they may amount to is of no consideration. A look of involuntary respect crossed Gallagher's face. I understand, he said. I'll wire at once, and you can comfort yourself that you'll have the best opinion in the country. He nodded genially, the new considerations for Millbank tinging his usually careless manner, and with an inaudible word of farewell turned on his heel. Once again Millbank went in search of Clodagh. He suffered no small trepidation at the thought of communicating his action to her, and he bestowed much silent consideration upon the manner in which he should couch his information. Failing to find her in the house, he wandered out into the grounds. The rain had ceased, and a watery gleam of sunshine was falling on the wet gravel of the drive. Picking his way carefully, he turned in the direction of the yard, but he had scarcely reached it when Clodagh's clear voice reached him, directing Burke as to some provisions required from Muscarie. On seeing her guest she came forward at once. Her face looked brighter and happier than he had seen it since his arrival. Her mercurial nature had responded instantly to the apparent change in Ashland. "'Oh, isn't it lovely that he's so much better?' she cried. "'You must have the gift of healing. It's like as if you had said a charm.' Millbank made no response. "'Why don't you say something?' she asked quickly. "'Don't you think he's better? Doesn't the doctor think he's better?' Her quick mind sprang like lightning from one conclusion to another. "'Mr. Millbank,' she added, "'you're keeping something back. There's something you don't like to say. Then, at last, Milbank found voice. Indeed, no, Miss Clodagh. You are wrong, quite wrong, believe me. There is nothing to be alarmed at, nothing. It is only... Only what? Now, don't be alarmed. I beg you not to be alarmed. The sudden whiteness that had overspread her face unnerved him. It is only that I, as a Londoner, am a little doubtful of your village doctor. A mere prejudice, I know, but Gallagher is broad-minded and willing to humor me, and he, I, that is, we both think that another opinion will do no harm. It's nothing to be alarmed at, nothing, believe me, a mere formality. But Clodagh's lips had paled. She stood looking at him silently, her large questioning eyes reminding him disconcertingly of Ashland's. Miss Clodagh, he said again, don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. It's only to satisfy an old septic. Oh, no, it isn't, she said suddenly. Oh, no, it isn't. I know, I know quite well. It means that he's going to die. Her voice caught, and with a swift movement she turned and fled out of the yard, leaving Millbank pained, bewildered, and alarmed. The afternoon passed in weary, monotonous waiting. Half an hour after the conversation in the yard, Clodagh appeared in her father's room. She was pale and subdued, 
and her eyelids looked suspiciously red, but she took her place quietly at the foot of the bed. She sat very still, her eyes fixed on Ashland's face, apparently heedless of both the nurse's deft movements and Millbank's silent, unobtrusive presence. At three o'clock the acute pains that had tormented the patient at intervals ever since the accident had occurred returned with a violence that seemed accentuated by the respite he had obtained during the morning. For an hour or more he writhed and groaned in unspeakable agony while those about him suffered a reflected torment and chafed impotently at the distance that cut off Carrigmore and the possibility of any fresh medical relief. The nurse was unceasingly vigilant, but the mild and cautious remedies ordered by Gallagher were powerless to soothe the violent pain. At last nature mercifully intervened, and the exhausted sufferer fell into a sleep that lasted for several hours. At seven o'clock there was a stir of excitement through the house, as the whisper passed from one to another that the Dublin surgeon had arrived. When the news reached the sick-room Millbank drew a breath of intense relief, but Clodagh's pale face went a shade whiter. The great man arrived attended by Gallagher and was shown directly to the patient's room. There was a confused moment of introduction, then Millbank and Clodagh slipped quietly into the passage, leaving the doctors and the nurse to their work. During a long interval of indescribable suspense Molyneux made his examination. Then, without a word, he and Gallagher emerged from the room and descended solemnly into the dining-room. While this final conference lasted, Clodagh, who had returned to her vigil immediately the doctors had left the sick-room, sat silent and motionless beside the bed. Outside, in the corridor, Mrs. Ashland wandered to and fro, weakly tearful and agitated, while Nance stood beside her father's door, afraid to enter, and yet reluctant to remain outside. Downstairs in the hall Millbank paced up and down in nervous perturbation, awaiting his summons to the conclave. At last the door opened, and Gallagher looked out. "'Mr. Millbank,' he said, "'Dr. Molyneux would like to see you.' With a little start of agitation, Millbank went forward. In the dining-room a great peat fire was burning as usual, lighting up the faces of Ashland's ancestors, but the candles in the silver sconces were unlighted and the window-curtains had not been drawn. In the dull light from the three long windows the large placid face of Molyneux looked preternaturally long and solemn. Millbank felt his heart sink. In formal silence the great man rose and motioned him forward, and the three sat down at the center table. Mr. Millbank, he began in slow and unctuous tones. I suppose you would like me to come to the point with as little delay as possible. Professional details will not interest you. Millbank nodded mechanically. Molyneux hesitated, studying his well-kept hands. Then he looked up with the decorous reserve proper to the occasion. I regret to inform you, Mr. Millbank, he said softly, that my visit is of little I might say, of no avail. Dr. Er, Gallagher's diagnosis of the case is satisfactory, perfectly satisfactory. Beyond mitigating his sufferings, I fear we can do nothing for our poor friend. Nothing. Millbank felt a sudden dryness in his throat. Molyneux shook his head with becoming gravity. Nothing, Mr. Millbank. The injuries to his ribs and hip we might have coped with but the seat of the trouble lies deeper, the internal, but Millbank held up his hand. "'I beg you to give me no details,' he said weakly. "'This, this is a great shock to me.' He covered his face with his hands and sat silent for a few seconds. Molyneux topped lightly upon the table with his fingertips. "'It was merely that your mind might be fully satisfied, Mr. Millbank,' he said a trifle pompously. Millbank started. Forgive me, I understand. I fully understand. It is only the thought of what lies before us, the thought of his children's grief. Molyneux made a gracious gesture of comprehension. Ah, yes, he murmured. Very distressing, most distressing. He looked vaguely round the room. 
and Gallagher, as if anticipating his thought, pulled out his watch. Millbank rose quickly. "'I thank you very much, Dr. Molyneux,' he said, "'for your, your valuable opinion. I think Miss Ashland wishes to know if your train will permit you to partake of some dinner before you leave us.' Molyneux smiled with the air of a man who has put an unpleasant duty aside. "'Ah, thank you,' he said suavely. "'Thank you. If Dr. Gallagher gives me permission, I shall be charmed. He understands your local timetables and has promised that I shall catch the night mail to Dublin.' He smiled again and glanced genially round the firelit room. "'What interesting family portraits our poor friend possesses,' he added with pleasant affability but Milbank did not seem to hear. "'If you will excuse me for a moment,' he said hastily, "'I will see that you are caused no unnecessary delay. You can understand that we, that we are a somewhat demoralized household.' His voice was agitated, his step uneven as he crossed the room and passed into the hall. Molyneux followed him with a conventional glance of sympathy, then his eyes turned again to the pictures with the gratified glance of a dilettante. "'Do you happen to know if this is a Reynolds?' he said to Gallagher, rising and crossing the room. End of Part 2, Chapter 3 Recording by Tom Weiss, TomsAudiobooks.com Part 2, Chapter 4 of The Gambler this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Gambler by Catherine Cecil Thurston. Chapter 4. To the last day of his life, that evening, with its horde of harassing and unfamiliar sensations, remained stamped upon Milbank's mind, and not least among the unpleasant recollections was the visit of Molyneux and the dinner at which he himself unwillingly played host. It may have been that his usually placid susceptibilities had undergone a strain that rendered him oversensitive, but whatever the cause, the atmosphere diffused by the great man jarred upon him. In his eyes it seemed little short of callous that one who had just passed sentence of death upon his patient could so far remain unmoved as to partake with relish of the dinner set before him and comment with affable appreciation upon the quality of the patient's wines. Milbank spoke little during the course of that meal. Try as he might to enact the part entrusted to him, his thoughts persistently wandered to the room upstairs with its doomed sufferer and its anxious watchers as yet mercifully ignorant of the verdict that had been pronounced. But if the host was silent, the guest made conversation. Gallagher was assiduous in his attentions to the man who, in his eyes, stood for the attainment of all ambition. And Molyneux, under the unlooked-for stimulus of good if homely food and wines that even as an epicure he admitted to be remarkable, was graciously pleased to accept the homage of his humble colleague and to display a suave glimpse of the polished wit for which he was noted in society. His expressions of regret were perfectly genuine when at last the sound of wheels on the gravel of the drive broke in upon his discourse, and Gallagher deprecatingly drew out his watch. "'The way of the world, Mr. Milbank,' he murmured as he rose, "'our pleasantest acquaintances and the soonest. I must wish you good-bye, with many thanks for your delightful hospitality. So far as our poor friend is concerned,' he added in a correctly altered tone, Dr. Gallagher may be relied upon to do everything. In a case like this, where physical pain is recurrent and violent, we can only have recourse to narcotics. We have already allayed the suffering consequence of my examination, and you may rely upon some hours of calm. For any subsequent contingency, Dr. Gallagher has my instructions. Of course, if you wish me to have one more glimpse at him before I go. But Milbank, who had also risen, held out his hand mechanically. "'Oh, no,' he said quietly. "'No, thank you. I don't think we will trouble you any further. It has been a great satisfaction to have obtained your—your your opinion.' 
Molyneux waved his hand magnanimously. "'Don't mention it,' he murmured. "'My regret is deep that I have been of so little avail. Good-bye again, Mr. Milbank. It has been an honor as well as a pleasure to meet you.' He smiled blandly, and added the last remark as Gallagher solicitously helped him into his fur-lined traveling coat. Then, still suavely genial, he passed out of the dining-room towards the hall door. Gallagher hurried after him, but in passing Milbank he paused. "'I'll be back in an hour, Mr. Milbank. I'm just gone as far as Carrigmore with Dr. Molyneux to get an additional supply of morphia.' Milbank nodded silently and in his turn stepped into the hall. When the two men had entered the waiting vehicle, when Molyneux had waved a courtly farewell and the coachman had gathered up the reins, he turned and slowly began to mount the stairs. Instantly his foot touched the landing, Mrs. Ashland darted from the shadowy corridor. "'What news?' she asked agitatedly. "'Oh, Mr. Milbank, what news? The suspense has been dreadful.' Her voice trembled. Tears came very easily to Mrs. Ashland, and her habitual attitude of mourning had heretofore irritated Milbank. But now her thin face and faded black garments came as a curiously welcome contrast to the bland affluence, the genial complacent superiority, of Molyneux. He turned to her with a feeling of warmth. "'Forgive my delay, Mrs. Ashland,' he said gently. "'One is never in a hurry to impart bad news. Dr. Molyneux holds out no hope, not a shadow of hope.' There was a pause. Then Mrs. Ashland made a tragic gesture. "'Oh, the children!' she murmured. "'The poor, poor children! What will become of them?' "'The children will be provided for,' Milbank said hastily. Then, without giving her time for question or astonishment, he went on again. "'Don't say anything of this to Clodagh,' he enjoined. "'She must have these last hours in peace. Certainly, certainly. Poor Dennis! Poor Dennis! I always said he would have an unfortunate end. But go in and see him, Mr. Milbank. Clodagh is in the room.' Milbank silently acquiesced and moved slowly down the corridor. At the door of her father's room he found Nance still patiently watchful. He paused, arrested by his new sense of obligation, and looked down into the upturned, wistful little face. "'What are you doing here, Nance?' he asked kindly. She made a valiant attempt to conjure up her pretty, winning smile, but her lips began to tremble. "'I don't know,' she said shyly and softly. Then, in a sudden burst of confidence, she stepped close to him. "'Clo doesn't like me to go in,' she murmured. "'She thinks it makes me sad to see father.' and I don't know where to go. I'd be in Hannah's way, in the kitchen, and I don't like being with Aunt Fan, and, and I'm frightened to be by myself. There's a horrid sort of feel in the house." Her dark eyes searched Milbank's face appealingly, and with a sensation of pity and protection he stooped and took one of her cold, limp hands. "'You may come in,' he said gently. "'It is very lonely out here. I think we can make Clodagh understand.' Without hesitation her fingers closed round his in a movement of confidence and gratitude, and together they passed into the room where Ashland lay peacefully under the influence of the narcotic administered by Molyneux. By Gallagher's orders the nurse, who had been deprived of her necessary rest in the morning, had retired to her room again in preparation for the night, and only Clodagh was in attendance. Having quietly closed the door, Milbank halted hesitatingly, expecting a flood of questions. But to his intense surprise she did not even glance in his direction. She sat motionless and pale, her eyes on her father's face, her attitude stiff and almost defiant. He wondered for a moment whether by the power of instinct she had divined Molyneux's verdict, or whether through some source unknown to him the news of it had already reached her. With a sense of trepidation he tightened his fingers round Nance's small hand and drew her silently into a corner of the room. For more than an hour the three watchers sat regarding their patient. No one attempted to speak. No one appeared to have anything to say. 
Once or twice Mrs. Ashland flitted agitatedly in and out of the room, but none of them took heed of her presence. Occasionally a clock struck in the silent house, or a cinder fell from the fire, causing them all to start nervously. But except for these interruptions the quiet was preternatural. It was with a throb of relief in his heart that Millbank at last caught the sound of Gallagher's horse trotting up the avenue, and knew by the shutting of the hall door that the doctor had entered the house. He walked into the sick room a few minutes later, and with a casual nod to all present moved at once to the bed. Bending over Ashland he felt his pulse, then glanced significantly at Millbank, who had risen on his entrance. "'I think we must inject a stimulant,' he said. "'The pulse is a little weak.' With a faint sound of consternation Clodagh stood up. "'Oh, he's not worse,' she said. "'Dr. Gallagher, he's not worse.' Gallagher looked at her, and his expression changed. The distress of a pretty girl is always difficult to resist. "'No, Miss Ashland,' he said kindly. "'Now you see he has gone through a lot. We must expect him to be weak.' Clodagh looked relieved, though the alarm still lingered in her eyes. "'Of course,' she said. "'Yes, of course. Is there anything I can do?' Gallagher glanced at her again. "'Well,' he said quietly, "'perhaps you will call the nurse for me. There's no real need for her, but it's just as well we should have her on the spot.' Again Clodagh's eyes darkened with apprehension, but she made no remark. Signaling to Nance to follow her, she left the room. As the two girls disappeared, Gallagher bent again over Ashland, making another rapid examination. Then once more he glanced up at Millbank. "'He may not last the night,' he said below his breath. Molyneux expected that it wouldn't be a long business, but we didn't look for the change so soon as this. Millbank did not alter his position. "'You'll stay on, of course,' he said mechanically. "'Yes, oh, yes, I'll stay on.' As he said the last word, Clodagh reappeared. "'The nurse will be here in a minute,' she said in a steady voice. The unrelaxed, monotonous vigil lasted until two o'clock. Then, as Ashland showed a disposition to rally, the doctor asserted his authority and dismissed Mrs. Ashland, Nance, and Millbank for a much-needed rest, Clodagh alone refusing to leave the room. Though he would not have admitted it, the command came as a boon to Millbank. His long and arduous journey, coupled with the strain and excitement of the day and evening, had culminated in intense weariness, and when Gallagher's order came it would have been a superhuman effort to offer any protest. Reaching his room, he took off his boots, and, partially undressing, threw himself upon his bed. How many hours he slept the deep sleep of utter exhaustion he did not know. His first effort at awaking consciousness was a thrill of nervous fright that made him sit up in bed, aware with a sudden shock that someone was knocking imperatively on his door and calling him by name in low, agitated tones. "'Mr. Milbank, Mr. Milbank, wake, please, quick, Mr. Milbank!' He stared into the darkness for an instant in dazed apprehension. Then he slid out of bed, fumbling blindly for his dressing-gown. "'Coming!' he called. "'Coming!' Having found the garment, he crossed the room, stumbling, thrusting his arms into the sleeves as he went. Opening the door, he realized the situation with a sick sinking of the heart. Clodagh stood in the corridor with a blanched face, holding a candle in her shaking hand, "'Oh, come, please!' she exclaimed. "'Come quick!' Without a word he stepped forward, and the two hurried down the passage. In the sick room the fire was glowing, and additional candles had been lighted. For a second Millbank paused at the door. Then, as his eyes grew accustomed to the axis of light, the scene became clear to him. On the bed lay Ashland, his head partly propped up by pillows, his eyes wide, his breath coming in slow, difficult gas. Gallagher was moving about the room with more quickness and deftness than the Englishman could have believed possible. Mrs. Ashland, unnerved and yet fascinated, leaned upon the end of the bed, while Nance, crying silently, followed the nurse to and fro in dazed, half-comprehending fear, and Hannah, the household factotum, crouched behind the door, weeping and murmuring inarticulate prayers. 
The picture turned Millbank cold. With an instinctive gesture he paused with the intention of shielding it from Clodagh's sight. But at the very moment that he turned towards her a convulsion shook the dying man. He half lifted himself in bed, his eyes staring wildly. As Gallagher rushed forward a faint sound escaped him. His head fell forward, and his body collapsed in the doctor's arms. There was a breathless, appalled silence, a silence that seemed to extend over years. At last Gallagher looked up. "'It's all over,' he said in a hushed voice. For a minute no one spoke, no one moved. It seemed as if the whole room was petrified. Then Gallagher quietly laid the body back upon the pillows, and as though the action broke the spell, Clodagh gave a sudden sharp cry and ran forward to the bed. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 The three days that followed Ashland's death resolved themselves into so many hours of gloom and confusion that found their culmination in the funeral ceremony. To Irishmen of every class a funeral is invested with an almost symbolic importance and a solemn consideration is bestowed upon its most minute details. As Millbank, deeply imbued with the horror and suddenness of the whole disaster, was filled with a growing astonishment at the numberless preliminaries, the amount of precedence and prestige requiring consideration, before one poor human body could be hidden away. But he rose dutifully to the occasion and proved himself unfailingly patient and conscientious in every emergency, from the first repugnant interview with the undertaker to the woeful breakfast partaken of in the early hours of the funeral morning with the curtains drawn across the dining-room windows and the candles in the massive silver sconces shedding an unnatural light upon the table laden with edibles. The guests who partook of this meal were men of varied and interesting types, but whatever their characteristic differences, it was remarkable that the same air of responsibility and solemnity inspired them all. It did not matter that many of them had been personal enemies of the dead man, that many with that jealous distrust of unconventionality that reigns in Ireland had markedly drawn away from him in the last ten years of his life. Death had obliterated everything. Ashland's eccentricities, his lawlessness, his contempt for the little world in which he lived, were all forgotten. He was one of themselves, deserving in death at least the same consideration that the county had bestowed upon his father, his grandfather, and those who had gone before them. The faces of these men were unfamiliar to Millbank, though each one on entering the dining-room shook him cordially and sympathetically by the hand. The meal was partaken of almost in silence and it was with obvious relief that, one after another, the members of the party rose from table and passed into the darkened hall, and from thence to the sweep of gravel drive that fronted the house, where the less privileged of those who had come to do Ashland honour lounged singly or in groups. The funeral was timed to start at nine, but the concourse of mourners, well accustomed to the delays inevitable on such an occasion, evinced no sign of impatience when half-past nine and then ten arrived, and no move had yet been made. But all things come to those who understand the art of patience. At a quarter past ten a thrill galvanized the lethargic crowd, and with the recognition of the great moment for which they waited the men began to jostle each other and push forward towards the house while all hats were respectively removed. A faint murmur of admiration and awe went up from the gathering as the great brass-bound coffin was borne solemnly through the door and laid upon the open bier. In silence Millbank and young Lawrence Ashland took their places as chief mourners, and with the inevitable confusion and uncertainty of such a moment the crowd of men and vehicles formed up behind them, the horses under the bier moved slowly forward and the body of Dennis Ashland passed for the last time down the avenue and through the gates of Oristown. The funeral over, Millbank walked back from Carrigmore alone. The servants, who had followed their master to his resting-place in the old graveyard, had remained in the village to enjoy the importance that the occasion lent them. 
young Ashland had disappeared at the conclusion of the burial service, while the daughters and sister-in-law of the dead man, in accordance with the custom of the country, had remained secluded in their own rooms at Oristown, appearing neither at the breakfast nor the funeral. In a house of death the hours that succeed the burial are, if possible, even more melancholy than those that preceded. The sensations of awe and responsibility have been dispersed, but as yet it is impossible to resume the commonplace routine of life. As Millbank passed through the gateway and walked up the drive, ploughed into new furrows by the long procession of cars that had followed the coffin, he was deeply sensitive to this impression, and it fell upon him afresh with a chill of desolation as he entered the door, still standing open, and moved slowly across the deserted hall. In the dining-room the curtains had been drawn back and the candles extinguished, but the daylight seemed to fall tardily and unnaturally upon the room after its three days' exclusion. He stood for a moment looking at the debris of the breakfast that had not yet been removed, at the disarray of chairs that had been hurriedly vacated. Then, with a fresh and poignant sense of loss and loneliness, he turned hastily and walked out of the room. In the hall he attempted to put afresh, but the sound of muffled sobbing from the upper portion of the house sent him incontinently forth into the open. With an overwhelming desire for human fellowship, for any companionship in this abode of desolation, he passed without consideration of his dignity round the corner of the house in the direction of the stable-yard. He walked calmly, but there was a pucker of anxiety on his usually placid brow, an expression of concern apart from actual sorrow in his tightly set lips. To the most casual observer it would have been obvious that something weighed upon his mind. Still moving with his habitual precision, he entered the yard by the arched gateway, picking his way between the scattered array of rubbish, food, and implements that encumbered the ground. When he appeared a dozen rough or glossy heads were thrust out of the kennels or outhouses as the dogs accorded him a noisy welcome. But paying only partial heed to their demonstrations, he passed on to the vast coach-house with a vague hope that some laborer connected with the farm or stables might possibly have been left behind in the general exodus. But here again he was doomed to disappointment. The coach-house, with its walls festooned with rotting harness, its ghostly row of cumbersome antiquated vehicles, was as empty of human presence as the yard itself. Conscious of the isolation that hung over the place, disproportionately aware of his own aimlessness, he stood uncertain in what direction to turn. For the moment the household had no need of him. There were no legal formalities to succeed the funeral, Ashland having left no will, and of personal duties he had none to claim his attention. He stood by the coach-house door woefully undecided as to his next move when all at once relief came to him from the most unexpected quarter of the outbuildings. One of the dairy windows was opened sharply and a head was thrust through the aperture. "'Wisha, what is it you're doing there, sir?' a voice demanded kindly. "'Sure that old yard is no fit place for you.' Turning hastily, Millbank saw the broad, plain face of Hannah her small eyes red, her rough cheeks stained with weeping. "'Why, Hannah!' he exclaimed. "'What are you doing here? I thought you were at the funeral.' Hannah passed the back of her hand across her eyes. "'Wish ya! What would I be doing at it?' she demanded huskily. "'Sure I don't know what they do be seeing in funerals at all.' Millbank glanced up with interest, recognizing the originality of the remark. "'Why, you and I are of the same opinion,' he said. The Celtic delight in the obsequies of a friend has been puzzling me for the last three days. Then he paused, suddenly conscious of Hannah's fixed regard. That is, he substituted quickly, that is, I have been wondering, like you, what they see in it. Hannah's small, observant eyes did not waver in their scrutiny. You've been wondering about something, sure enough, she said. I seen it meself every time I'd be carrying in the dinner and doing a turn for the poor corpse. "'God be good to him this holy and blessed day!' Again she wiped her eyes. "'But tisn't wonderin' alone that's at you,' she added more briskly. "'Tis some other thing that's lyin' heavy on your mind, 
I seen it meself at every hand's turn. Milbank started. This sympathetic onslaught was as disconcerting as it was unexpected. I, I won't contradict you, Hannah, he said waveringly. No doubt you are right. For the space of a minute Hannah was profoundly silent. Then she broached the subject that had been filling her mind for a day and a half. Wish and now, is it true what they do be telling me? she asked softly and warily. That you're going to be father and mother and all to them two poor children? Again Milbank started almost guiltily. Then the personal anxiety that mingled with and almost dominated his grief for Ashland rose irrepressibly in response to the persuasive tones, the kindly human interest and curiosity. "'Yes, Hannah,' he said quickly. "'Yes, it is my intention to try and fill my poor friend's place.' The tears welled suddenly into Hannah's eyes, and with an awkward movement she wiped her rough hand in her apron and held it out. "'God Almighty will give it back to you, sir,' she exclaimed with impulsive fervor. Strangely touched by the expression of understanding and appreciation, he responded to the gesture and took her hand but instantly she withdrew it. "'Don't be minded an old woman like me, sir,' she said deprecatingly. "'Twas the thought of the children that come over me. I couldn't help it. I had the both of them in me arms before they could cry. Small wonder me heart would be in them. Many's the sad day I put over me thinking what would become of them with the poor master going to the bad. God forgive me for saying it, and sure now tis all said and done for, and the heath of it off our minds.' praise be to god she paused to dry her tears and what would you be thinking to do with them she asked presently in a new and more personal tone milbank did not answer at once his eyes strayed uneasily from one subject in the yard to another while the frown of perplexity that had puckered his brow since ashland's death reappeared more prominently than before at last with a certain expression of puzzled resolution he looked up and met Hannah's attentive gaze. "'To tell you the truth, Hannah,' he said, "'that is the precise question I have been asking myself ever since your poor master died.' There was a wait of some seconds while his listener digested the information. Then she nodded her head with slow impressiveness. "'I seen it meself,' she said again. "'Sure I seen it as plain as daylight. There's something on his mind,' I says to meself and if it isn't the poor master's death, I says, then it's nothing more nor less than the natural feelings of a single gentleman that times himself with two grown daughters. It was characteristic of Milbank that he did not smile. He recognized only one fact in the old servant's words, the fact that the state of affairs over which he had been worrying in lonely perplexity had suddenly been accurately, if roughly, voiced by someone else. He glanced up with quick relief into the round red face framed in the dairy window. Hannah, he said honestly, your surmise was perfectly correct. For the first time a smile broke out over her tear-stained face. I was right, then. Tis the children was troubling you. A sharp gleam of inquiry shot from her eyes. Yes, he said simply. And why now? Again her tone changed the irrepressible undercurrent of native humor, native inquisitiveness, and familiarity welling out unconsciously. Sure they be good children. I do not doubt it. I do not doubt it for one moment. But they're troubling you all the same. Well, yes, yes, I confess they are troubling you. Both of them, she asked innocently. He hesitated. Well, no, he replied artlessly. No, not both of them. Ah, I thought that same. Hannah gave a nod of understanding. Sure, twas to be tormentin' men she was brought into the world for. I said so meself the first day I took her into me arms. But, but I haven't said anything. How do you know that it is? How do I know that it's Miss Clodagh that's bothering you? Sure, how do I know that you're standin' before me? Faith, by the use of me eyesight. Haven't I seen you lookin' at her and ponderin' and lookin' at her again? Milbank's lips tightened, and he drew himself up. "'I should be sorry if any thought I have bestowed on your young mistress,' he began coldly. Then suddenly the intense need of help and sympathetic counsel 
overbalanced dignity. "'Hannah,' he said abruptly, "'I'm in a terribly awkward position, and that is the simple truth. My mind is quite at rest about the younger girl. She is a child, and will be a child for years. A good school is all she needs. But with the other it's different. With Clodagh it's different. Clodagh is no longer a child. Hannah remained discreetly silent. If I had a sister, he went on, or any friend to whom I could entrust her. But I have none. Again Hannah shook her head. Well, then, that's a pity, she murmured. Sure, tis lonesome for a gentleman to be by himself. It is a pity, a great pity. You do not know how it is weighing upon me. Of course there is her aunt. Hannah made an exclamation of horror. Is it Mrs. Lawrence? she cried. Is it tie her to Mrs. Lawrence, you would? Sure, you may as well put her in the grave and be done with it. Milbank's harassed face grew more perplexed. No, he said hurriedly, no. I understand that that arrangement is impossible. I was merely wondering whether there is any other, any more distant relative with whom she might be happy. He looked anxiously into her broad, shrewd face. For a moment the small eyes met his seriously, then, involuntarily, they twinkled. Faith, when I was a young woman, sir, she said slowly, men wasn't so sat on finer relations for a girl like Miss Clodagh unless maybe twas a relation of their own making. Milbank suddenly looked away. "'What, what do you mean?' he asked confusedly. "'Why, that tis an aunt's and cousin that a girl like Miss Clodagh wants, but a good husband.' "'Uh, a husband?' "'Why, then, what else? Instead of troubling yourself and fritting yourself until your heart is scalded out of you, why don't you marry her? That's what I've been asking myself ever since the poor master died.' It's out now, if I'm to be killed for it. She eyed him almost defiantly. But Milbank stood stammering and confused, his eyes fixed nervously on the ground, an unaccustomed flush on his worn cheeks. But, but Hannah, I, I am an old man. His tone was deprecating and meant to be ironic, but unconsciously it had an undernote of question. Unconsciously, as he raised his eyes to his mentor's face, he straightened the shoulders that age and study had combined to bend. "'I am an old man,' he said again. "'Why, why, I am five years older than her father.' Hannah continued to search his face. "'And sure, what harm is that?' she said. "'Wasn't me own poor man as old as me grandfather? And no woman ever buried a finer husband, God rest him.' Milbank's lack of humorous imagination stood him in good stead. "'But she's a child,' he stammered, "'a child.' For answer Hannah leant out of the window until her face was close to his. "'Listen here to me,' she said softly. "'Child or no child, you thought about marrying her before ever I said it, but you'd never risk the courage to do it. You're not like the Ashlands that would tear down the walls of hell if they wanted to be getting at the devil. You'd like somebody to take him by the hand and draw him out nice and easy for you.' There she is in that lonesome house, frettin' her heart and cryin' her eyes out. Why can't you go up and take her before somebody else does? As she came to the last words, her voice dropped. Her loyalty to her dead master, her anxiety to see his child in a place of safety, poured from her in crude eloquence. To her primitive mind, Milbank appeared as the ideal husband, a man of dependable years, of wealth, of good social position, and all her affections, all her energies yearned to make the marriage. She could not have framed the fear that possessed her, but her instinct, her acute native intuition, warned her unanswerably that the daughter of Dennis Ashland would need protection, and would need it before long. With an impulsive gesture she stretched out her hand, and touching Milbank's shoulder, pushed him gently forward into the yard. "'Go on, sir,' she urged softly. "'Go on up and take her before somebody else does.'" End of Chapter 5 Chapter 6 It may be surmised without fear of misconception that never during the smooth course of his uneventful existence had Milbank been so rudely shaken into self-comprehension as by Hannah's unlooked-for onslaught. Left to the placid guidance of unaided instinct, 
it is almost certain that he would have left Orrestown whenever the hour of departure arrived, innocently unconscious that any parting pangs could be attributed to a personal cause. It is possible that, with the passage of time, he might have acknowledged that somewhere in the inner recesses of his mind there was a shrine where one face, more changeful and alluring than any other he had known, reigned in solitary state. But beyond that tardy acknowledgment he would not have dared to venture. Later still, perhaps, if circumstances had compelled him to resign his guardianship over Cloda in favor of some possible husband, it is well within the bounds of reason to conjecture that understanding of his feelings might have come to him when, having said good-bye to the young girl just crossing the threshold of life, he returned to his home, newly and bitterly alive to his age and loneliness. But now, in the light of present events, all such suppositions had become valueless. As if by some powerful outside pressure his eyes had been opened, and he stood dazed and elated before the new road then opened upon his vision. His brain felt light and unsteady, his limbs were imbued with a sensation of unaccustomed buoyancy as he turned, impelled by Hannah's words, and moved across the yard towards the arched gateway. A half-admitted intoxicating sense of imminent action possessed him, and as he walked forward it seemed that he scarcely felt the ground beneath his feet. Almost without volition he passed from the stone-paved courtyard into the sweep of graveled pathway that fronted the house. For the first time in his existence he was conscious of being borne forward on the tide of his emotions, and the knowledge had an exhilarating, unbalanced daring that suggested youth. As though he feared the evaporation of his mood, he made no pause on gaining the pathway, but went straight forward towards the house with a haste and impetuosity very foreign to his formal nature. On his second entry into the hall he paid no heed to the chill desolation of the place, but crossing the intervening space began immediately to mount the stairs. Scarcely had he reached the highest step, however, than he halted incontinently, for as though in direct response to the thoughts that were filling his mind a door on the corridor opened and Clodagh appeared. Seeing him she too paused, and in the moment of mutual hesitation he had opportunity to study her. In her new black dress she looked slighter and more immature than he had expected, and the pathetic effect of her appearance was enhanced by the paleness of her face and the heavy purple shadows that sleeplessness and tears had traced below her eyes. As the impression obtruded itself upon him his own nervous excitement dropped from him suddenly. "'My poor child,' he said involuntarily. At the words and the tone she turned to him impulsively. "'Oh, Mr. Milbank,' she began. Then her loneliness, her sense of bereavement and desolation inundated her mind. With a short sob she moved abruptly away, and turning her face to the wall broke into a passion of tears. The action was the action of a child, and without hesitation Milbank responded to it. Stepping across the corridor, he put his arm about her shoulder and drew her gently towards the stairs. Come, he said soothingly, come. The house is quite quiet, and you are badly in want of a little daylight and fresh air. Come, let me take you out. Clodagh sobbed on, but she suffered herself to be led down the stairs and across the hall towards the open door. There, however, she paused, newly arrested by her grief. Oh, Mr. Milbank, she cried, I can't believe it. I can't believe that we'll never see him again. Poor father! Oh, poor father! But Milbank was equal to the situation. You must be brave, he said kindly. You must remember that he would like you to be brave. The words were an inspiration. With marvelous efficacy they checked the torrent of Clodagh's tears. For a moment she stood looking at him in a dazed, uncertain way. Then she lifted her head in a pathetic attempt at decisive action. "'You are right,' she said unevenly. "'He would like to know that I was brave.' The declaration seemed to cost her an immense effort, for instantly it was made she turned away from Milbank, freeing herself from his detaining arm, 
and as though fearing to trust herself to any further onrush of emotion she stepped through the open door and walked quickly forward to where the gravel drive merged into the long and narrow glen in which the Orristown woods met the sea. Down the wide track leading to this glen she walked, with head rigidly erect and resolutely set lips, while Millbank followed. Now that the immediate need for his protection had been removed, his mind involuntarily reverted to his earlier and more tumultuous thoughts. With a strange half-timid excitement he acknowledged the personal element in his surroundings, and exulted with a certain tremulous joy in the keen air that blew inland from the sea, in the pleasant earthy smell of the moss that clothed the rough stones of the boundary wall skirting the path, in the promise of spring suggested by the hardy green of the wild violet plants clustering at the roots of the beech trees. And with his eyes fixed upon Clodagh's slim black figure, he walked forward in the vaguely intoxicating dream. For the full course of the path she went on steadily, but reaching the glen she paused, and there, as if by a prearrangement of destiny, Millbank overtook her. With a quiet, unostentatious movement he stepped to her side and stood looking upon the scene that spread before them. The view was not imposing, but it was beautiful with the brooding solemn beauty that emanates from Ireland. Upon one hand the sea stretched away green, invincible, and cold as it so often looks in early spring. Upon the other the woods lay a mass of leafless interlacing boughs that formed a clean brown silhouette against the grey sky, while directly in front the first undulation of the rugged Orristown cliffs stood up, an impregnable rampart against the outer world. For a long silent moment Clodagh surveyed the picture. Then, with one of the impulsive, unstudied gestures that were so characteristic of her, she looked round, and for the first time since they had left the house her eyes rested on Millbank's face. "'You are very kind to me,' she said suddenly. "'Why are you so kind?' The words, spoken with complete ingenuousness, came at a singularly appropriate moment. To Millbank, nervously conscious of his own emotions, they seemed inspired. With a quick unsteady gesture he wheeled round, and putting out his hand, caught hers. It, it is easy to be kind to some people, he said almost inarticulately. Clodagh looked at him in some surprise, but it did not occur to her to withdraw her hand. She stood perfectly calm and unembarrassed, and presently, as he made no attempt at further speech, her glance wandered back to the cool stretch of green water. "'Yes,' she said slowly, "'I suppose it is easy to be nice to some people, but not to selfish people like me.' At her words Milbank's hand tightened abruptly. "'You must not say that,' he murmured. "'I have never seen any faults in your character. And even, even if I had,' his voice quickened confusedly, "'even if I had seen them, you would still be the—the the child of my oldest friend. He spoke disjointedly and agitatedly, but at his words Clodagh turned to him afresh with a grateful, impulsive movement. "'Ah, then I understand,' she said warmly. "'You are very kind. You are very good.' At her movement and her tone a mental giddiness seized upon Milbank. A flush rose to his temples. "'Clodagh,' he said suddenly, "'let me be kind to you always. Let let me marry you and be kind to you always. The appeal came forth with volcanic suddenness. He had not meant to be precipitate. It was entirely alien to his slow methodical nature to plunge headlong into any situation. But the occasion was unprecedented. Circumstances overwhelmed him. For a long space he stood as if transfixed, his eyes straining to catch the expression on Clodagh's face his pale, ascetic features puckered with anxiety. The pause was long, preternaturally long. Clodagh stood as motionless as he, her hand still resting passive in his clasp, her clear eyes staring into his in stupefied amazement. It was plainly evident that no realization of the declaration just made had penetrated her understanding. To her mind 
unattuned even vaguely to the idea of love and temporarily numbed by her grief the thought that her father's friend could consider her in any light but that of a child was too preposterous too unreal to come spontaneously the belief that milbank's extraordinary words but needed some explanatory addition held her attentive and expectant and under this conviction she stood unconscious of his close regard and unembarrassed by the pressure of his hand at last as some shadowy perception of her thoughts obtruded itself upon him he stirred nervously and the flush upon his face deepened Cloda, he said have i made myself plain do you understand that i that i wish to marry you that i want you for my my wife the final word with its intense incongruity cut suddenly through the mist of her bewilderment in a flash of comprehension the meaning of his declaration sprang to her mind her face turned red then pale with a sharp movement she drew away her hand you want to marry me she said in a slow amazed voice before the note of blank undisguised incredulity milbank shrank into himself yes he said hurriedly yes that is my desire i know that perhaps it may may seem incongruous you are very young and i he hesitated with a painful touch of embarrassment at the hesitation clodagh's voice broke forth but i don't want to marry she cried i don't want to marry any one there was a sharp half-frightened note audible in her voice for the moment her whole attitude was that of the inexperienced being who clings instinctively to the rock of present things and obstinately refuses to be cast into the sea of future possibilities for the moment she was blind to the instrument that was forcing her towards those possibilities to her immature mind it was the choice between the known and the unknown then suddenly and accidentally her eyes came back to milbank's face and the personal element in the choice assailed her abruptly oh i couldn't she cried involuntarily i couldn't i couldn't she did not intend to hurt him but cruelty is the prerogative of the young and she failed to see that he winced before the decisive honesty of her words am i so so very distasteful he asked in a low unsteady voice she looked at him in silence it was the inevitable clash of youth and age she was warm-hearted she was capable of generous action but before all else she was young the triumphant inheritor of the ages life stretched before her while it lay behind him she looked at him and as she looked a wave of revolt a strong sudden sense of her individual right to happiness surged through her oh i couldn't she cried again i couldn't and before milbank could reply before he had time to comprehend the purport of her words she had turned and fled in the direction of the house leaving him standing as he was dazed and petrified upward along the path clodagh ran her impulse towards flight had been childish and her thoughts as she sped forward were as unreasonable and confused as a child's she was vaguely blindly filled with the desire to escape from she knew not what to evade she knew not what her one clear thought was that the prop upon which she had leaned in these days of sorrow and despair had unaccountably and suddenly been withdrawn and that she stood woefully alone and unprotected on she ran until the archway of the courtyard broke into view then without a moment's hesitation she swerved to the left sped across the yard and burst unceremoniously into the kitchen in the kitchen hannah was busying herself over the fire that in the confusion of the morning's event had been suffered to die down at the tempestuous opening of the door she turned sharply round and for a second stood staring at the disturbed face of her young mistress then with the intuitive tact of her race she suddenly opened her ample arms and with a sob clodagh rushed towards her for a long moment hannah held her as if she had been a baby patting her shoulder and smoothing her ruffled hair while she cried out her grief and bewilderment at last with a slow sobbing breath she raised her head oh hannah i want father she said i want father 
Hannah drew her closer to her broad shoulder. "'Wist now,' she murmured tenderly, "'wist now. Sure he's better off. Sure he's better off.' But Clodagh's mind was too agitated to take comfort. With a change of mental attitude she altered her physical position, freeing herself abruptly from Hannah's embrace. "'Hannah!' she cried suddenly. "'Mr. Milbank wants me to marry him, and I won't. I can't. I won't.' Hannah's eyes narrowed sharply, but whatever her emotion she checked it and bent over her charge with another caress. "'Sure you won't, of course, my lamb. Who'd be asking you? No one. Then why would you be fretting yourself? I'm not fretting myself. Only—' "'Only what? Only—oh, nothing, nothing!' With a distressed movement Clodagh pushed back her hair from her forehead. Then she turned to the old servant afresh. Hannah, she demanded, why does he want to marry me? Why does he want to? Hannah was silent for a space. Then her shrewd, ugly face puckered into an expression of profound wisdom. Men are queer, she said oracularly. The older, the queerer. Maybe he's thinking of himself in the matter. But maybe, her voice dropped impressively, maybe, Miss Clodagh, tis the way he's thinking of you. She paused with deep significance. The effort after effect was not wasted. Clodagh looked up sharply. "'What do you mean?' she asked. "'Mane!' Hannah turned away, and picking up a poker began softly to rake the ashes from the fire. "'Sure, what would I be maining?' "'But you do mean something. What is it?' Hannah went on with her task. Clodagh stamped her foot. "'Hannah, what is it? Nothing sure, nothing at all. I'm only saying what queer notions men takes. But you mean something else. What is it? Hannah stolidly continued to rake out the remnants of the fire. I know nothing, she said obstinately. Ask Mrs. Lawrence. But you do. I know by your voice. What is it? An alert, unconscious note of apprehension had crept into Clodagh's tone. Her lips suddenly tightened. Her eyes became wide. "'What is it, Hannah?' she exclaimed. "'What's the reason he wants to marry me?' "'Sure no reason at all.' "'Oh!' Clodagh made a gesture of anger and disgust. Then she made a fresh appeal. "'Hannah, please!' But Hannah went on with her work. Years of shrewd observation had taught her the power of silence. "'Then you won't tell me?' There was no response. "'Hannah!' At last the old servant turned, as though pressed beyond endurance. Well, she said with seeming reluctance, maybe he'd be thinking twould be easier for one of the Ashlands to be drawn out of her husband's pocket than to be. But Clodagh interrupted. She turned suddenly, her cheeks burning, her eyes ablaze. Hannah! she cried in sharp, pained alarm. But Hannah had had her say. With her old, imperturbable gesture, she turned once more to her task. I know nothing, she murmured obstinately. If you're wanting more, ask Mrs. Lawrence. For a while Clodagh stood, transfixed by the idea presented to her mind. Then, action and uncertainty becoming suddenly indispensable, she turned on her heel. Very well, she said tersely, very well. I will ask Aunt Fan. And, with as scant ceremony as she had entered it, she swept out of the kitchen. As the door banged, Hannah glanced over her shoulder, her red face brimming with tenderness. "'Wisha, tis all for the best,' she murmured aloud. "'Tis all for the best. But God forgive me for hurting a hair of her head.' With feet that scarcely felt the ground beneath them, Clodagh sped along the stone passages that led to the hall and from thence ascended to the bedrooms. Her senses were acutely alive, her mind alert with an unbearable apprehension a new dread that, by the power of intuition, had almost become a certainty, impelled her forward without the conscious action of her will. Without any hesitancy or indecision she traversed the long corridor and, pausing before the room occupied by her aunt, knocked peremptorily upon the door. After a moment's wait Mrs. Ashland's querulous voice was raised in response. "'Well?' she asked. "'What is it? Who's there?' "'Clodagh.' There was an audible sigh, and the usual, "'Come in!' followed somewhat tardily. Clodagh instantly turned the handle and opened the door. 
In this room the blinds had not yet been drawn up, and only a yellowish light filtered in from outside. In the grate a fire burned unevenly, and close beside sat Mrs. Ashland, a cup of tea in her hand, a black woolen shawl wrapped about her shoulders. As her niece entered she glanced round irritably, drawing the wrap more closely round her. "'Shut the door, Clodagh,' she said. "'I hate these big drafty houses.' Clodagh obeyed in silence, then, walking deliberately across the room, paused by her aunt's chair. Her face was still burning, her heart was beating unpleasantly fast. "'And Fran,' she said, "'I want to ask you something. Why should Mr. Milbank bother about me, about us?' Mrs. Ashland, startled by the suddenness of the unlooked-for attack, turned in her seat and peered through the yellow twilight into her niece's excited face. "'What on earth is the matter with you, child?' she demanded. "'Nothing, but I want to know.' Mrs. Ashland made a gesture tantamount to shrugging her shoulders. "'It is quite natural that Mr. Milbank should be interested in you. He was your father's oldest friend.' "'Yes, yes,' Clodagh bent forward uncontrollably. "'And, and, Fan, has father died poor? Has he left us debts? That's what I want to know.' Mrs. Ashland moved nervously in her chair. "'My dear child,' she began weakly, "'has he? Oh, and, Fan, has he left debts?' Mrs. Ashland was taken at a disadvantage. "'Well,' she stammered, "'well, he has left debts?' "'Well, yes, if you must know, he has.' Clodagh caught her breath. "'Of course, as I often said,' Mrs. Ashland continued, "'poor Dennis was a terribly improvident man.' But Clodagh checked her. "'Don't,' she said faintly. "'I could bear it just to-day. Are the debts big?' "'Immense.' Mrs. Ashland made the reply sharply. She was not an ill-natured woman, but her sense of dignity had been hurt. As the word was spoken, Clodagh swayed a little. The black cloud of vague liabilities that hangs over so many Irish houses had suddenly descended upon her. In the consequent shock it seemed that the ground rocked under her feet. After a moment she steadied herself. "'Must the place go?' she asked in an intensely quiet voice. "'Yes, at least.' "'What? It would have had to go only—only for what?' In her keen anxiety Clodagh stepped forward and laid her hand on her aunt's shoulder. "'Only for what, Aunt Fan?' Shaken and unnerved at the interrogation, Mrs. Ashland sat up with a start. "'Why do you do that, Clodagh?' she cried. "'Why do you do that? You gave me a palpitation of the heart.' But Clodagh's eyes still burned with inquiry. "'Why won't the place have to go?' she demanded. "'How will the debts be paid?' Mrs. Ashland freed herself nervously from her niece's hand. "'Mr. Milbank will pay them,' she said impulsively. Then instantly she checked herself. "'Oh, what have I said?' she exclaimed. "'Don't pretend that I told you, Clodagh. He is so particular that you shouldn't know.' But Clodagh scarcely heard. Her hand had dropped to her side, and she stood staring blankly at her aunt. "'You mean to say that he's going to pay father's debts? Our debts?' "'Yes, he even wants to put the place into good repair.' Poor Dennis seems to have cast a perfect spell over him. Then we'll owe him something we can never possibly repay. Mrs. Ashland drew herself up. Not exactly owe, she corrected. It is an, an act of friendship. The Ashlands have never been indebted to anyone for a favor. Of course, Mr. Milbank is a wealthy man, and it's easy to be generous when you have money. She heaved a sigh but Clodagh stood staring vacantly at the opposite wall. "'It's a debt, all the same,' she said after a long pause. "'I suppose it is what father used to call a debt of honor. She spoke in a slow, mechanical voice. Then, as if moved to action by her train of thought, she turned without waiting for her aunt's comment and walked out of the room. Traversing the corridor, she descended the stairs and passed straight to the hall door. Once in the open she wheeled to the right with a steady deliberate movement and began slowly to retrace the steps she had taken nearly half an hour earlier. Steadily and unemotionally she went forward skirting the courtyard until at the dip of the path 
the glen came into view, and with it Milbank's precise black figure standing exactly as she had seen it last. The fact caused her no surprise. That he should still be there seemed the natural, the anticipated thing. And without any pause, any moment of hesitation or delay, she moved directly towards him. As she reached his side her cheeks were hot, her heart was still beating unevenly, and, absorbed by her own emotion, she failed to see the dejected droop of his shoulders, the slight pathetic suggestion of his age in his bent back. Her footsteps were scarcely audible on the damp earth, and she was close beside him before he became conscious of her presence. As he did so, however, he started violently, and the blood rushed incontinently over his forehead and cheeks. Clodagh, he stammered. But Clodagh checked him, laying her hand quickly on his arm. "'Mr. Milbank,' she said hurriedly, "'will you forgive me for what I said? I want to take it back. I want to say that, if you still like, I—I I will marry you.'" End of chapter 6 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Part two, chapter seven of the Gambler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Gambler by Catherine Cecil Thurston. Chapter seven. And thus it came about that Clodaw Ashland entered upon a new phase of that precarious condition that we call life. The impulse that had induced her to accept Milbank's proposal was in no way complex. The knowledge had suddenly been conveyed to her that, through no act of her own, she had been placed under a deep obligation, and her primary, her inherited instinct, had been to pay her debt as speedily and as fully as lay within her power, ignoring in her lack of worldly wisdom the fact that such a bargain must of necessity possess obligations other than personal which would demand subsequent settlement. However unversed she may be in the world's ways, it is scarcely to be supposed that any young girl, under normal conditions, can look upon her own marriage as an abstract thing. But the circumstances of Clodagh's case were essentially abnormal. Milbank's proposal, and the facts that brought her to accept it came at a time when her mind and her emotions were numbed by her first poignant encounter with death and grief, and for the time being her outlook upon existence was clouded. The present seemed something somber, desolate, and impalpable, the future something absolutely void. For two days after the scene in the glen she and Milbank avoided all allusion to what had taken place between them. He appeared possessed by an insurmountable nervous reticence, while she, immersed in her trouble, seemed almost to have forgotten what had occurred. On the evening of the third day, however, the subject was again broached. Milbank was sitting by one of the long dining-room tables, reading by the faint twilight that filtered in from the fast-darkening sky. The light in the room was fitful, for though the table was already laid for dinner, the candles had not yet been lighted. With his book held close to his eyes he had been reading studiously for close upon an hour, when the quick opening of the door behind him caused him to look round. As he did so he closed his book somewhat hastily and rose with a slight gesture of embarrassment, for the disturber of his peace was Clodagh. But it was not so much the fact of her entry that startled him as the fact that, for the first time since her father's death, she was arrayed in her riding habit. Shaken out of his calm, he turned to her at once. "'Are you are you going for a ride?' he asked in unconcealed surprise. Clodagh nodded. She was drawing on her thick chamois gloves, and her riding crop was held under her arm. Had the light in the room been stronger, he would have seen that her lips were firmly set and her eyes bright with resolution. But his mind was absorbed by his surprise. But is it not rather late? he hazarded anxiously, with a glance towards the window. She looked up, astonished. Late? she repeated incredulously. Then, 
the look of faintly contemptuous tolerance that sometimes touched her with regard to him passed over her face oh no not at all she explained i'm used to riding in the evening you see holly must be exercised and i'd rather it was dark the first time i rode after her voice faltered milbank heard the tremor and as once before his sense of personal timidity fled before his spontaneous pity clodagh he said suddenly allow me to ride with you i was a fairly good horseman in in my day there was pathos in the deprecating justification but clodagh's attention was caught by the words alone you she said in blank amazement then something in the crudeness of her tone struck upon her and she made haste to amend her exclamation of course it's very very kind of you she added awkwardly at her lowered tone milbank colored and took a step forward clodagh he began with a flash of courage i think you might allow me to be more kind to you than you do i think i might give you more protection and it has occurred to me that perhaps we ought to announce our our engagement he halted nervously as soon as he had begun to speak clodagh had walked away from him across the room and now she stood by the mantelpiece looking down steadily into the fire do you agree with me he asked moving nervously towards her there was an embarrassed silence and in his perturbation he glanced from her bent head to the picture above the chimney-piece from which Anthony Ashland's ardent face showed out a vague patch of color against its black background. Clodagh, he said suddenly, allow me to tell Mrs. Ashland that you have promised to marry me. But Clodagh did not answer. Still she stood gazing enigmatically into the burning logs, her slight figure and warm youthful face fitfully lighted by the capricious spurting flames. Clodagh, he exclaimed and there was a note of uneasiness in his low deprecating voice then at last she turned and their eyes met very well she said quietly you may tell aunt fan but if you don't mind i'll ride by myself that night at the conclusion of dinner the engagement was announced all the members of the ashland family were seated round the table when milbank who had practically eaten nothing during the meal summoned his wavering courage and leaned across the table towards Mrs. Ashland, who was sitting at his right hand. "'Mrs. Ashland,' he began almost inaudibly, "'I, that is, Clodagh and I,' he glanced timidly to where Clodagh sat erect and immovable at the head of the table, "'Clodagh and I have, have an announcement to make. We, that is, I,' he stammered hopelessly, "'Mrs. Ashland,' clodagh has made me very very proud and very happy she has consented to to be my wife he took a deep agitated breath of wordless relief that the confession was made there was a long pause then suddenly mrs ashland extended both hands toward him in an hysterical outburst of feeling my dear dear mr milbank she said what a shock what a surprise i should say what would my poor brother-in-law have thought but providence ordains everything i'm sure i congratulate you congratulate you both she turned to clodagh though of course it is not the time for congratulations she hastily drew out her handkerchief as she did so little nance rose slowly from table and slipped unobserved from the room at milbank's words the child's face had turned terribly white and she had cast an appealing incredulous look at clodagh but Clodagh, in her self-imposed stolidity, had seen nothing of the expressions round her, and now, as her sister left her place and crossed the room, the significance of the action went unnoticed. For a moment the only sound audible in the room was the crackling of the fire and Mrs. Ashland's muffled weeping, but at last Milbank, agonized into action, put out his hand and touched her arm. "'Please do not give way to your feelings, Mrs. Ashland,' he urged think think of clodagh thus appealed to mrs ashland wiped away the half dozen tears that had trickled down her cheek you must forgive me she murmured we irish take things too much to heart it it brought my own engagement back to me and of course my poor lawrence's death i hope indeed that it will be a very long time before clodagh 
but the words were broken by a clatter from the other side of the table, as young Lawrence Ashland opportunely knocked one wine-glass against another, and in the moment of interruption Clodagh pushed back her chair and stood up. "'If you don't mind, Anne Fan,' she said, "'I think I'll go to bed. The, the ride has tired me. Good night.' And without a glance at any one she walked out of the room. But she had scarcely crossed the hall when a step behind her caused her to pause, and looking back she saw the figure of her cousin a pace or two in the rear. In the half-light of the place the two confronted each other, and Clodagh lifted her head in a movement that was common to them both. "'What do you want?' she asked. Ashland stepped forward. "'Tisn't true, Clo,' he asked breathlessly. Clodagh looked at him defiantly and nodded. Yes, she said, tis true. For a moment he stared at her incredulously. Then his incredulity drove him to speech. But Clo, he cried, he's sixty, if he's a day, and you. Clodagh flushed. Stop, Larry, she said unevenly. Father was nearly sixty. But Ashland's sense of the fitness of things had been aroused. That's all very well, he cried. Uncle Dennis was all right for a father or an uncle. But to marry, Clo, you're mad. Clodagh turned upon him. "'How dare you, Larry!' she cried. "'You are horrible! I hate you!' Her voice caught, and with a sudden passionate gesture she wheeled away from him and began to mount the stairs. The action sobered him. With impetuous remorse he thrust out his hand to detain her. Clo, he said. "'I say, Clo. But she swept his hand aside. "'No, no!' she exclaimed. "'I don't want you! I don't want you! I never want to speak to you again!' you are hateful, detestable. With a swift movement she pushed past his outstretched arm and flew up the stairs. In her bedroom Hannah was hovering about between the washstand and dressing-table, a lighted candle in one hand, a carafe of water in the other. At the sight of her mistress she laid both her burdens down with a cry of delight. "'My darling!' she exclaimed, "'and is it true?' Tim heard the word of it, and he carrying the cheese out of the dining room, but sure I wouldn't believe him. But Clodagh checked her. Don't be a fool, Hannah, she cried almost fiercely, and turning her face from the old servant's scrutinizing eyes, she walked across the room towards the bed. For a moment Hannah stood like an ungainly statue. Then she nodded to herself, a nod of profound and silent wisdom, and tiptoeing out of the room, closed the door behind her. Instantly she was alone, Clodagh began to undress. With hysterical impetuosity she tore off each garment and threw it untidily upon the floor. Then, slipping into bed, she buried her hot face in the pillows and burst into a violent, unreasoning torrent of tears. For ten minutes she cried unceasingly. Then the storm of her misery was checked. The door-handle was very softly turned, and little Nance stole into the room. She entered eagerly, then paused, frightened by the scene before her. But her hesitation was very brief. With a sudden movement of resolution she sped across the space that divided her from the bed and laid a cold, tremulous hand on Clodagh's shoulder. Clo, she said, is it true? Are you going to marry him? Are you going away from here? Her voice sounded thin and far away. Clodagh raised herself on one elbow and looked at her sister. Her face was flushed, her eyes were preternaturally bright. "'Why do you want to know?' she demanded angrily. "'Why is everybody bothering me like this? Can't I do what I like? Can't I marry if I like?' Her voice rose excitedly. Then suddenly she caught sight of Nance's quivering, wistful little face, and her anger melted. With a warm, quick movement she held out her arms. Nance, she cried wildly, little Nance, the only person in the world that I really love. End of chapter seven. Chapter eight. That night Clodagh fell asleep with her wet cheek pressed against her sister's and her arms clasped closely round her. Next morning she woke calmed and soothed by her outburst of the night before and after breakfast she was able to enter into the primary discussion concerning her marriage without any show of emotion. The conclave at which she, her aunt, and Millbank alone were present took place in the drawing-room, 
and was of a weighty and solemn character. The first suggestion was put forward by Mrs. Ashland, who, with the native distaste for all hurried and definite action, pleaded that an engagement of six months at least would be demanded by the conventionalities before a marriage could take place. But here, to the surprise of his listeners, Milbank displayed a fresh gleam of the determination and firmness that had inspired him during the days of sickness and death. With a reasonableness that could not be gainsaid, he refuted and disposed of Mrs. Ashland's arguments, and with a daring born of his new position made the startling proposal that the wedding ceremony should be performed within the shortest possible time, and that to obviate all difficulties Clodagh and he should leave Ireland immediately, journeying to Italy to take up their residence in the villa that he had already rented at Florence for his own use. Immediately the suggestion was made, Mrs. Ashland broke forth in irresistible objection. "'Oh, but what would people say?' she cried. "'Think of what people would say with the funeral scarcely over.' Milbank looked at her gravely. His matter-of-fact mind was as far as ever from comprehending the ramifications of the Irish character. "'But, my dear Mrs. Ashland,' he urged, "'do you think we need really consider whether people talk or not? Surely we who knew and loved poor Dennis.' "'Oh, it isn't that. No one knows better than I do what a friend you have been.' Milbank stirred uncomfortably. "'Please do not speak of it. I, I did no more than any Christian would have done. What I mean to suggest. But again she interrupted. Yes, yes, I know, but we must consider the county, we must consider the county. But here Clodagh, who was standing by the window, turned swiftly round. Why must we? she asked. The county never remembered father till he was dead. If I'm going to be married, it's all the same to me whether it's in three weeks, or three months, or three years. Milbank colored not quite sure whether the declaration was propitious or the reverse. "'Certainly, certainly,' he broke in nervously. "'I think your view is a, a very sensible one.' Mrs. Ashland shook her head in speechless disapproval. "'And what is to become of Nance?' she asked after a moment's pause. Again Milbank glanced uncertainly at Clodagh. "'My idea,' he began deprecatingly, "'was to place the child at a good English school.' but for the first year or two I think that perhaps Clodagh might be allowed to veto any arrangement I may make. Clodagh stepped forward suddenly and impulsively. "'Do you mean that?' she asked. He bent his head gravely. "'Then, then let us take her with us to Florence. T'would make me happier than anything under the sun.' The words were followed by a slightly dismayed pause. Although he strove bravely to conceal the fact, Milbank's face fell and Mrs. Ashland became newly and marketedly shocked. "'My dear Clodagh,' she began sternly, but Milbank put up his hand. "'Pray say nothing, Mrs. Ashland,' he broke in gently. "'Clodagh's wishes are mine.' The blood surged into Clodagh's face in a wake of spontaneous relief. "'You mean that?' she said again. Once more he bent his head. "'Then I'll marry you any time you like,' she said with a sudden impulsive warmth and in due time the day of the marriage dawned. After careful consideration every detail had been arranged and all difficulties smoothed away. The ceremony was to take place in a small unpretentious Protestant church at Carrigmore, where Sunday after Sunday, since the days of her early childhood, Clodagh had listened to the word of God and had sent up her own immature supplications to heaven. The marriage, which of necessity was to be of the most private nature, was fixed for the forenoon, and it had been arranged that immediately upon its conclusion Clodagh, Nance, and Milbank should repair to Mrs. Ashland's cottage, from which, having partaken of lunch, they were to start upon their journey without returning to Oristown. The wedding morning broke gray and mild, presaging a typical Irish day. After a night of broken and restless sleep, Clodagh woke at six, and slipped out of bed without disturbing Nance. For the first moment or two she sat on the side of her bed, her hands locked behind her head, her bare feet resting upon the uncarpeted floor. Then suddenly the sight of the long cardboard box that had arrived from Dublin the day before 
containing the new grey dress in which she was to be married, roused her to the significance of the hour. With a swift movement she rose and crossed the room to the window. The view across the bay was neutral and calm. Over the sea to the east a pale and silvery sun was emerging from a film of mist, while on the water itself a white, almost spiritual radiance lay like a mystic veil. Clodagh took one long comprehensive glance at the familiar scene. Then, as if afraid to trust herself too far, she turned away quickly and began to dress with noiseless haste. Twenty minutes later she crept downstairs, arrayed in her old black riding habit. Where she rode on that morning of her marriage, what strange and speculative thoughts burned in her brain, and what secrets, regretful or anticipatory, she whispered into Polly's sensitive ears, no one ever knew. At half-past eight she re-entered the stable-yard, slipped from the saddle unaided, and threw the mare's bridle to Bert. For a full minute she stood with her gloved hand upon the neck of the animal that had carried her so often and so well. Then, with a sudden, almost furtive movement, she bent forward and pressed her face against the cropped mane. "'Take care of her, Tim,' she said unsteadily. "'Take care of her. I'll come back some day, you know.' And without looking at the old man she turned and walked out of the yard. She met no one on her way to the house but as she passed across the hall she was suddenly arrested by the sight of Millbank descending the stairs, already arrayed in a conventional frock coat. Unconsciously she paused. From the first she had vaguely understood that he would discard his usual serge suit on the day of the wedding, but the actual sight of these unfamiliar clothes came as a shock, bringing home to her the imminence of the great event as nothing else could possibly have done. He looked unusually old, thin, and precise in the stiff, well-cut garments, a circumstance that was unkindly enhanced by the fact that he was palpably and uncontrollably nervous. There was a moment of embarrassed silence. Then, mastering her emotions, Clodagh advanced to the foot of the stairs, holding out her hand. He responded to the gesture with something like gratitude. "'You have been out early,' he said hurriedly. Have you been taking a last look round? Clodagh nodded and turned aside. The pain of her recent farewell still burned in her eyes and throat. He saw and interpreted the action. Don't take it to heart, my dear, he said quickly. You shall return whenever you like, and, and it will be my proud privilege to know that you will always find everything in readiness for you. Clodagh's head drooped. You are very good, she said in a low mechanical voice. For a space Milbank made no response. Then suddenly his fingers tightened nervously over the hand he was still holding. "'Clodagh,' he said anxiously, "'you do not regret anything? You know it is not too late, even now.' Clodagh glanced up, and for one instant a sudden light leapt into her eyes. The next her lashes had drooped again. "'No,' she said, "'I regret nothing.' Milbank's fingers tightened spasmodically. "'God bless you,' he said tremulously, and leaning forward suddenly he pressed his thin lips to her forehead. The hours that followed breakfast and saw the departure from Orristown were too filled with haste and confusion to make any deep impression upon Clodagh's mind. The last frenzied packing of things that had been overlooked, the innumerable farewells, all more or less harassing, the scramble to be dressed, and the entering of the musty old barouche that had done duty upon great occasions in the Ashland family for close upon a half-century, were all hopelessly and mercifully confused. Even the drive to Carrigmore with her aunt and sister filled her with a sense of dazed unreality. She sat very straight and stiff in the new grey dress, one hand clasped tenaciously round Nance's warm fingers, the other holding the cold and unfamiliar ivory prayer-book that had been one of Milbank's gifts. It was only when at last the carriage drew up before the little church, and she passed to the open gateway between two knots of gaping and whispering villagers, that she realized with any vividness the inevitable nature of the moment. As she walked up the narrow path to the church door she turned suddenly to her little sister. Nance she said breathlessly. But the time for speech 
was past. As Nance raised a questioning, excited face to hers, Mrs. Ashland hurried after them across the grass, and together the three entered the church. A moment later Clodagh saw with a faint sense of perturbation that the building was not empty. In a shadowy corner close to the altar rails Millbank was talking in nervous whispers to the rector who was to perform the ceremony. A few minutes later the little party was conducted up the aisle with the usual murmur of voices and rustle of garments, and in what seemed an incredibly, a preposterously short space of time, the service had begun. During the first portion of it Clodagh's eyes never left the brown, clean-shaven, benevolent face of the rector. Try as she might, she could not realize that the serious words pouring forth in the voice that a lifetime had rendered familiar could be meant for her who, until the day of her father's accident, had never personally understood that life held any serious responsibilities. It was only when the first solemn question was put to her, and startled out of her dream, she responded almost inaudibly that her eyes turned upon Millbank standing opposite to her, earnest, agitated, precise. For one second a sense of panic seized her. The next she had blindly extended her left hand in obedience to the rector's injunction, and felt the chill of the new gold ring as it was slipped over her third finger. After that all-important incident it seemed but a moment before the ceremony was over, and the whole party gathered together in the vestry. With a steady hand she signed her name in the register. Then instantly the act was accomplished, she turned instinctively towards the spot where Nance was standing. But before she could reach her sister's side she was intercepted by Mrs. Ashland, who stepped forward, half tearful, half exultant, and embraced her effusively. "'My dear child, my dear, dear child,' she murmured disjointedly, "'may your future be very happy.' Clodagh submitted silently to the embrace. Then, as her aunt reluctantly withdrew into the background, she became conscious of the old rector's kindly presence. Looking closely into her face, he took her hand in both his own. "'God bless you, my child,' he said simply. "'I did not preach you a sermon just now, because I do not think you require one. You are a dutiful child, and I believe that you have found a very worthy husband.' At the word husband Clodagh looked up quickly. Then her eyes dropped to her wedding ring. "'Thank you,' she said almost inaudibly and an instant later Millbank stepped forward deferentially and offered her his arm. In silence they passed down the aisle of the church, in the center of which stood the old stone font at which Clodagh had been christened, and on which she had been wont to fix her eyes during the Sunday service while the rector preached. All at once this inanimate friendly object seemed to take a new and unfamiliar air, seemed to whisper that Clodagh Ashland existed no more and that the stranger who filled her place was an alien. Her fingers tightened nervously on her husband's arm, and her steps involuntarily quickened. Outside, in the calm, gray, misty atmosphere, they lingered for a moment by the church door in order to give Nance and Mrs. Ashland the opportunity of gaining the cottage before them. But both were ill at ease, self-conscious, and acutely anxious to curtail the enforced solitude and it was with a sigh of relief that Clodagh saw Millbank draw out his watch as an indication that they might start. About the gate the little group of curious idlers had been augmented, and as Clodagh stepped to the carriage an irrepressible murmur of admiration passed from lip to lip, succeeded by a cold and critical silence as the bridegroom, well-bred, well-dressed, but obviously and incongruously old, followed in her wake. Clodagh comprehended and construed this chilling silence by the light of her own warm appreciation of things young, strong, and beautiful, and as she stepped hastily into the waiting carriage a flush of something like shame rose hotly to her face. The drive to the cottage scarcely occupied five minutes, and even had they desired it there was no time for conversation. Millbank sat upright and embarrassed. Clodagh lay back in her corner of the roomy barouche, her eyes fixed resolutely upon the window, her fingers tightly clasping the ivory prayer-book. One fact was occupying her mind with a sense of anger and loneliness, 
the fact that her cousin Larry had not been present in the church. Since the night on which her engagement had been announced, the feud between the cousins had continued. During the weeks of preparation for the wedding Larry had avoided Oristown, but though no overtures had been made, Clodagh had never doubted that he would be present at the ceremony itself. And now that the excitement was past, she realized with a shock of surprise that she had been openly and unmistakably deserted. The thought was uppermost in her mind as the carriage stopped, and when her aunt came forward to greet them her first question concerned the absent member of the family. "'Where's Larry, Aunt Fan?' she asked. "'My dear child, that's just what I have been asking myself. But come in, come into the house.' Mrs. Ashland was fluttered by the responsibilities of the moment. "'Why wasn't he in church?' Clodagh asked, as she followed her into the narrow hall. Mrs. Ashland threw out her hands in a gesture of perplexity. "'How can I tell?' she said. "'Boys are incomprehensible things. I'm sure er, James is not old enough to have forgotten that.' She glanced archly over her shoulder. Milbank looked intensely embarrassed, and Clodagh colored. "'Well, we'd better not wait for Larry,' she interposed hastily. "'You know what a time it takes to get round to Muscarie with that big barouche.' Mrs. Ashland became all assiduity. "'Certainly, certainly, my dear child. Mr. Curry and his brother are already waiting. Won't you come in?' With hospitable excitement she marshaled them into the dining-room. The room into which they were ushered, though small, was bright and cheerful and notwithstanding the season there were flowers upon the table and mantelpiece. But even under these favorable conditions the lunch was scarcely a success. Mrs. Ashland was genuine enough in her efforts at entertainment, but the guests were not in a condition to be entertained. Milbank was intensely nervous. Clodagh sat straight and rigid in her chair, uncomfortably conscious of insubordinate emotions that crowded up at every added suggestion of departure even the rector's brother, a bluff and hearty personage who, out of old friendship for the Ashland family, had consented to act as best man at the hurriedly arranged wedding, felt his spirits dance, while little Nance, who sat closer to her sister, made no pretense whatever at hiding the tears that kept welling into her eyes. It was with universal relief that at length they rose from the table and filed out into the hall. There, however, a new interruption awaited them. In the shadow of a doorway they caught sight of Hannah, arrayed in her Sunday bonnet and shawl, and still breathless from the walk from Oristown. At the sight of the little party she came forward with a certain ungainly shyness, but catching a glimpse of Clodagh, love conquered every lesser feeling. "'Let me have one last look at her,' she exclaimed softly. "'That's all I'm wantin'.' and as Clodagh turned impulsively towards her she held out her arms. "'Sure I knew her before any one of ye ever set eyes on her,' she explained, the tears running down her cheeks. "'Go on now, miss. Ma'am,' she added brokenly, pushing Clodagh forward towards the door, and turning to Milbank with an outstretched hand, "'Good-bye, sir, and God bless you.' Her sing-song voice fell, and her hard hand tightened over his. "'Take care of her,' she added, and don't be forgettin' that she's nothin' but a child still for all her fine height and her good looks. She spoke with crude, rough earnestness, but at the last words her feelings overcame her. With another spasmodic pressure she released his fingers and, turning incontinently, disappeared into the back regions of the cottage. For a moment Milbank remained where she had left him, moved and perplexed by her hurried words, then, suddenly remembering his duties, he crossed the hall and punctiliously offered his arm to Clodagh. "'The carriage is waiting,' he said gently. But Clodagh shook her head. "'Please take Nance first, she murmured in a low, constrained voice. He acquiesced silently, and as he moved away from her she turned to Mrs. Ashland. "'Good-bye, Aunt Fan,' she said, "'and tell Larry that I'm—that I'm that I'm sorry. He'll know what it means.' Her carefully controlled voice shook suddenly as pride struggled with affection and association. Suddenly putting her arms around Mrs. Ashland's neck she kissed her thin cheek and turning quickly walked forward to the waiting carriage. There was a moment of excitement, a spasmodic waving of handkerchiefs, the sound of a stifled sob, and the tardy throwing of a slipper. 
Then, with a swish of the long driving whip, the horses bounded forward, and the great lumbering carriage swung down the hill that led to the Muscarie Road. As they bowled through the village street, Clodagh shrank back into her corner, refusing to look her last on the scene that for nearly eighteen years had formed a portion of her life's horizon. The instinctive clinging to familiar things that form so integral a part of the Celtic nature was swelling in her throat and tightening about her heart. She resolutely refused to be conquered by her emotion. But the emotion, stronger for her obstinate suppression of it, threatened to dominate her. For the moment she was unconscious of Milbank, sitting opposite to her, anxious and deprecating, and she dared not permit herself to press the small warm fingers that Nance had insinuated into her own. With a lurch the carriage swept round the curve of the street and emerged onto the Muscarie Road. But scarcely had Burke gathered the reins securely into his hands, scarcely had the horses settled into a swinging trot, then the little party became suddenly aware that a check had been placed upon their progress. There was an exclamation from Burke, a clatter of hoofs as the horses were hastily pulled up, and the barouche came to a halt. With a movement of surprise Clodagh turned to the open window, but on the instant there was a scuffle of paws, the sharp, eager yap of a dog, and something rough and warm thrust itself against her face. "'Mick!' she cried in breathless, incredulous rapture. Then she glanced quickly over the dog's red head to the hands that had lifted him to the carriage window. "'Larry,' she said below her breath. Young Ashland was standing in the middle of the road, red, shy, and excited. "'I want you to take him, Clo,' he said awkwardly, "'for a... for a wedding present.' For one instant Clodagh sat overwhelmed by the suggestion, and next her eyes unconsciously sought Milbank's. "'May I?' she said hesitatingly. It was her first faltering acknowledgment that her actions were no longer quite her own. Milbank started. "'Oh, assuredly,' he said, "'assuredly.' And Clodagh opened the carriage door and took Mick into her arms. For one moment the joy of reunion submerged every other feeling. Then she raised a glowing, grateful face to her cousin. "'Larry,' she began softly. But old Burke leant down from his seat. "'We'll be late for the train,' he announced imperturbably. Again Milbank started nervously. "'Perhaps, Clodagh,' he began. Clodagh bent her head. "'Shut the door, Larry,' she said, "'and—and and you were a darling to think of it.' Ashland closed the door. "'Good-bye, Nance. Good-bye, sir. Good-bye, Clo.' He looked bravely into the carriage, but his face was still preternaturally red. Clodagh turned to him impulsively. "'Larry!' she began again. But the horses started forward, and the boy, lifting his cap, stepped back into the roadway. Clodagh stooped forward, waved her hand unevenly, then dropped back into her seat. While the horses covered a quarter of a mile she sat without movement or speech, but at last, lifting his adoring eyes to her face, Mick ventured to touch her hand with a warm, reminding tongue. The gentle appeal of the action the hundred memories it evoked was instantaneous and supreme. In a sudden irrepressible tide her grief, her uncertainty of the future, her homesickness inundated her soul. With a quick gesture she flung away both pride and restraint, and hiding her face against the dog's rough coat, cried as if she had been a child. End of Part 2 Part 3 Chapter 1 it was nine o'clock on a morning four years after the wedding at Carrickmore. The season was late spring, the scene was Italy, and Florence, the city of tranquillity made manifest, lay at rest under its coverlet of sun and roses. In the soft early light the massed buildings of the town seemed to blend together until, to the dazzled eyes, the Arno looked like a mere ribbon of silver as it wound under its bridges and the splendid proportions of the Duomo became lost in the blue haze that presaged the hot day to come. The scene was vaguely beautiful, viewed from any of the hills that guard the city, but from no point was its soft picturesqueness more remarkable than from the terraces and windows of a villa that nestled in a curve of the narrow winding road between San Domenico and Fiesole. This villa, unlike its neighbors, was long and low in structure, 
and in addition to the stone urns, luxurious flowering plants, and wide painted jealousies common to Italian houses, it boasted other and more individual attractions to be found in a flight of singularly old marble steps that led from one level of its garden to another, and in the unusual magnificence of the cypresses that grew in an imposing semicircle upon the upper terrace. It was under the shade of these sombre trees that a breakfast-table stood, awaiting occupation, on this particular morning at the hour of nine. The table in itself formed a picture, for in the warm shafts of sun that slipped between the cypress trees silver and glass gleamed invitingly, while in their midst an immense Venetian bowl filled with roses made a patch of burning color. Everything was attractive, refined, appetizing and yet, for some undiscernible reason, the inmates of the villa appeared in no haste to enjoy the meal that awaited them. For fully ten minutes after the coffee had been laid upon the table, the Italian manservant stood immovably attentive, his back stiff, his glance resting expectantly upon the veranda. Then his natural interest in the meal caused him to alter his position, and cast a sympathetic eye upon the coffee in imminent danger of growing cold five more minutes passed. He looked again at the villa, sighed and gracefully flicked a fly from the basket of crisp rolls. Then suddenly he stood newly erect and attentive, as his quick ear caught the swish of a skirt and the sound of a light step. A moment later Clodagh emerged upon the sunny terrace, followed by her dog Mick. At any period of existence four years is a span of time to be reckoned with but when four years serves to bridge the gulf between childhood and womanhood, its power is well-nigh limitless. As Clodagh stepped through the long window of her room and came slowly out into the morning light, it would have been a close observer who would at first glance have recognized the unformed girl of four years ago in the graceful, well-dressed woman moving forward through the Italian sunshine. On a second glance or third, one would undoubtedly have seen the traces of the long undeveloped limbs in the tall supple figure, caught a suggestion of the rough luxurious plate in the golden brown hair coiled about the well-shaped head, and have been fascinated by numerous undeniable and haunting suggestions in contour and coloring. But there memory would have hesitated. The Clodagh who had scoured the woods, scrambled over the rocks, and galloped across the lands of Oristown, was no longer visible. Another being, infinitely more distinguished, infinitely more attractive, and yet vaguely deprived of some essential quality, had taken her place. In the four years that had passed since she left Ireland she had, from being a child, become a woman, and below the new beauty that nature had painted upon her face lay an intangible, a poignantly suggested regret for the girlhood that had been denied her. As she stepped out upon the terrace she paused for a moment and her eyes travelled mechanically over Florence, warm, beautiful, inert. Then, with the same uninterested calm, she turned slowly towards the breakfast-table, but there her glance brightened. "'Oh, letters!' she said aloud, and with an impulsive movement she hurried forward, letting her elaborate muslin dress trail unheeded behind her. Scarcely seeing the profound bow with which the manservant greeted her, she picked up the letters and scanned them one by one. Then, as she disappointedly threw the last back upon the table, she half turned in acknowledgment of a measured step that came across the terrace from the direction of the house. At the same moment Mick pricked up his ears and slowly wagged his tail, while the Italian servant bent his body in a fresh salutation. Milbank, for his was the second step that had disturbed the silence, came forward without haste. Reaching the table he took Clodagh's left hand and pressed it. Then he stooped methodically and patted the dog's head. "'Good morning,' he said gravely. "'Are there any letters?' "'Yes, four, and all for you, as usual.' He smiled, unobservant of the slightly tired irritability of Clodagh's tone. "'Ah, indeed,' he said. "'That is pleasant. Is there one from Sicily? Scarpio promised to let me have the latest details of the great work. He took up the four letters and carefully studied the envelopes. As he came to the last, his thin face became animated. "'Ah, this is satisfactory!' he exclaimed. "'I knew he would not fail me. What wonderful, what fascinating work it must be!' 
He tore the envelope open and began to peruse the letter. While he scanned the opening lines Clodagh watched him absently, but as the first page fluttered between his fingers she gave a slight involuntary shrug of the shoulders and moving round the table sank into the seat that the servant drew forward for her. Then, with an uninterested gesture, she poured out two cups of coffee. For a while there was silence save for the turning of the letter in its recipient's hand, the occasional snap of mixed teeth as he attempted to catch a fly, and the thousand impersonal sounds of lazy outdoor life that rose about them. At last Milbank looked up, his face tinged with mild excitement. This discovery is very remarkable, he said. Sicily will obtain a new importance. Clodagh smiled faintly. In the antiquarian's eyes, she said with unconscious irony. There was no bitterness and no impatience in her voice. She spoke as if stating a fact that long familiarity had rendered absolutely barren. Looking back over the four years of her marriage, it seemed to her that her life had been one round of archaeological discoveries all time to take place at the wrong season. She vividly remembered the first of these events, the discovery of some subterranean passages in the neighborhood of Carrara which had taken place two months after her arrival in Italy, while life yet retained something of the dark vague semblance usually associated with a nightmare. Still desperately homesick and unreasonably miserable in her new position, she had eagerly grasped at Milbank's suggestion that they should visit the scene of these excavations. But with this first essay her interest in discoveries had taken permanent flight. The heat had been tremendous, the country parched and unsympathetic, the associations terribly uncongenial. She remembered the first morning when she and Nance, stifling in their black dresses, and by tacit consent stolen away from the party of fellow enthusiasts to which Milbank had attached himself, and climbing to the summit of a low olive-crowned hill had sat tired, silent, and unutterably wretched looking out upon the arid land. But that excursion had been the prelude to a new era. Visits to various antiquities had succeeded each other with dull regularity broken by long, uneventful sojourns in the green seclusion of the villa at Florence. Then the first break had occurred in the companionship of the trio. Nance had been sent home to an English school. Clodagh's acceptance of this fiat had been curiously interesting, as had been her whole attitude towards Milbank and his wishes. From the day on which she recognized that the state of matrimony was something irrevocably serious, she had taken upon herself an attitude of reserved surrender that was difficult to analyze difficult even to superficially understand. By a strangely immature process of deduction she had satisfied herself that marriage was a state of bondage, more or less distasteful as chance decreed, a state in which, by a fundamental law of nature, submission and self-repression were the chief factors necessary upon the woman's side. As sometimes happens when there is a great disparity in years, the wedded state had widened instead of lessening the gulf between Melbank and herself. It had cast a sudden awkward restraint upon the affection and respect that his actions had kindled in her mind, while inspiring no new or ardent feelings to take its place. Ridiculously, and yet naturally, her husband had become an infinitely more distant and unapproachable being than her father's friend had been. And to this new key she had, her force attuned her existence. With a greater number of years, even with a little more worldly experience, she might have made a vastly different business of her life, for at the time of her marriage Milbank had been hovering upon the borderland of that fatuous love in which an old man can lose himself so completely. If in those first months she had permitted any of the ardor, any of the fascination of her nature to shine upon him, she might have led him by a silken thread in whatever direction she pleased. But three factors had precluded this. Her youth, her inexperience, her entire ignorance of artifice. In her primary encounter with the realities of life she had lost her strongest weapon, her frank unswerving fearlessness, and in lieu of this she had, in the moment of first panic, seized upon the nearest substitute and had wrapped herself in an armor of reserve. And on this armor 
the weapons of Milbank's love had been turned aside. There had been no scenes, no harassing disillusionment. But gradually, inevitably, his original attitude with regard to her, his shy reticence, his uncertainty, as in the presence of some incomprehensible quality, had returned. He had slowly but surely withdrawn into himself, turning with a pathetic eagerness to the interest that had previously usurped his thoughts. With the nervous sensitiveness that warred continuously with his matter-of-fact precision, he became uncomfortably conscious of occupying a false position, of having made an indisputable, almost a ridiculous mistake, and he had taken a blind leap towards the quarter in which he believed compensation to lie. While Clodaw, vaguely divining this, vaguely remorseful of what she scarcely knew, had held her own enthusiasms more rigidly in check, schooling herself into acquiescence with every impersonal suggestion that he chose to make. From this had arisen the pursuit of the antique in whatever corner of Europe, and whatever season of the year circumstances might decree. To Clodagh the pilgrimages had seemed unutterably wearisome and unutterably foolish, but there is a great capacity for silent endurance in the Irish nature. Quick-blooded though it may be, it possesses that strong fatalistic instinct that accepts without question the decree of the gods. The spirit of revolt is not lacking in it, but it requires a given atmosphere, a given sequence of events to bring it into activity. At two and twenty Clodaw was weary of her husband, of herself, of her life. But precisely as her father had fretted out his existence in the quiet monotony of Orristown, she had accepted her fate without thought of question. In the second year when they had travelled to England with Nance, Milbank had suggested a visit to Ireland, but this proposal she had declined. The days when every fibre of her being had yearned for her own country were past, and the idea of return had lost its savour. As she sat now sipping her coffee and gazing abstractedly down to where the hot sun glinted on the Arno, it seemed to her that her life, the glorious exuberant state that she had been accustomed to call her life, had drifted incredibly far away, that it lay asleep, if not already dead, in some intangible realm widely beyond her reach. She thought of Nance away at her English school, and unconsciously she envied her. To be fifteen and to be surrounded by young people. Involuntarily she sighed, and Mick, ever acutely sensitive to her change of mood, turned and pressed his cold nose against her knee. Mechanically she put down her hand and pulled one of his soft ears. Then suddenly she raised her head, attracted by an exclamation of impatience in Milbank's usually placid voice. Looking up she saw that he had opened a second letter. "'What is it?' she asked, her momentary curiosity dropping back to indifference. "'Was that last intaglio unauthentic, after all?' Milbank glanced up with an annoyed expression. "'This does not concern the intaglio,' he said. "'This is from Barnard, David Barnard, who acts as my broker, and looks after my business affairs. You have heard me speak of him.' "'Of course, often,' an expression of interest awakened in Clodagh's face. "'Well, this letter is from him, written from Milan. Most tiresome and annoying it's coming at this juncture.' He scanned the letter for the second time. I particularly want to run down into Sicily before Scarpio leaves. And does the letter prevent you? There was interest and a slight hopefulness in the tone of Clodagh's voice. I am very much afraid that it does. But why? He folded the letter carefully and returned it to its envelope, because Bernard is coming to Venice in two days and suggests that I should meet him there. Venice, Clodagh said the word softly. Yes, most tiresome, most annoying but he thinks it an opportunity that should not be lost. I have not had an interview with him since we left Nance at school. He came then to our hotel in London. I do not think you met him. No, but I remember his coming to see you. I remember Nance and I thought he had such a jolly laugh. We heard it from her bedroom, the one that opened off our sitting-room. With the mention of this new subject, trivial though it was, Clodagh's manner had changed. "'But what about Venice?' she asked, after a moment's pause. "'Will you go?' Milbank looked thoughtful. "'Well, I, I, I scarcely know what to say. 
Of course I could refuse on the ground of this business in Sicily, but it is a question of expediency. A few days with Barnard now may save me a journey to London next year. Still, it is very provoking. But Venice, Clodagh suggested, and again her tone was soft. More than any other in Italy, the beautiful city of the Adriatic had appealed to her curiosity and her imagination. With a quick glance her eyes travelled over the sheltered drowsy garden sloping downward terrace below terrace. "'I should love to see Venice,' she said suddenly. "'I always picture it so wide and silent and mysterious.' Milbank looked up from the opening of his third letter. "'Venice is unhealthy,' he said prosaically. For one moment her lip curled. "'Perhaps that is why it appeals to me,' she said with a flash of the old insubordinate spirit. Then suddenly her eyes met her husband's quiet, puzzled gaze, and the passing light died out of her face. With a hasty gesture she lifted her coffee-cup to her lips and set it down empty. "'Come along, Mick,' she said, pushing back her chair and speaking with unconscious sarcasm. "'Come and let us see whether we can find any roses in the garden.'" End of Part 3, Chapter 1 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com Part Three, Chapter Two of The Gambler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Gambler by Catherine Cecil Thurston. Chapter Two. Clodagh's manner was careless, and her gait nonchalant as she rose from table and crossed the terrace, followed by her dog. But inwardly she burned with a newly kindled sense of anticipation. There was no particular reason why the idea of a journey to Venice, for the purpose of seeing a stockbroker, even though that stockbroker was a personal friend of Milbank's, should be so instinct with any promise, yet the idea excited her. With the exception of the journey to England with Nance, it was the first time in four years that her husband had seriously contemplated any move not ostensibly connected with his hobby. And the thought of Venice, the suggestion of encountering any one whose interest lay outside antiquities had power to elate her. As she left the breakfast table her steps unconsciously quickened, and Mick, attentively sensitive to her altered gait, wagged his short tail, gave one sharp incisive bark of question, and looked up at her with eyes inquisitively pricked. She paused and looked down at him. "'Mick, darling,' she whispered, "'imagine Venice at night, the music and the water and the romance, and just think, her voice dropped still lower, just think what it would be to meet someone, anyone at all, who might happen to notice that one's clothes were new and that one's hair was properly done up. She bent down in a sudden impulse of excitement and kissed his upraised head. Then, with a quick laugh at her own impetuosity, she turned and ran down the first flight of time-worn marble steps. That was her private and personal reception of the news. Later, returning with her arms full of the roses that ran riot in the garden, she was able to meet Milbank with a demeanor of dignified calm, and to answer his questions as to whether her boxes could be packed in two days in a voice that was dutifully submissive and unmoved but the two days of preparation were imbued with a secret joy. There was a new and unending delight in selecting the most beautiful of the dresses in her elaborate wardrobe, and in feeling that at last they were to be seen by eyes that would understand their value. For Milbank, while never restraining her craving for costly clothes, had since the day of their marriage been totally unobservant and indifferent as to whether she wore silk or homespun and on the occasions when outside opinions might have been brought to bear upon the matter, namely the moments when the archaeological excursions were undertaken, necessities of season or expediency had invariably limited her supply of garments to the clothes that would not show the dust or the clothes that would keep out the rain. But now the prospect was different. It was still the season in Venice, she would be justified in bringing the best and most attractive clothes she possessed. The thought was exhilarating. Life became a thing of bustle and interest. 
two or three times a day she drove into Florence to make totally unnecessary purchases. She wrote more than one long letter to Nance, and indulged in many a protracted and confidential talk with Mick as they sat together on the edge of the old marble fountain that dripped and dozed in the sun. By a hundred actions, obvious or obscure, she made it plain in those days of preparation that, despite the fact that her childhood lay behind her, and that she had known none of the intermediate pleasures of ordinary girlhood, she was a being whose heart, whose capacity for enjoyment, whose comprehension of life was extraordinarily, even dangerously, young. At last the day dawned upon which they left the villa on the sunny hill, said good-bye to the wide, slow river, the riotous roses, and the slow tolling bells of Florence, and took train for the north. Through the hours of that railway journey Clodagh sat almost silent. To her eager mind, already springing forward towards the enchanted city, there was no need for speech, and the quiet prim husband seated opposite to her made no call upon her imagination. He was essential to the journey, as the padded cushion behind her head or the English books and magazines by her side were essential to it and for this reason he occupied that most fatal of all positions, the position of an accepted, familiar accessory. The early days of their marriage, when in her eyes he had taken in a new and dreaded aspect, were entirely past. With his supersensitiveness and constitutional distrust he had withdrawn somewhat hastily from the position of lover to shelter behind the cloak of his former guardianship, and Clodagh had hailed the courage of attitude with obvious relief. Now as she sat eagerly alert to gain her first glance of Venice she had almost forgotten that those early days had ever existed. For the moment Millbank was a cipher, and she an ardent appreciative individual undergoing a new sensation. Such was her precise mental position when at last the scene for which she waited broke upon her view. Rising straight out of the water, Venice seemed to her ardent eyes even more the product of a visionary world than her dreams had made it. The hour was seven, and from the many spires and domes of the city warm gleams of bronze or gold shot forth at the touch of the setting sun. But the prevailing note of color that gleamed through the mauve twilight was white, the wonderful semi-transparent white of ancient marble backgrounded by sea and sky. The effect made upon Clodagh's mind by this white city wrapped in its evening veil was instantaneous and deep. With the exception of Florence, her knowledge of the beauties of Italy was very limited, and her first glimpse of Florence had been gained under such propitious circumstances that its sheltered loveliness had never appealed to her as it might otherwise have done. Now, however, her condition of mind was tranquil, if not happy, and as the train sped forward she gazed spellbound at this beauty at once so tangible and so unreal. To every traveller it must come with a sense of desecration that this most magical of cities is approached by nothing less prosaic than an ordinary railway terminus, and Clodagh gave a little involuntary gasp of disappointment as the train swerved suddenly, exchanging the glamour of the outer world for a noisy station that might have belonged to any town and as she rose from her seat, arranged her hat, and collected her books, she wondered for one moment whether the vision just hidden from her view was in reality the handiwork of man and not some mirage conjured up by her own imagination. So strong was the feeling that she remained silent as she descended from the train, and waited while Millbank saw to the collecting of the luggage. Then still, without speaking, she followed him down the flight of steps that led to the water. But there, as the station vanished from consideration, and the picturesque crowd of waiting gondolas met her gaze, her pleasure and excitement woke again, and with a quick gesture she laid her hand on her husband's arm. "'Oh, isn't it wonderful?' she said in a hushed voice. Millbank turned to her uncertainly. "'Yes, my dear,' he said absently. "'Yes, but—' he sniffed critically— but do you not detect a distinctly unhealthy odor? Clodagh's hand dropped suddenly and expressively to her side, and she wheeled round with unnecessary haste towards the gondola into which the luggage was being piled. 
but even this jarring incident could not mar the first journey in the stately black boat. Every portion of the way was instinct with its own especial charm. From the wide dignity of the Grand Canal with its ancient palaces, its mysterious stream of silent traffic, its occasional note of modern life, to the fascinating glimpses of narrower waterways where the women of the people with uncovered heads leaned out of their windows to exchange the day's gossip with a neighbor across the water, all was a delight, something engrossing and unique. Clodaw had no desire to speak as they glided forward, and when the hotel steps were reached she suffered herself to be assisted from the gondola scarcely certain whether she was dreaming or awake. Outside the hotel half a dozen visitors were seated upon the small stone terrace, indolently watching the arrival of new guests. But so absorbed was Clodaw in the scene before her that she scarcely observed their presence, and when Milbank, murmuring an excuse, departed to see after their rooms, she turned again towards the canal that she had just left, and leaning over the balustrade of the terrace paused for a moment to study the picture afresh. But as she stood there unconscious of everything but the wonderful noiseless pageant passing ceaselessly through the purple twilight, more than one glance strayed in her own direction, and two at least among the hotel visitors changed their lounging attitudes for the purpose of observing her more closely. The two, both men, were simultaneously and noticeably attracted. The elder, who by his extremely fastidious and studied appearance, might almost have belonged to another and earlier era than our own, was a man of nearly seventy. The younger was his junior by forty-five years. But, so leveling a thing is spontaneous admiration, the expression upon the two faces as they leant suddenly forward were strikingly similar. The old man held a gold rim eyeglass close to his eye. The younger meditatively removed his cigarette from his mouth but at this critical moment of their close observation Milbank reappeared, and moving stiffly across the terrace, touched Clodagh's arm. "'My dear,' he said, "'our rooms are ready. If you will go upstairs I will find Barnard. I will not dress for dinner to-night. It is after seven o'clock.' Clodagh turned, her face glowing with the enthusiasm that filled her mind. "'All right,' she said, "'but I think I'll just change into something cool. It won't take ten minutes.' Without waiting for his assent she turned quickly and walked across the terrace to the vestibule of the hotel. As she passed the two men in the lounge chairs the elder again lifted his eyeglass, while the younger, leaning forward, stared at her with that superb lack of embarrassment or reserve that the young Englishman can at some times assume. "'By Jove!' he said very softly, as the two new arrivals disappeared into the hotel. His companion turned to him with a thin laugh that belied his carefully preserved appearance. "'Attractive, eh?' he said. The other replaced his cigarette in his mouth. "'What nationality is she?' he asked after a moment's pause. "'I'd feel inclined to say Italian myself, but the old father's so uncompromisingly Saxon.' Again the older man laughed, a laugh that expressed unfathomable worldly wisdom. "'Father!' he said satirically. Fathers don't shuffle round their women folk like that. They are husband and wife. Husband and wife, the other smiled. But the older man pursed up his lips. You'll find I'm right, he said. She walked three steps ahead of him to avoid seeing him, and she did it unconsciously. Proof conclusive. The young man laughed. Doesn't carry conviction, uncle, he said. I'll bet you a fiver you're wrong. Will you take me on? His companion smiled languidly. As you like he responded. The young man nodded, then he looked down lazily at his flannel suit. "'I suppose it's time to change,' he said reluctantly. "'Awful bore being conventional abroad.' With another careless nod he lounged off in the direction of the hall. Exactly a quarter of an hour later Clodagh emerged from her bedroom looking fresh and cool in a dress of rose-colored gauze that cut high in the neck and possessing sleeves that reached the wrist was yet light and diaphanous in effect. She opened her door and, mindful of the lateness of the hour, moved quickly out into the corridor. But scarcely had she taken a step in the direction of the stairs than a door exactly opposite to her own was opened with equal haste, and the young Englishman of the terrace appeared before her. Seeing her he halted involuntarily, 
and for a second their eyes met. The glance was momentary, there was not a word spoken, but irresistibly the color rushed into Clodagh's face. It took her but an instant to regain her composure and to pass down the empty corridor with a touch of hauteur. But long after she had gained the stairs her heart was beating with a new excitement. The glance that the stranger had given her had been almost ill-bred in its absolute directness, but ill or well-bred there had been no mistaking the unqualified admiration it conveyed. The personality of the man had escaped her attention. The fact that his hair was dark, his face attractive, and his figure tall, slight, and graceful had made no impression upon her. All she was conscious of, all that set her pulses throbbing, was the suddenly awakened knowledge that, within herself, she possessed some subtle and previously unrealized power that could compel a man's regard. She descended the stairs with a new sensation of elasticity and elation, and at its foot found Millbank awaiting her in conversation with a suave elderly man. As she came within speaking distance the two turned towards her. "'My dear,' Milbank said quickly, "'allow me to introduce Mr. David Barnard. David, this is my—my my wife.' Clodagh looked up curiously and met the florid face, bland smile, and observant eyes of Barnard, a man who for nearly a quarter of a century had managed to prosper in his profession and at the same time to retain a prominent place in fashionable society. As their glances met she held out her hand. "'How do you do?' she said. "'I believe I've been wanting to know you ever since I heard you laugh one day two years ago.' She spoke warmly, impulsively, almost as Dennis Ashland might have spoken. Involuntarily Milbank glanced at her with a species of surprise. In that moment she was neither the frank, fearless child he had first known nor the self-contained unfathomable girl who had since become his daily companion. In the crowded cosmopolitan atmosphere of the hotel she seemed suddenly to display a new individuality. Barnard took her outstretched hand and bowed over it impressively. "'It is very charming of you to say that, Mrs. Milbank,' he murmured, "'but I'm afraid James has told me that you come from Ireland.' Clodal laughed. He'll also tell you that I live quite forty miles from the Blarney Stone. She looked up, her face brimming with animation. Then, suddenly and involuntarily, she colored. The young Englishman of the terrace was coming slowly down the stairs. He descended nonchalantly, and as he reached the hall he deliberately paused in front of the little group. "'Hello, Barney,' he said easily. "'Been playing much bridge this afternoon.' Barnard looked round with his tactfully affable smile. "'Haven't had one rubber,' he said. "'No?' "'No.' There was a pause, a seemingly unnecessary and pointless pause, in which Barnard looked suavely at the newcomer. The newcomer looked at Clodagh, and Clodagh looked fixedly out across the hall. Then at last the older man seemed to realize that something was expected of him. With a gay gesture he metaphorically swept the silence aside. "'Mrs. Milbank,' he said affably, "'will you permit me to present my friend Mr. Valentine Seracol?' End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 Clodagh looked up, coloring afresh, and the young man bowed quickly and eagerly. He belonged to a type new to her but familiar to every social Londoner, the type of young Englishman who, gifted with unusual height and fine possibilities of muscular development, saunters through life, physically and morally, exerting his energy and his strength in one direction only, the eternal, aimless, enervating search after personal pleasure. To be explicit, the Honorable Valentine Seracold was suffering from that most modern of complaints, the lack of surmountable obstacles. The nephew of one of the richest peers in England, he had started life heavily handicapped. A sufficiency of money had rendered work unnecessary, good looks, and a naturally ingratiating manner had precluded the need for mental equipment, while his social position had unfairly protected him from any share in the rough and tumble existence that moulds and hardens a man's character. At fifteen he had been an average healthy public schoolboy, at five and twenty he was a fashionable young aristocrat whose only business in life was the aiding and abetting of his uncle in the absorbing pursuit of killing time. 
he bowed now to Clodagh with the extreme impressiveness that men of his type bestow upon a new and promising introduction. "'Charmed to meet you, Mrs. Milbank,' he said. "'Are you a resident here, or a bird of passage like ourselves?' He indicated Barnard. Clodagh met his intent gaze with a renewed thrill of speculative pleasure. "'My husband and I live at Florence,' she explained. "'We are only here on business, which sounds like a desecration.' Sarah called, continued to watch her. "'Not if you have any share in it,' he said in a low voice. She laughed and blushed. "'I'm afraid you speak from inexperience,' she said. "'To the people who know me I am a very prosaic person.' She looked involuntarily at Milbank. But Milbank's eyes were on the groups of hotel guests already moving towards the dining-room. "'Don't you think we might, might make a move?' he hazarded vaguely. There was a very slight pause, then Sarah called, responded to the suggestion. "'You are quite right,' he said easily. "'I expect my uncle is looking for me. He usually gets fidgety about feeding time. Will you excuse me, Mrs. Milbank? Perhaps later on I shall have the chance of correcting that, that inexperience you accuse me of.' He laughed pleasantly and with a courteous gesture disappeared into the crowd that was fast filing out of the hall. As he disappeared, Clodagh turned towards the dining-room, leaving Milbank and Barnard to follow. But she had scarcely crossed the hall when the latter overtook her. "'Well, Mrs. Milbank,' he said genially, "'what do you think of our young friend? I believe he usually finds favour in ladies' eyes.' She glanced up. "'I think him very charming,' she said candidly. "'Who is he? Do you know him well?' Barnard smiled. "'I have known him since he was a boy at Eton.' He is nephew of the famous Earl of Deerhurst, who, according to rumour, spends three hundred a year on silk socks and bathes every morning in scented milk. Clodagh made an exclamation of disgust. What an abominable person! Again Barnard smiled. Well, I don't quite know, he said tolerantly. Rumour is generally a yard or two in front of reality. Perhaps Deerhurst is rather a mummified old rue. But then, you know, embalming is a clean process, Mrs. Milbank, before as well as after death. I sometimes wonder whether Valentine won't put the family money to even less harmful use if he ever succeeds to the title. He is next in the succession but for one feeble life. Clodagh's eyes opened. Really, she said, I should never have connected him with so much responsibility. Bernard looked down at her. Responsibility, he said. I don't think I should call it responsibility. But what has become of James? He paused and glanced round the fast emptying hall. As he did so, Milbank hurried up, his manner newly interested, his thin face flushed. Who do you think I have just seen, Clodagh? he asked excitedly. Mr. Angelo Toombs, that interesting scientist who joined our party at Pisa last year. Clodagh looked round. What? she said in surprise the big untidy-looking man who had written a book on something terribly unpronounceable? Milbank nodded gravely. Yes, he said, a most interesting and exhaustive work. I shall make a point of congratulating him upon it directly we have finished dinner. And what about me? Bernard eyed him quizzically. You! Oh, you must wait, David. You will understand that a man like Mr. Toombs is not to be met with every day. They were entering the dining-room as Milbank spoke and involuntarily Bernard glanced from the precise formal figure of his friend to the youthful attractive form of his friend's wife. "'And you, Mrs. Milbank,' he asked in an undertone, "'are you an equally great enthusiast? Does the antique appeal very forcibly to you?' As he put the question he was conscious of its irony, but an irrepressible curiosity forced him to utter it. He was still laboring under an intense surprise at Milbank's choice of a wife and the desire to probe the nature of the relationship was strong within him. "'Are you like the man in the Eastern story?' he added. "'Would you barter new lamps for old?' Clodagh was walking in front of him as he put the question, and Milbank was left momentarily behind. For a second she made no reply. Then suddenly she turned and cast a bright glance over her shoulder. "'If you had asked me that question this morning, Mr. Barnard,' she said, I don't believe I could have answered it, but now I can. I would not part with one new bright lamp for a hundred old ones, no matter how rare. Am I a great vandal?" Her eyes were shining with the excitement of the moment, 
and her face looked beautifully and eagerly alive. "'Am I a great vandal?' she repeated softly. There was an instant's pause, then Bernard stepped closer to her side. "'No, Mrs. Milbank,' he said, "'but you are a very unmistakable child of Eve.' The dinner that night was a feast to Clodagh. She sat between Milbank and Bernard, and though the former was silently engrossed in the thought of his coming interview, and for the time being the latter confined his talk to impersonal subjects, she felt as if she had never felt before in the span of her twenty-two years. For the first time she was conscious of being a woman, privileged to receive the homage and the consideration of men. It was a wonderful, a thrilling discovery, all the more thrilling and all the more wonderful because shrouded as yet in a veil of mystery. Dinner was halfway through before Bernard returned to his task of studying her individually. Then he turned to her with his most suavely confidential manner. "'Have you been very gay in Florence this season?' he asked. She looked up quickly. "'Gay?' she repeated. "'Oh, no, I don't think we are ever exactly gay.' He raised his eyebrows. "'Indeed,' he said, "'you surprise me. There used to be quite an amusing English crowd at Florence.' Clodagh colored, feeling vaguely conscious of some want in her social equipment. "'Oh, I didn't mean the other English residents,' she corrected hastily. "'I meant ourselves, James and I.' Barnard's face became profoundly interested. "'But don't you care for society?' he said, his eyes traveling expressively over her pretty dress. Again she colored. "'It isn't that,' she said in a low, quick voice. "'James doesn't care about parties or people.' Barnard's lips parted to express surprise or sympathy, but she finished her sentence hastily. "'And, of course, I like what he likes.' Barnard bent his head. "'Of course,' he said enigmatically, and dropped back into silence. For a time he remained apparently absorbed in his dinner. Then, as Clodagh began to wonder uncomfortably whether she had unwittingly offended him, he turned to her again. "'Mrs. Milbank,' he said softly, would you think me very presumptuous if I were to make a little proposal? Clodagh brightened. Of course not. Say anything you like. You will be here for a week? I, I hope so. She glanced covertly at Milbank. Oh, yes, you will. I shall arrange it. She looked at him quickly. You, she said. How? Never mind how. He smiled reassuringly. You will be here for a week and my proposal is that, while Milbank is settling his business, I should be allowed to introduce you to some English friends of mine who are in Venice just now. It may be presumptuous, but I seem to feel—he hesitated for a moment—I seem to feel that you want to make some new friends, that you want to have a good time. Forgive my being so very blunt. Clodagh sat silent. She felt no resentment at his words, but they vaguely embarrassed her. The new possibility thrilled her, yet insensibly she hesitated before it. "'But ought I to want new friends?' she asked at last in a very low and undecided voice. Bernard laid down the glass that he was lifting to his lips and looked at her quickly. Her freshness charmed while her naivete puzzled him. "'Well, Mrs. Milbank,' he said suddenly, "'suppose we find that out.' And leaning forward he addressed Milbank. "'James,' he said. I have just been making a little suggestion. While you and I are putting our ancient heads together, don't you think Mrs. Milbank ought to study her Venice, local color, atmosphere, all that sort of thing? Milbank turned in his seat. Eh, hey, David? he exclaimed. What's that you say? I was suggesting that Mrs. Milbank should see a little of Venice now that she is here. He indicated the long windows of the dining-room through which the sound of voices and music was already being borne on the purple twilight. Milbank's face became slightly disturbed. "'Of course, of course,' he said vaguely. "'But, but neither of us care much for conventional sightseeing, and then you know my time here is limited. Exactly, exactly what I was saying. Your time is valuable. All the more danger of Mrs. Milbank's hanging heavily on her hands. Now, there are some charming people staying here at present who would only be too delighted to make her visit pleasant. Milbank's expression cleared. Oh, well, he began in a relieved voice. Exactly. Lady Frances Hope is here. You remember Lady Frances who married my cousin Sammy Hope, 
the red-headed little beggar who went into the navy she would be intensely interested in mrs milbank i wish you would let me make them known to each other he smiled suavely thoroughly in his element at the prospect of working a little social scheme milbank looked at clodagh what do you think my dear he asked vaguely clodagh looked down at her plate i don't quite know she murmured barnard leant close to her in a confiding manner quite right mrs milbank he said never trouble to analyze your feelings just give them a free rein. Lady Frances Hope is a most charming woman, always bright, always good-natured, always in the swim, if you understand that very expressive phrase. Clodagh smiled as she helped herself to an ice. During their conversation the dinner had drawn to its close, and here and there people were already rising from table and moving towards the hall or the long windows that opened onto the canal unconsciously her eyes turned in the direction of these open windows through which a flood of light streamed out upon the water bringing into prominence the dark gondolas that flitted perpetually to and fro like great black bats seeing her glance barnard turned to her again shall we charter a gondola he asked it's the thing to do here her eyes sparkled oh how lovely she said then involuntarily her face fell and she looked at her husband but perhaps she began deprecatingly as the word escaped her milbank who had been oblivious of the conversation pushed back his chair and rose from table with a faint exclamation of excitement ah there he is he said his eyes fixed upon a distant corner of the room there he is i must not run the risk of missing him clodagh turned to him eagerly james she began mr bernard says but milbank's mind was elsewhere my dear he said hurriedly you must really excuse me a man like mr angelo toombs is a personage of importance yes but james she paused disconcerted milbank had left the table for quite a minute she sat silent her cheeks burning with a sudden sense of mortification and neglect to a reasoning and experienced mind the incident would have carried no weight at most it would have been offered grounds for a passing amusement but with clodagh the case was different circumstances had never demanded the cultivation of her reason and experience was an asset she was not possessed of to her sensitive youthful susceptibilities the incident could only wear one complexion her husband had obviously and wittingly humiliated her in the presence of his friend she sat with tightened lips staring unseeingly at the table then suddenly and softly someone crossed the room behind her and paused behind her chair. Turning with a little start, she saw the pale, clean-cut features and searching dark eyes of Valentine Serocal. "'Mrs. Milbank,' he said at once in his easy, ingratiating voice, "'if you are not doing anything else this evening, may I place my uncle's gondola at your disposal. Both he and I would be considerably honored if you and your husband—' Clodagh looked up into his face with a quick glance of pleasure and relief. "'Oh, thank you,' she said. "'Thank you so very much. I should love to come, only my husband is—is is busy to-night.' She paused, and in the pause Barnard leaned close to her again with his most friendly and reassuring manner. "'After all, Mrs. Milbank,' he said, "'do you think that need preclude you from the enjoyment? James is perfectly happy.' lord deerhurst's gondola is quite the most comfortable in venice and i'm sure i'm staid enough to play propriety suppose we make a party of four serocal laughed delightedly how splendid he said mrs milbank may i find my uncle and bring him to be introduced he bent forward quickly leaning across milbank's empty chair for one second clodagh sat irresolute then she glanced swiftly from one interested admiring face to the other and again the blood rushed into her face in a wave of self-conscious pleasure. Yes, she said softly, yes, bring your uncle to be introduced. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Sarah called, smiled his acknowledgment of the granted permission, and departed in search of his uncle, while Bernard looked at Clodagh with amused interest. If you can waive your prejudices against the milk baths, Mrs. Milbank, he said, you'll find old Deerhurst quite a delightful person. But, of course, when one is very young, prejudices are adhesive things. 
He finished his coffee meditatively, stealing a glance at her from the corner of his eye. She remained silent for a moment, tentatively fingering her cup. "'Do I seem so very young?' she asked at last, without raising her eyes. At the words he turned and looked at her fully. "'Do you know, Mrs. Milbank,' he said seriously, "'I am literally devoured by a desire to ask you your age. When I saw you come downstairs tonight I felt, pardon the rudeness, like laughing in James' face when he introduced you as his wife. You scarcely looked eighteen, but a little while ago when you spoke of your life at Florence I suddenly felt out in my calculations. Your face, of course, seemed just as fascinatingly young, but from your expression I could have believed you to be twenty-four. And now again, please do be lenient to my impertinence, now again, as you spoke to Sarah called, you look like a child turning the first page in the book of life. Are you an enigma? During the first portion of his speech Clodagh had looked grave, but at his last words she laughed with a touch of constraint. No, she answered, I am nothing half so interesting, and it's four years since I was eighteen, but hadn't I better get my cloak before Mr. Sarah Cold comes back? With another slightly embarrassed laugh she rose, and without waiting for Bernard's escort, walked out of the room. Ten minutes later she descended the stairs, wrapped in a light evening cloak. Her cheeks were still flushed with excitement, and her hazel eyes were dark with anticipation. Yesterday, only yesterday, she had been a mere item in the secluded, unimportant life of the villa at Florence. Now, tonight, three men, each of whom must, in his time, have known superlatively interesting and beautiful women, awaited her pleasure. As she stepped across the hall, Sarah called darted forward to meet her. "'This is very gracious of you,' he murmured. "'I hear it is your first evening in Venice.' She glanced up at him as they moved slowly forward across the hall. "'My very first evening,' she said softly, "'and I so want to enjoy it.' He paused deliberately and looked at her. "'May I take that as permission to make it enjoyable, if I can?' Her lashes drooped in instinctive, native coquetry. "'Aren't you going to introduce your uncle to me?' she said in a lowered voice. He looked at her, mystified and attracted. "'If I knew you better, Mrs. Milbank,' he began. But without replying Clodagh moved away from him across the hall and out onto the terrace. There, transfixed by a new impression, she paused involuntarily. "'Venice is beautiful in the morning and exquisite in the twilight.' but it is at night that the mystery of venice that most subtle of its many charms enwraps and envelops it like a magic web there is nothing in europe to rival the literal tangible romance of venice at night the faint idle infinitely suggestive lap of water against a thousand unseen steps the secret darkness revealed rather than dispersed by the furtive uneven lights shed forth from windows or open doors the throb of music that seems woven into the picture, an inseparable integral part of the enchanted life, all is a wonder and a joy. To Clodagh, with her inherent love of things mystic and beautiful, the scene was curiously impressive. In an ecstasy of appreciation she stood drinking it in, then, suddenly touched with the warm desire of sharing her sensations, she turned to her companion. "'Isn't it wonderful?' she said below her breath. Sarah Kolb looked at her for a moment in puzzled doubt. Then he smiled indulgently. Yes, he said vaguely. Yes, it is rather great. The water and the gondolas and, and all that sort of thing. Her large clear eyes rested on his face, then slowly returned to their scrutiny of the canal. A momentary sense of disappointment had assailed her. She was conscious of a momentary jar but as she stood, silent and uncertain, a burst of low throbbing music broke across the darkness, and at the same moment she became conscious of a large gondola gliding up to the hotel steps. With the excitement of anticipation the cloud passed from her face. Come, she cried, come, I see Mr. Bernard. It was at the head of the flight of stone steps leading to the water that Lord Deerhurst was introduced to her, and in the semi-darkness it struck her that he made a distinctly interesting figure with his black hair worn a shade lower on the forehead than modern fashion permits, 
his pale aristocratic unemotional face his cold penetrating eyes and the somewhat unusual evening clothes that fitted his tall figure closely and by a clever touch of the tailor's art conveyed a suggestion of a period more picturesque than our own she studied him with deep attention and bent her head in gratified acknowledgment of the profound bow with which he marked the introduction a moment later he offered her his hand and himself assisted her to the waiting gondola with a pleasant exciting sense of dignity and importance she passed down the steps and entered the boat noting as she took her seat its costly and elaborate fittings and the somber livery of the two gondoliers then as she leant back against the cushions her eyes passed back interestingly to the three men to whom she owed the night's adventure lord deerhurst came first moving with a certain stiff dignity and appropriated the seat by her side bernard and sarah called followed placing themselves on the two smaller seats that flanked the stern at a moment later she saw the gondoliers swing lithely round into their allotted positions and felt the gondola shoot out swiftly and silently into the dark waters following the custom of the place they headed for the point where the idle and the pleasure-seeking of venice gather nightly to listen to the music and lazily watch the swaying paper lanterns of the musicians gondolas clodagh sat silent as they skimmed onward she was bending slightly forward her whole attitude an unconscious typifying of expectancy her hands were lightly clasped in her lap and again the hazel of her eyes was darkened by their dilated pupils as the gondola slackened speed and the music became nearer more distinct lord deerhurst who had been covertly studying her leant suddenly close to her you are a great appreciator of the beautiful mrs milbank he said in his thin high-bred voice clodagh started and glancing from one to the other of the three men laughed shyly why do you say that she asked because i have presumed to watch your face she blushed and bernard feeling rather than seeing her embarrassment made haste to reassure her mrs milbank is an adept in the appreciation of beauty he said with a laugh she was brought up on the study of it again clodagh colored and again she gave a shy laugh if you say that mr barnard she said i shall accuse you of being a fellow countryman i am irish you know she turned and looked up at deerhurst the old peer again bent forward interestingly indeed he exclaimed then we have a bond of sympathy some of my best friends come from ireland his voice was high and possessed no fullness but he had the same courteously ingratiating manner that belonged to his nephew while a larger acquaintance with the world had taught him an adaptability to circumstances and persons that sarah called had not troubled to acquire as he spoke now he brought a tone of deference and friendliness into his words that touched clodagh to a feeling of companionship then you know ireland she said quickly very well indeed her expression softened when were you there last she asked in a low voice last autumn i was staying at aranmore with with lord muskerry i know i know why you were in our county my father often and often stayed at aramore before she checked herself hastily oh long ago before before i was born she added a little awkwardly it was from a stream that runs near there that he took my name clodagh indeed what a charming idea deerhurst raised his gold-rimmed eyeglass and peered at her through the dusk at the same moment sarah called leaned forward in his seat clodagh he repeated clodagh what a pretty name once more and without apparent reason clodagh felt her heart beat unevenly with a short laugh she turned to barnard and you mr barnard she said hastily do you like the name barnard made a suave gesture i say that it fits its owner once more she laughed with a tinge of nervous excitement a very guarded statement she said brightly i think we had better talk about something else who are the people i am to meet here mr barnard kindly wants to provide me with new friends she turned again to deerhurst indeed once more he lifted the gold-rimmed glass this time to study barnard yes broke in bernard genially mrs milbank's husband and i have met here to talk shop and i have a shrewd presentiment that 
unless we provide her with a diverting channel or two, Mrs. Milbank may find Venice a bore. I could never do that. Cloda turned an animated face towards the dark flotilla, on the outskirts of which their own gondola was hovering. But, my dear lady, even Venice can become uninteresting and dry, paradoxical as it may sound, Bernard returned airily. My proposal, he explained, is that I should make Francis Hope and Mrs. Milbank known to each other. Don't you think the idea brilliant? Quite, quite, Sarah called, looked up interestingly. You are a man of ideas, Barney. Lord Deerhurst said nothing, but again his eyeglasses gleamed in the uncertain light. What is Lady Francis Hope like? Clodagh asked, suddenly withdrawing her gaze from the masked gondolas that swayed in the musician's lantern light. Like? Sarah called repeated vaguely. How would you describe her, uncle? The sort of woman who does everything twice as well as anybody else, and at half the cost, eh? Lord Deerhurst gave him one of his thin metallic laughs. I always think, he said slowly, that if Francis Hope had been the child of a milkman instead of a marquis, she would have made a singularly successful adventuress. No reflections cast upon the late Sammy, my dear Barnard. He waved his white hand, and the dim, uncertain light gleamed on a magnificent diamond ring. Barnard laughed with a tolerant air. Rather an apt deduction, he admitted, I am inclined to agree with you. Francis is just one of those shrewd, plain-looking, attractive women who enjoy climbing steep ladders. It is rather a pity she was born on the top rung. But I believe we have frightened Mrs. Milbank. He turned suddenly and caught Clodagh's expression as she sat forward, listening intently. At the mention of her name she laughed quickly and leant back against the cushions of her seat. "'What do you mean?' she asked with a touch of constraint. "'Am I as childish as all that?' They all looked at her, and Barnard gave an amused laugh. "'Come,' he cried banteringly, "'there's no use telling me you weren't just a little shocked.' "'Shocked?' "'Yes, shocked.' He nodded his head once or twice in genial gaiety. "'There's no denying that the word adventurous has a daunting sound. There was a danger signal in the very thought of a lady who might, under any conditions, have been notorious. Come now, confess. Clodagh looked from his amused quizzical eyes to Sarah called satirical laughing ones, and a shadow of uncertainty, of doubt, crossed her own bright face. There was an element in this social atmosphere that she did not quite understand. Indeed, she began hotly, but Sarah called, whose glance had never left her own, bent forward quickly, looking up into her face. "'I say, Mrs. Milbank,' he cried, "'let's refute the insinuation of this old inquisitor. Let's waive ceremony and storm Lady Frances Hope in her citadel. She is always at home at this hour of the night.' Clodagh looked up. "'Tonight?' she said. "'Oh, but how could I? I don't know her.' Sarah called, laughed. "'Oh, as for that,' We're abroad, not in England. The greatest stickler for etiquette allows that there's a difference in the two conditions. But I couldn't. How could I? Her eyes sought Bernard's. Oh, yes, he cried. I knew it. I knew it. We have frightened you off. She flushed uncomfortably. It isn't that, she cried in distress. You know it isn't that. Involuntarily she turned to Lord Deerhurst, but in the dim light she detected a smile on his pale, cold face. With a sudden change of emotion, self-reliance came to her. "'Where does Lady Frances Hope live?' she asked in a careless voice. Barnard was studying her intently. "'She has apartments in the Palazzo Ugacini,' he said, quite close at hand. For a moment Clodagh looked fixedly in front of her. Then her lips closed suddenly, and she raised her head. "'Very well,' she said shortly. "'Take me to the Palazzo Ugacini, just to prove that you were wrong.' End of Part 3, Chapter 4, Recording by Tom Weiss, TomsAudiobooks.com Part 3, Chapter 5 of The Gambler This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss the Gambler by Catherine Cecil Thurston Chapter 5 The decision was no sooner made than it was carried into execution. 
The order was given to the gondoliers, and instantly the long dark gondola swung round, disengaging itself from the tangle of surrounding craft, and headed for the quieter spaces of the middle stream. The Palazzo Ugacini was on the Grand Canal, and as they glided westward past the beautiful church of the Santa Maria della Salute, Bernard leant forward and directed her attention to their destination. "'There is the palace of the Ugucini,' he said. "'It contains some of the finest frescoes in Italy. It was bought up some years ago by an enterprising Frenchman who lets it out in sections. Just now Lady Frances Hope is the proud occupier of the first floor.' With a movement of interest she followed his glance, looking silently at the long line of irregular imposing buildings that stretched away before her. "'What a beautiful old place,' she said. "'Are those your friend's windows?' She indicated the first floor of the palace, from the open windows of which a warm stream of light poured downwards upon the water. "'Yes, I expect they're playing bridge up there. Francis is an enthusiast. By the way, do you gamble, Mrs. Milbank?' involuntarily clodagh started and looked round then as she met barnard's bland amiable face she blushed at her own emotions oh no she said in a low voice i-i never play cards sarah called looked up quickly what he exclaimed you don't play bridge i have never played any game of cards since i was a child the three men looked at her in unfeigned surprise not really mrs milbank Sarah Call's eyes were wide with astonishment. Really? Quite really? Why, you are ethereal, Mrs. Milbank, Barnard said laughingly as the gondola glided up to the palace steps. The passport to humanity nowadays is an inordinate love of risk. Clodagh laughed nervously. Then I must be inhuman, she said. The gondola stopped and Lord Deerhurst rose. As he offered her his hand, he looked searchingly into her face. Only time can prove the truth of that statement, Mrs. Milbank, he said in his thin voice. In the mystery of her surroundings the words seemed to Clodagh to possess a curious, almost a prophetic ring, and their echo lingered in her ears as she stepped from the gondola and entered the palace. But she was young, and to the young action must ever outweigh suggestion. She had scarcely mounted the old marble staircase before the excitement of her impending ordeal sent all other ideas spinning into oblivion. There was adventure and experience in every succeeding moment. At the head of the stairs they were met by an English manservant. He stepped forward gravely, as if accustomed to the arrival of late callers, and relieving Clodagh of her cloak, ushered her down a long corridor and through an arched doorway hidden by a velvet curtain. The salon into which they were shown was large and high-sealed. The walls displayed some allegorical studies in the fresco work of which Bernard had spoken. The floor was bare of carpet and highly polished, reflecting the elaborately designed but scanty furniture and the wonderful glass chandeliers that hung from the ceiling, and in the three long windows that opened on the canal stood groups of statuary. During the moment that followed their entrance Clodagh almost believed that the room was unoccupied so wide and formal did it look, but a second glance convinced her of her mistake. At its further end four persons were playing cards at a small table partly sheltered from the rest of the room by a massive leather screen. When their names were announced no one at the table moved or even looked round, but immediately afterwards there was a stir amongst the players and the light sound of cards thrown hastily down followed by a quick laugh in a woman's voice game and rubber well done partner how does the score stand tory the owner of the laugh rose from her seat and almost instantly turned to the door revealing to clodagh's curious eyes a strong energetic face redeemed from ugliness by a pair of intensely intelligent eyes and a mouth that displayed strong white teeth it was the somewhat disconcerting face of a clever woman to whom life represents an undeniable if an invigorating struggle Seeing the little group by the doorway, she hurried forward with an almost masculine assurance. "'You poor dear people!' she exclaimed in her strong voice. "'A thousand apologies. We were on the point of finishing a most exciting rubber.' Her voice broke off short as her eyes rested on Clodagh. "'Who is this, Barney?' she asked interestingly. 
Barnard stepped forward, laying his hand smilingly on Clodagh's arm. "'This, my dear Francis,' he said, "'is a new friend that I want you to make, the wife of an old friend of mine. You may have met her husband, Mr. Milbank, one of the Somerset Milbanks. Poor Sammy knew him well.' Lady Frances Hope puckered her strong, assertive eyebrows. "'I believe I do remember meeting a Mr. Milbank, but I scarcely think.' She looked scrutinizingly at Clodagh. "'Oh, yes, it's the same, it's the same.' Barnard's interruption was somewhat hasty. "'Mr. Milbank is a great archaeologist. He and Mrs. Milbank are only in Venice for a week. I had intended bringing you to call formally at their hotel, but circumstances.' Here Clodagh broke in. "'You must please, please forgive my doing such a very extraordinary thing as this,' she said. "'It was all Mr. Barnard's fault.' but Lady Frances Hope cut the explanation short by holding out her hand. "'You are extremely welcome,' she said cordially, "'and if the truth must be told, I owe you a debt of gratitude for saving me an afternoon call. It's a hundred times pleasanter to meet like this. Now, let me see. You play bridge, of course. We can make up another four. She glanced over her guest with an organizing eye. Clodagh stepped forward deprecatingly, and cast a beseeching look at Barnard. But in the slight pause that followed, it was Lord Deerhurst who came to her rescue. "'Mrs. Milbank has just been confessing to us that she never plays cards,' he said smoothly. "'If you will go on with your game, Lady Frances, I shall do my best to amuse her.' He turned his unemotional glance from one to the other. The surprise that his announcement had brought to their hostess's face changed instantly to an expression of hospitality. "'No, no, indeed,' she cried. "'I would infinitely prefer to talk to Mrs. Bilbeck. "'Come,' she added, smiling at Clodagh, "'come and let me introduce you to these bridge-playing people. "'Perhaps they will convert you.' She laughed and, followed by the four, moved across the salon. At their approach the three at the card-table, two women and a man, turned to look at them, and the latter, a square-built, thick-set youth wearing a pince-nez and possessing a quick, inquisitive manner, rose to his feet. "'Mrs. Milbank,' said Lady Frances, "'this is Mr. Victor Luard. Miss Luard, Mrs. Bathurst.' Luard bowed, and the two women looked at Clodagh, each acknowledging the introduction after her own fashion. Miss Luard gave a quick friendly nod. Mrs. Bathurst, a slow and graceful inclination of the head, accompanied by a faint, insincere smile. "'Are you a bridge player?' she asked, raising a pair of pretty languid brown eyes to Clodagh's. I wish so much you would take my place. I've been having the most appalling luck. Her glance wandered on to Seracald, Barnard, and Deerhurst. Ah, here is Lord Deerhurst, she cried in a suddenly animated voice. Lord Deerhurst, do come and tell me what you would have done with a hand like this. She picked up her scattered cards and began to sort them. Then, with a graceful movement, she drew her skirts aside and indicated a vacant chair that stood beside her own. Lord Deerhurst hesitated, lifted his eyeglass, and scrutinized her pretty pink and white face, then languidly dropped into the empty chair. At the same moment Clodagh, Sarah called Luard, and his sister fell into conversation, and Lady Frances and Barnard moved away together towards one of the open windows. For a quarter of an hour the formation of the party remained unchanged. Then a slight incident caused a distraction in the assembly. Clodagh, who had shaken off her first shyness and was beginning to enjoy the conversation of her new acquaintance, heard the curtain at the arched entrance drawn back, and looking round was surprised to see two servants enter, solemnly carrying a table and a painted board, which they proceeded to set up in the middle of the room. Her wonder and curiosity were depicted on her face. Her Luard looked at her quickly and interestedly. "'Don't you know what that is, Mrs. Milbank?' he asked. "'Hasn't Barney told you of Lady Frances' famous roulette? Lady Frances,' he called, "'come and initiate Mrs. Milbank.' At the words everyone turned and looked at Clodagh, and Lord Deerhurst, with a murmured word to Mrs. Bathurst, rose and came round the card-table. "'Are you going to tempt the gods?' he asked in his peculiar voice. Clodagh looked round, a little embarrassed by the general interest. "'Well, I—I I suppose I should like to see roulette played,' she admitted guardedly. He bent his head and looked at her with his cold, penetrating smile. "'Ah, I see,' he said softly. 
judicious reservations. But at that moment Lady Frances crossed the room, and pausing by the roulette table set the ball spinning. "'Come along, people,' she cried gaily. "'Fortune smiles.' They all laughed and strolled across the room. "'Come along,' Lady Frances urged again. "'Come, Rose.' She smiled at Mrs. Bathurst. "'Unlucky at bridge, lucky at roulette. Come, Tory, come, Val.' She glanced from Luard to Seracald. There was another amused laugh, and all the party, with the exception of Clodagh, stepped forward and placed one or many coins upon the table. Lady Frances' eyes were quick to detect the exception. With her fingers poised above the board, she waited smilingly. "'Won't you stake, Mrs. Milbank?' she asked. Clodagh blushed and stepped back shyly. At the same instant Seracald moved forward to her side. "'Oh, Mrs. Milbank, but you must!' he cried. Again confusion covered Clodagh, as all eyes were turned upon her. "'No, please,' she said. "'I—I I think I'd rather not.' Barnard laughed suavely. "'Mrs. Milbank is wise,' he said. "'She wants to see which way the gods are pointing. "'Then Mrs. Milbank is unwise. "'The gods are jealous beings. "'We must not treat them with suspicion. "'I'll stake for her.' It was Lord Deerhurst who spoke and regardless of Clodagh's quick half-frightened expostulation, he stepped forward out of the little circle and placed a gold coin on the number thirteen. A moment later Lady Frances gave a short amused laugh and with a dexterous movement of the fingers set the ball whizzing. To Clodagh it was a supreme, an extraordinary moment, until Lord Deerhurst had made the stake, until the first click of the spinning ball had struck upon her ear, she had been conscious of only one feeling, a prejudiced innate dread of every game, whether of chance or skill, upon which money could be staked. But the simple placing of the coin, the simple turning of the pivot, had marked for her a psychological moment. With a quick catching of the breath she stepped involuntarily forward, aware of but one fact, the keen exhilarating knowledge that the stopping of the ball must mean loss or gain, individual loss or gain. During the dozen seconds that it spun round the circle she stood silent. Then a faint sound of uncontrollable excitement slipped from between her lips. Hers was the winning number. As in a dream she extended her hand and took the little heap of money from the fingers of Luard, who had come to Lady Frances' assistance. Then on the instant that the coins touched her palm her excitement evaporated. Her sense of elation fell away to be succeeded by the first instinctive shrinking that had swayed her imagination. Acting purely upon impulse, she turned to Lord Deerhurst, and before he could remonstrate, pressed the money into his hand. "'Please take it,' she said urgently. "'Please take it. It isn't mine. It oughtn't to be mine. I—I I don't wish to play.'" End of Chapter 5 Chapter 6 The little incident, trivial in itself, damped the general ardor for roulette. After a dozen turns of the wheel Lady Frances declared herself satisfied. "'Mrs. Milbank has regenerated us for the moment,' she cried. "'I can't play roulette tonight. But our turn will come, Mrs. Milbank. We will be revenged on you.' Her shrewd smiling glance passed rapidly over Clodagh's face. Again the whole company laughed. "'Mrs. Milbank is a feminine Sir Galahad,' said Luard. "'By the way, Lady Frances, when is our irreproachable knight to honor Venice with his presence? He turned and looked banteringly at his hostess. Lady Frances smiled. Oh, any day now, she returned, but aren't you rather incorrigible? So Sir Galahad thinks, he retorted unabashed. Is he an acquaintance of yours, Mrs. Milbank? Clodagh smiled uncertainly, and Lady Frances laughed. How ridiculous of you to expect Mrs. Milbank to read your riddles, she said sharply. The person this very disrespectful young man is speaking of, Mrs. Milbank, is Sir Walter Gore. The most admirable Sir Walter Gore, interjected Luard. Lady Frances' sallow face flushed very slightly. Sir Walter Gore, she went on, ignoring the interruption, who is only twenty-nine, has been ten times round the world, and is imbued with the deepest contempt for all modern social things. She laughed again as she finished, but a fleeting change of expression had passed over her face. Clodagh looked up smilingly. "'And where is the likeness to me?' she asked. 
"'Oh, you are both above mere human temptations, Mrs. Milbank,' Luard broke in irrepressibly. Lord Deerhurst, who had been listening to the conversation, lifted his eyeglass. "'But then Sir Walter Gore has been ten times round the world,' he remarked in his thin, dry voice. "'And this is Mrs. Milbank's first visit to Venice.' Again they all laughed, and Clodagh coloured. "'You think my stoicism would not wear well?' she asked. Deerhurst looked at her searchingly. "'Stoicism may be born of many characteristics,' he said. "'I am not in a position to say from what yours springs. But,' he lowered his voice, "'I do not think you are a natural stoic.' She laughed and glanced uneasily round the little company, already beginning to break up into groups of two and three. Observing the look, Lady Frances turned to her tactfully. "'Come, Lord Deerhurst,' she cried. "'We are getting too serious. If you must philosophize, take Mrs. Milbank on to the balcony, where she will have something to distract her thoughts. For myself I want to hear Valentine sing. Val,' she called, "'come to the piano and make some music. I'm surfeited with stringed instruments and Italian voices.' She moved across the salon, and Lord Deerhurst turned to Clodagh. "'May I follow our hostess's suggestion? May I talk philosophy on the balcony?' She smiled. The slight strain of which she had been conscious ever since the incident of the roulette lifted suddenly, and her earlier sensation of elated excitement returned. "'Yes, if you like,' she responded brightly. "'The balcony sounds very tempting, and as for the philosophy I can promise to listen, if I can't promise to understand.' She smiled afresh and crossed the wide room. Deerhurst following closely. As she passed the group of statuary and stepped through the open window, Sarah called struck a chord or two on the piano, and an instant later his voice, a full strong voice, intensely passionate and youthful, drifted across the salon and out into the night. At the first note Clodagh halted, surprised and enchanted by the sound, and sinking silently into one of the balcony chairs, rested one arm on the iron railing. The music Sarah called sang was French, and possessed much of the distinction that marks that nation's art. The song was a hymn to life and its indispensable coadjutors, youth and love, and it went with the peculiar lilt that stirred the blood and stimulated the fancy. He sang it as it should be sung, easily and arrogantly, for as frequently happens with those who possess voices, he could express in music thoughts, ideas, and emotions that never crossed his own selfish, somewhat narrow soul. Clodagh, staring down into the dark waters in an attitude of rapt attention, drank in the song to its last note, and as the final vibration died away she looked round at Deerhurst with an expression infinitely softened and enhanced. "'How beautiful!' she said. "'Oh, how beautiful!' Deerhurst, who had seated himself beside her, leant forward and rested his own arm upon the balcony railing. "'It's not the song that is beautiful, Mrs. Milbank, but the thoughts it has awakened in you.' Clodagh looked at him in silent question. She was still under the spell of the music, and saw nothing to resent in his cold gaze. "'You were the instrument,' he went on in the same lowered voice. "'The notes were not played upon the piano, but upon your brain. Your brain is a network of sensitive strings waiting to be played on by every factor in life, music, color, sunshine, emotion. His tone sank. Clodagh glanced quickly at his tall, thin figure seated so close to her own, and at the wax-like inscrutable face showing through the dusk. "'You seem to know me better than I know myself,' she said uncertainly. He watched her intently for a moment, then he leant forward his long, pale fingers toying with the ribbon of his eyeglass. "'I do know you better than you know yourself.' She gave a little embarrassed laugh. "'Then explain me to myself.' Again he seemed to study her. Then he leant back in his chair with a decisive movement. "'No,' he said. "'No, not now. In a year or two, or even three, perhaps. But not now.' She laughed again, and unconsciously a note of relief underran her laugh a relief that, by a natural sequence of emotion, brought a fresh reaction to the coquetry of an hour ago. With a quick turn of her head she looked up at him. "'But how shall I find you in a year, or two, or three? She was distinctly conscious that the words held a challenge, but the thought was fraught 
with the new intoxication that the evening had created. With a swift movement he bent closer to her. The world is very small, Mrs. Milbank, when one desires to make it so. In the half-light of the balcony his pale eyes seemed to search hers. Involuntarily she blushed, but her glance met his steadily enough. Not until one has been ten times rounded, she reminded him. He laughed his thin, amused laugh, then suddenly he became grave again. "'Don't you feel,' he said, "'that when we desire a thing very greatly our own will-power may bend circumstances?' Her eyes faltered, and her gaze moved to the gondolas flitting silently below them. "'I think I have given up desiring things greatly,' she said, in a low, uneven voice. Deerhurst's eyelids narrowed. "'Would it be presumptuous to ask why?' "'No, oh, no. But you will not throw light upon my darkness?' She turned her head, and once more her gaze rested on his face. "'No,' she said softly, "'it isn't that. It is that I don't believe I could enlighten you, even if I would. I am a puzzle to myself.' The deeper a riddle, the more tempting its solution. Very quietly he drew still nearer, until his foot touched the hem of her skirt. The action, more than the words, startled her. With a little laugh she drew back into her seat. "'Perhaps it is no riddle after all,' she said quickly. "'Perhaps it is the lack of human nature, the likeness to Mr. Luard's Sir Galahad.' She laughed again nervously. Then suddenly her own words suggested to her a new and less dangerous channel of talk. "'When is this wonderful person to be in Venice?' she asked. "'I should like to see him.' But Lord Deerhurst had no intention of allowing another man's name to interfere with his pleasure. "'Mrs. Milbank,' he said earnestly, "'may I ask you another question, a serious one? Not till you've answered mine. But this is personal, personal to you and me. The other is not.' He bent over her chair, and seemingly by accident his hand brushed her sleeve. "'Mrs. Milbank,' but even as his thin voice articulated her name a shadow fell across the lighted window between them, and Sarah called, characteristically easy and nonchalant in his movements, stepped onto the balcony. Clodagh turned with a short, faint laugh. The beating of her heart was uneven, and her face felt hot. "'Mr. Sarah called,' she said impulsively, "'when is Sir Walter Gore coming to Venice? I have been asking Lord Deerhurst, but he cannot, or will not, tell me.' Deerhurst, who at his nephew's approach had drawn quietly back into his seat, looked up with perfect composure. "'Yes, Valentine,' he said smoothly, "'I believe Gore has been making an impression by proxy.' Sarah called laughed. "'Really,' he said, "'how interesting. I shall look forward to the meeting in the flesh.' Again he laughed, as at something intensely amusing, and as Clodagh turned towards him doubtfully she saw him shoot a swift satirical glance at his uncle. Why, she asked quickly, why should our meeting be interesting? Once more a vague sense of antagonism assailed her, a vague distrust of this new atmosphere. Sarah called answered at once in his light ingratiating tone. For no reason, Mrs. Milbank, that you can possibly cavil at. But for what reason? Her glance rested inquiringly on his face. Do tell me, I hate things that I cannot understand. Deerhurst smiled a little cynically. A very youthful sentiment, he murmured. The older one grows, the more one seeks the incomprehensible. His eyes rested upon her with a fixed regard. For a space she sat very still, attempting no rejoinder. Then, as if suddenly moved to decisive action, she rose and turned towards the lighted salon. It's very late, she said quickly. I must think about getting home. Sarah called, stepped aside, and Deerhurst, who had risen with her, moved forward but with a swift gesture that ignored them both she crossed the balcony and stepped through the open window. After she had left them the two men stood for a moment looking at each other. Then, with an elaborately careless gesture, Lord Deerhurst raised his eyeglass and peered out across the dark canal. "'Rather a pleasant little gathering tonight,' he said casually. "'Rose Bathurst looks particularly well.' Sarah Colt's lips parted then pursed themselves together while he cast one comprehensive glance at his uncle's stiff back. "'Oh, yes, yes, quite,' he rejoined vaguely. Then, very swiftly, 
he turned and hurried across the salon after Clodagh. She was bidding her hostess good night as he reached her side, and his attentive glance noted her heightened color and her nervously alert manner. "'Tomorrow night, then,' Lady Frances was saying, and he saw Clodagh nod and smile. "'Tomorrow night,' she repeated. "'Mr. Barnard, are you ready?' As she looked round for her cavalier, Sarah called stepped softly to her side. "'Mrs. Milbank,' he said, "'you will not discard my uncle's gondola. He is waiting to know if we may convey you home.' She looked up at him with a faint suggestion of coldness and distrust. Then, across the silence of her indecision, the low notes of the Venetian night music broke forth again as the musician's gondola passed the Palazzo Ugaccini on its way homeward. For one moment it seemed to sweep across the salon through the open windows. Then it faded into the distance as the boat passed on up the canal. At the sound Clodagh's voice involuntarily softened, her lips parted and she smiled. "'Very well,' she acquiesced below her breath. "'Tell Lord Deerhurst that he may take me home.'" End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 During the night that followed, Clodagh's excited thoughts scarcely permitted her to sleep, but with that extraordinary reserve of strength that springs from the combination of youth and health, she rose next morning as fresh and untired as though she had enjoyed unbroken rest. Coming downstairs at half-past eight, the first person she encountered was Milbank entering the hotel from the terrace, and spurred by her own exuberant spirits, roused to a sense of general goodwill by her own rosy outlook upon life, she went quickly forward to greet him. "'Good morning, James,' she said. "'I hope you haven't been tiring yourself.' It struck her as an after-impression that he looked slightly worn and fatigued. As he took her hand he smiled, gratified by her concern. "'Not at all, my dear,' he responded. "'Not at all. I have had an hour's excursion with Mr. Tomes. I assure you I had no idea that the byways of Venice were so interesting. All Venice is heavenly.' Clodagh's glance wandered across the terrace to the canal, radiant in the early light. Milbank raised his head, arrested by the fervor of her tone. "'Then you, you enjoyed yourself last night?' he ventured with unusual penetration. Oh, so much! She turned to him with a glowing smile that betrayed a warm desire for universal confidence and sympathy. So much! Mr. Barnard and the tall, dark-haired boy that you met last night took me round the canals in the most beautiful gondola belonging to Lord Deerhurst. We saw all the interesting people from the hotels and heard the music, and afterwards Mr. Barnard brought me to the Palazzo Uccini and introduced me to Lady Frances Hope. She was charmingly kind and hospitable, and made me promise to go again to-night, and to bring you. Milbank's face fell. But, my dear, he began deprecatingly, oh, you must come, you must. Lady Frances Hope feels sure she has met you before. You must come. Milbank looked distressed. But, my dear. Yes, I know you hate society, but just this once I, I wish you to come. She made the appeal with a sudden anxious gesture, born of a very subtle, a very instinctive motive, a motive that had for its basis an obscure and quite unacknowledged sense of self-protection. Milbank, materialist-born, heard only the words, noting nothing of the under-meaning. "'But, my dear,' he expostulated, "'the thing is, is impossible. Mr. Angelo Tomes has promised to expound his theories to me after dinner tonight.' He looked at her nervously. She was silent for a minute or two, suddenly and profoundly conscious that in all the radiant glory of her surroundings she stood alone. At the painful consciousness she felt her throat swell, but with a defiant refusal to be conquered by her feelings she gave a quick, high laugh. "'Oh, very well,' she cried, "'very well, as you like.' And without looking at him again she turned and entered the coffee-room of the hotel. Having partaken very hastily of her morning meal, she returned to the terrace where, among the early loungers, she found Barnard reading his English newspapers. Seeing her, he threw the papers down, jumped to his feet, and came forward with evident pleasure. "'Good morning,' he said cordially. "'Good morning. You look as fresh as a flower after last night's dissipation.' She took his hand and met his suave smile with a sense of relief. "'Good morning,' she returned softly. "'Have you seen James?' He breakfasted hours ago. 
Yes, he said, oh, yes, I was talking to him just now. He has gone to write letters. To write letters. There was no curiosity and very little interest audible in Clodagh's tone. So he said, and you, what are you going to do? She looked up and smiled again. To idle, she said, I have an inherited gift for idling. Barnard smiled, then glanced along the terrace with an air of pretended secrecy. "'Take me into partnership,' he said in a whisper. "'My clients don't know it, but I'm constitutionally the laziest beggar alive. Do let me idle in your company for half an hour. The canals are delightful in the early morning.' He indicated the flight of stone steps round which one or two gondolas were hovering in expectation of a fare. Clodagh's glance followed his and her face insensibly brightened. "'I should love it,' she said. "'Truly?' She nodded. "'Right, then the thing is done.' He hurried forward, and with a little thrill of pleasurable anticipation she saw one of the loitering gondolas glide up to the steps. For the first few moments after they had entered the boat she was silent, for in the iridescent morning light Venice made a new appeal. Then gradually, insidiously, as the charm of her surroundings began to soothe her senses, the encounter with Milbank melted from her mind, and the subtle environment bred of last night's adulation rose again, turning the world golden. As they passed the Palazzo Ugocini she looked up at the closed windows of the first floor. Then, almost immediately, she turned to her companion. "'Mr. Barnard,' she said suddenly, "'I want to ask you a question. I want you to explain something.' and Barnard, closely studious of her demeanour, felt insensibly that her mood had changed, that, by a fine connection of suggestions, she was not the same being who had stepped into the gondola from the hotel steps. With a genial movement he bent his head. "'Command me,' he said. Before replying she took another swift glance at the closed windows. Then she turned again and met his eyes. "'Tell me why this friend of Lady Frances Hope's is called Sir Galahad. He smiled. Gore, he said with a slightly amused surprise, I didn't know you were interested in Gore. I am not, but please tell me I want to know. His smile broadened. The nickname surely explains itself. Somebody with an ideal, somebody above temptation? Precisely. She pondered over this reply for a moment, then she opened a fresh attack. Then why should Lord Deerhurst and Mr. Serracold have smiled when they spoke of his meeting me? Barnard looked up in unfeigned astonishment. Then he laughed. Upon my word, Mrs. Milbank, he cried, you are absolutely unique. Clodagh flushed. For one second she wavered on the borderland of offense. Then her mood, her sense of the ridiculous and the sunny atmosphere of the morning, conquered. She responded with a laugh. I suppose I'm not like other people, she said, for which you should say grace every hour of your life. Barnard turned and looked into her glowing face, but I'll satisfy your curiosity. Gore is known in his own set as a man who obstinately, and against all reason, refuses to believe in, well, for instance, in the interesting young married woman. Clodagh's lips parted. But what? she began impetuously. Then she stopped. Barnard continued to look at her. Isn't the inference of the smile somewhat obvious? Her glance fell. Oh, she said. Oh, I suppose, I suppose I see. Precisely. But surely, she began afresh, then again intuition interfered, though this time to a different end. It was not the moment, it was not the atmosphere, in which to parade one's sentiments. With the too ready facility of her nation for adapting itself to environment, she laughed suddenly and gaily at her own passing crudery, and raised a bright face to Barnard's. "'And when he meets these interesting young married women?' she asked amusedly. "'Ah, there he dubs himself Sir Galahad. Some people call him a saint for keeping his eyes on the ground. Other call him a sinner for not picking up what he sees there. In reality he is neither sinner nor saint but just that inevitable creation, a man who is self-sufficing. While he spoke, and for some time after he had ceased to speak, Clodagh sat silent. She was leaning over the side of the gondola, and looking down into the calm water, her warm face touched by a mischievous expression, 
her hazel eyes half closed. At last she spoke, but without raising her head. And you are all waiting for the person who will make him see the need for someone else. She waited for Barnard's answer, but it did not come. Sensitive to the silence, she raised her head. Then her self-consciousness left her, superseded by curiosity. As she looked up, she saw her companion lean forward and wave a cheerful greeting to the occupant of a gondola approaching them from the direction of the railway station. Involuntarily, she changed her position, and her glance followed his. The passing of the two gondolas occupied no more than a minute, but the incidents comprised in some minutes remain with us all our lives. The approaching boat was a large one rowed by two gondoliers, for though it had only one passenger, it carried a pile of luggage much travel-worn. Clodagh's eyes noted this, but they did so very briefly, for instantly the gondola drew level with her own, her glance lifted itself to the owner of the luggage, the man to whom Barnard had waved his greeting. She saw him with great distinctiveness, for the early light in Italy is peculiarly penetrating, and her first thought, a purely instinctive one, was that he possessed a sailor's face. His strong, clean-cut features suggested a keen and intimate relationship with natural elements, his healthy clear skin was tanned by sun and wind, and his eyes looked out upon the world with a quiet reliance that seems a reflection of the steadfast ocean. The first impression of the man was vaguely daunting. There was something self-contained, even cold, in the erect pose of his tall, muscular figure, in the manner in which he held his head. Then, quite unexpectedly, his critic gained a new impression of him. As the gondolas passed each other, he leaned forward in his seat, and his lips parted in a very pleasant smile. "'Ubiquitous as usual, Barnard,' he called in a strong, fresh voice. "'I might have known you would be the first man I should run across.' He raised his cap, and Clodagh saw that his hair was crisp, close-cut, and very fair, giving an agreeable touch of youthfulness to his sunburnt face. Barnard laughed and responded with some words of welcome. The stranger smiled and nodded. "'Come round and see me this afternoon,' he cried as the gondolas drew apart. "'I'm staying at the Danili.' "'Who was that?' Clodagh asked involuntarily, as the stranger's boat glided out of sight. Then she blushed suddenly. "'Why are you laughing?' she demanded. Barnard smiled. "'I am not laughing, Mrs. Milbank,' he murmured. "'I assure you I am not laughing. It is the merest smile at nature's little bit of stage management.' that interestingly bronzed young Englishman is Sir Walter Gore. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 This little incident, this small and yet significant interlude in Clodagh's day of newborn freedom, possessed a weight and an importance all its own. It is quite possible that, taken as a mere note in the tuneful, inconsequent symphony of her social life in Venice, Barnard's expression of his sentiments might have glanced across her mind, leaving no definite impression. But the web of fate is wonderfully woven. Barnard had propounded those sentiments through the medium of a name, a name which was to be indelibly printed upon Clodagh's memory by the strangely opportune appearance of its owner. At the moment when the gondolas passed, at the moment when Barnard laughingly explained the stranger's identity, the name of Walter Gore took on a new significance became a personal element in touch with her own existence. In studying the effect of this incident upon her actions, it must be borne in mind that Clodagh's moral position was strangely incongruous, a position to which not one amongst her new acquaintances possessed the key. She was a married woman with the vitality, the curiosity, the sense of adventure of a girl in her first season. She was like a plant that, having been shut for long in dark places, is suddenly exposed to the influences of warmth and light. She glowed, she blossomed, she expanded under every passing touch. As she leant back against the cushions of the gondola and met the amused and quizzical glance that accompanied Barnard's explanation, her thoughts sprang forward under a certain stimulus of excitement. Her blood, the blood of a reckless, adventurous race, leaped suddenly in response to a new idea. She looked up at her companion, her face glowing, her hands clasped lightly in her lap. 
Mr. Bernard, she said, will Sir Walter Gore be at the Palazzo Uccini tonight? Bernard met her glance. For a moment he studied her whimsically, then he responded by putting a question of his own. Mrs. Milbank, he asked, is it true that when you dare an Irish woman to do a certain thing, that thing is as good as done? Clodagh's lashes fluttered, and she colored hotly. Then, with the naive defiance, the intoxication of youthful assurance, she lifted her eyes again and gave another bright, clear laugh. Two unanswered questions should be as good as one reply, she said, looking straight into his face. All that day Clodagh went about her concerns with a delightful furtive sense of things to come. In the evening she came down to dinner, arrayed in a dress of lace and embroidery that had come from Vienna only three weeks before. The dress possessed sweeping lines that defined her slight figure, and above the jeweled lace of the bodice her graceful shoulders, smooth as ivory, and as warm in tone, showed bare of any ornament. The faint olive of her skin was enriched by the natural color of her dress, and in the bright light of the hotel rooms the underlying gleam of gold was distinctly visible in her brown hair. Her whole appearance as she entered the dining-room was subtly attractive and in every detail of her expression pleasure and anticipation gleamed like tangible things. From the color that wavered in her cheeks to the dilated pupils that turned her eyes from hazel to black, she was the embodiment of eager expectation. Neither Deerhurst, Seracold, nor Barnard dined at the hotel that night, but from the eyes of more than one stranger she read the assurance that she had not arrayed herself in vain and youthfully conscious of a subtle, impersonal success, her eager spirits rose high. Regardless of Milbank's monosyllabic answers, she kept up a stream of conversation, and at last when she rose with the general company she did not leave the room but paused with her hand on the back of his chair. "'I am going for my cloak, James,' she said. "'Mr. Barnard is to call for me. Shall we say good-night now?' Her face, as she bent forward, leaning over his shoulder, was filled with a bright preoccupation. The scene was no new one, nor was its lesson new. It merely expounded the eternal disparity between the present generation and the past. On the one hand was the patient surrender of the being who has known life with its poor compensations and its tardy requitals. On the other, the impatience, the ardor, the egotism of the being who longs to understand, to tear the bandage from his blind, curious eyes, to shake the fetters from its eager, groping hands. It was a scene that is enacted every day of every year by fathers and daughters, mothers and sons, a scene in which daily and yearly a merciful nature mitigates the tragic truth by means of a blessed sanity and instinctive renunciation. But this was no case for natural healing balm, this was no case of father and daughter, but of husband and wife. "'Shall we say good-night?' Clodagh asked again. Milbank started and looked up, and something in her warm beauty, something in her gracious youth, affected him. "'Clodagh,' he said timidly, "'Clodagh, are you... are you very anxious? Will you enjoy this party very much?' Clodagh looked down on him in frank surprise. "'Why, of course,' she said. "'Why do you ask?' His gaze wavered before her level glance. She looked round at the fast emptying room. "'No reason, my dear,' he murmured. "'No reason, I assure you. Go to your party. Enjoy yourself.' At his words she bent quickly and brushed her forehead with lips but so lightly, so unthinkingly, that the act was valueless. "'Good-night,' she said. "'Good-night, James, and thank you.' She straightened herself quickly, and with a mind already speeding feverishly forward towards the night's amusement, she turned and walked out of the room. It was nine o'clock when she and Barnard arrived at the Palazzo Uccini, and already the deep purple of the Venetian night was wrapping the waterways in mysterious shade. But to-night she was less absorbed in outward things. An engrossing idea occupied her mind. She felt at once surer and less sure of herself than she had felt the night before. The time occupied in reaching the palace and mounting the marble steps seemed to her very brief, and almost before she realized that the moment had come she heard her own and Barnard's names announced by Lady Frances Hope's English servant. Her first sensation upon entering the salon 
was an almost childish satisfaction in the thought that she had dressed so carefully, for it needed but a glance to show her that the evening's gathering was of a very much more important nature than that of the previous night. Quite fifty people were grouped about the lofty room, whose center and pivot was again the gaudy modern roulette table, and towards this table, with its surrounding group of gay and noisy votaries, she and Barnard turned as if by instinct. Nearing the circle of players, she saw that Luard, her acquaintance of last evening, was officiating at the game to the delight and amusement of his clients, while at a little distance from the table she caught sight of her hostess in conversation with a tall man whose remarkably fair and close-cropped hair gave her a sudden thrill of recognition. As in duty-bound she walked straight forward to where Lady Frances was standing, and as she murmured her greeting her hostess turned quickly, appraising in a single rapid glance her dress, her hair, her complexion while she extended her hand with a cordial gesture. It may be possible that the cordiality cost Lady Frances an effort, that the smile with which she greeted her radiant guest covered a suggestion of feminine chagrin. But if so, no one detected it. Her welcome sounded genuine and even warm. "'My dear Mrs. Milbank,' she exclaimed, "'how charming of you to remember, and how charming you look!' she added in a whisper meant for Clodagh's ear alone. Then, with a movement of seemingly spontaneous hospitality, she turned to the fair-haired stranger who had fallen into conversation with Bernard. "'Walter,' she said, "'I should like you to know Mrs. Milbank. Mrs. Milbank, allow me to introduce Sir Walter Gore.' It was the affair of a moment. The stranger made a gesture of excuse to Barnard, turned quickly, and bowed with well-bred deference. Then he raised his head, and for the first time Clodagh met his glance, the clear, fearless glance, slightly reserved, slightly aloof, that carried with it the suggestion of the sea. His look was quiet, steady, and absolutely impersonal, and Clodagh, instantly conscious of this polite reserve, felt her face redden. She was aware of a distinct sensation of being smaller, less important to the scheme of things than she had been five minutes earlier. Her vanity was inexplicably yet palpably hurt. Her first feeling was a distressed humility, her second an angry pride. Then a new expression leaped into her eyes. Smartingly conscious of Bernard's interested, quizzical glance fixed expectantly upon her, she challenged the stranger's regard. "'How do you do?' she said. "'I think I have seen you before.' He smiled politely. "'Indeed,' he said. "'In England?' His tone was courteous and attentive but neither curious nor interested. Her color deepened. "'No, here in Venice, this morning. I was in Mr. Barnard's gondola when you were coming from the station to your hotel.' He looked at her, then at Barnard, a perfectly honest, unaffected glance. "'Indeed,' he said again, "'I certainly remember seeing that Barnard was not alone, but I was remiss enough not to notice who the lady was.' For one second a feeling of resentment, almost of dislike, stung Clodagh. The next her old daring mood of years ago sprang up within her. "'Where I come from,' she said, "'no man would have the courage to say that.' Barnard laughed. "'Assume a virtue if you have it not. Is that the Irish code?' Gore smiled. "'If that is the Irish code,' he said gravely, "'I'm afraid Ireland only echoes the rest of Europe. Assumption is the art of the twentieth century. The man who can assume most climbs highest. Isn't that so, Lady Frances?' He turned to their hostess. Clodagh stood silent. She was filled with a humiliating, childish sensation of having been rebuked, rebuked by someone whose natural superiority placed him beyond reach of childish temper or childish violence. The sensation that many a time in old and distant days had sent her flying to the shelter of Hannah's arms rose intolerably keen. With a defiant sense of futility and loneliness she turned away from the little group only to encounter the pallid face and stiff, distinguished figure of Lord Deerhurst as he came slowly towards her across the room. Extending his hand, he took her fingers and bowed over them. "'Mrs. Milbank,' he said, "'I have just been mentally accusing Lady Frances of surrounding me by so many acquaintances that I could not find one friend. Now I desire to retract.' In the sudden relief, the sudden touch of unexpected flattery, Clodagh's mobile face underwent a change. "'Then you have found a friend,' 
she said. At the sound of the words Sir Walter Gore involuntarily turned, and seeing the old peer made a slight movement of surprise and extended his hand. "'Lord Deerhurst,' he said, "'I did not know you were in Venice.' They shook hands without cordiality, and having murmured some conventional remark, the older man turned again to Clodagh. "'Yes,' he said, "'I have found a friend.' His cold eyes gave point to the words. She laughed and colored. Again she was conscious of Barnard's amused, speculative gaze, but also she was conscious of the quiet, slightly critical eyes of her new acquaintance. Goaded by the double spur, she glanced up into Deerhurst's face. "'Well,' she said, "'and now?' "'Now I am in my friend's hands.' He made a profound and eloquent bow. Again she colored, but again vanity and mortification stirred her blood. With a winning movement she took a step forward. "'Your friend would like to listen to philosophy on the balcony,' she said in a recklessly low voice. End of Part 3, Chapter 8 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks, dot com Part Three, Chapter Nine of The Gambler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Gambler by Catherine Cecil Thurston. Chapter Nine. To the superficial student of Clodagh's character, this development of a phase in her mental growth may present itself as something distasteful, even unworthy but to the serious student of human nature with its manifold and wonderful complexities it must perforce come clothed in a different guise placed by circumstances in a singularly isolated position springing from a race in whom love of power love of admiration love of love itself are inherent qualities it is not to be wondered at that in the first flush of her realized sovereignty over men she should view the world from a slightly giddy altitude no one grudges her triumphs and her innocent intrigues to the girl in her first season humanity looks on indulgently while she breaks her first lance with the candid joy the pardonable egotism that is bred of youth and incongruous as it may sound clodagh's was the position of the debutante she was comprehending for the first time and comprehending with accumulated emotion the fact that she possessed an individual path in life and with the arrogance of inexperience she sprang to the conclusion that every foot crossing that path should yield her a toll of homage. And now one foot had crossed it without pause, without even a desire to linger. Her cheeks burned under the smart of her hurt vanity as she turned from the little group that surrounded Lady Frances Hope and allowed Deerhurst to lead her across the salon. Her emotions were many and confused, but one personality occupied her thoughts against the angry expostulations of her reason. By an illogical but very human sequence of impressions, Sir Walter Gore had, in one moment, become the most objectionable and the most interesting person of her acquaintance. As she stepped out upon the balcony, Deerhurst drew forward the low chair that she had occupied the night before, and she sank into it with a little sigh. For the first time in the glamour of new-found excitement she felt glad to escape from the crowd and the lights of the salon. For a while her companion made no effort to break the silence that she seemed anxious to preserve, then at last he changed his position, stepped softly forward, and laid his hand on the back of her chair. "'Is what Bernard tells me true?' he asked. "'Are you really leaving Venice in a week?' She bent her head without looking up but surely we can persuade you his voice quickened then broke off as clodagh turned to him does it matter to any one whether i go or stay she asked in a slightly tremulous voice the only surprise that deerhurst betrayed was shown in the narrowing of his cold eyes he studied her penetratingly for a moment then he spoke again very quietly mrs milbank he said can you ask that question in good faith a faint touch of last night's embarrassment wavered across her mind, but this time she swept it defiantly aside. Yes, I mean it. She turned and again looked up into his face. And am I to answer in good faith? She bent her head, still looking at him. 
then judging by the one case of which i can confidently speak yes distinctly yes there was a pause and clodagh gave a faint laugh and whose is the one case her voice sounded cool high even slightly indifferent it piqued deerhurst to a further step he answered her question with another mrs milbank he said have you ever heard of Circe? Again she laughed. My education was extensive, if very intermittent, she said. Yes, I have heard of Circe and her wild beasts. He echoed the laugh in his thin, expressive voice. I see the implication, but I would willingly play even wild beasts to your Circe. He bent over her chair. She drew away with a slight sharp movement, but he did not alter his position. Do you know that a man would follow you? anywhere 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 he let his hand glide softly from the back of the chair to her shoulder at the touch of his fingers she slipped away from him with a noiseless movement and rose to her feet then follow me back to the salon she said in a voice that still sounded high and light there was a constrained pause but it was one of short duration deerhurst was not the man to be easily taken at a disadvantage for one instant a glimmering of chagrin showed on his composed face, the next it was gone. He straightened his dignified figure and felt mechanically for his eyeglass. "'Pon my word,' he said, "'I believe you are, Circe. Use your prerogative.' He turned, laughed a little, and indicated the salon with a courtly gesture. Clodagh looked at him. He puzzled and disconcerted her. To one whose innate instinct was a yielding to impulse, his absolute impassivity in face of disconcerting situations was something incomprehensible. And now, as he stepped aside to give her passage, she gave a quick laugh, expressive of both embarrassment and relief, and crossed the balcony with a certain instinctive haste. During their absence the crowd in the salon had increased. The press about the roulette table had become denser while at half a dozen card-tables sheltered from the general gathering by large screens of old Italian leatherwork, parties of four were playing bridge. Ignoring these latter groups, Clodagh crossed the room towards the roulette table and paused upon the outskirts of the crowd that surrounded it. Deerhurst, following her closely, narrowed his eyes with a touch of interest as he saw that, either by intention or accident, she had halted beside Sir Walter Gore. "'Well,' he said in his thin, satirical voice as he gained her side, "'well, shall we combine forces as we did last night? I brought you luck, remember?' She turned upon him almost sharply. "'No,' she said, "'no, I don't play roulette.' At the vehemence of her denial he raised his eyebrows, and Sir Walter Gore looked round. Seeing the speaker an involuntary gleam of surprise crossed his face. "'Surely you are not so unfashionable as to disapprove of gambling, Mrs. Milbank?' he asked. Clodagh raised her eyes, and this time her glance was free from coquetry. "'I have not been fashionably brought up,' she said. "'Indeed.' The surprise, and with it a reluctant interest, deepened in Gore's glance, but his eyes wandered doubtfully over her dress. Invariably quick to follow a train of thought, she gave a short, comprehending laugh. "'Oh, I know what you are thinking of,' she cried. "'I don't look as if I belong to the wilds. People never understand that dressing is a knack that comes to women and does not really mean anything.' He smiled, amused against his will. Again she laughed, like a child who has been praised. "'Oh, it's quite true,' she added. "'I can tell you of dozens of cases.' But the flow of confidence was suddenly terminated. Valentine Sarah called, catching sight of her through the throng of people, had made a hasty way towards her. His finely cut colorless face was animated, and his dark gray eyes looked excited. "'How do you do? How do you do, Mrs. Milbank?' he exclaimed. "'Please congratulate me. I've had a run of luck. Netted seventy pounds.' Clodagh's lips parted. Seventy pounds,' she said breathlessly, and instinctively she turned to Gore. But Gore's place was empty." At Sarah Call's approach he had moved unostentatiously away. At the knowledge that he was gone a sense of disappointment fell upon her. She glanced uncertainly at Deerhurst. The old peer, who had been a cynical observer of the little scene, gave a thin laugh. 
"'Our friend Gore is fearful of contamination,' he said, glancing at his nephew. Sarah called laughed. "'Gore,' he said contemptuously. "'Oh, Gore and I never did chum up. But where have you been hiding yourself all day?' He turned again to Clodagh. "'We have had dark suspicions that old Barney has been buying up your society with stock exchange tips. Come now, confess.' He paused and laughed, looking with intent admiration into her expressive face. And Clodagh, sailing upon the tide of present things, elated by the eager interest of two men, and excited by the grudging interest of a third, forgot that for every frail craft such as hers there is an ultimate harbor to be gained, a future to be reckoned with. She lifted her head, met Serikald's searching glance, and echoed his inconsequent laugh. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 the next day Clodagh made one of a party to the Lido, and the same night accompanied Lady Frances Hope, Deerhurst, and Serikald to a theatre. But on neither occasion did she meet or even see Sir Walter Gore. On the afternoon of the second day, however, he again appeared upon the scene of her interest and in an unexpected manner. The hour was six, and she, with Barnard and Milbank, was seated on the hotel terrace chatting desultorily in the warmth of the early evening. While they talked a gondola glided up to the hotel steps, and in the glow of the waning sun they saw Gore step from the boat, pause to give some order to the gondolier, then mount the stone steps. They all three saw him simultaneously. Clodagh, to her own annoyance, colored, and Barnard smiled in his observant quizzical fashion. I didn't tell you that Gore was coming to see me this afternoon, Mrs. Milbank, he said in an undertone. I had a fancy that you might run away. The flush on Clodagh's face deepened. Run away, she exclaimed in angry haste. But Bernard rose without replying and went forward to meet his visitor. Having greeted his host, Gore turned to Clodagh. How do you do, Mrs. Milbank, he said, raising his hat. Then he looked interrogatively at Milbank. Barnard made a sweeping gesture. "'My dear old friend Mr. James Milbank,' he said. "'James, Sir Walter Gore.' Milbank looked up quickly, and the younger man held out his hand with a pleasant touch of cordiality. "'How do you do, sir?' he said. "'Are you making a long stay in Venice?' With a friendly movement he pulled forward one of the wicker chairs and seated himself beside Milbank. Clodagh, leaning far back in her own long, low seat, looked at him curiously. Unconsciously the remembrance of Serikald's careless manner upon a similar occasion of first introduction recurred to her mind, coupled with the knowledge of Barnard's contemptuous idea of her husband, his fads, and his peculiarities. What could this man see to attract him in a dry archaeologist of twice his age? She found herself waiting intently for his next remark, his next action. Are you making a long stay? he repeated, settling himself in his chair. Milbank, surprised and pleased at the unexpected attention, sat up stiffly in his seat. Oh, no, he said, no, we are leaving in three or four days. I am interested in antiquity, and should, properly speaking, be in Sicily at the present moment. Perhaps you have heard of the very remarkable researches that are being carried on there? Gore smiled. No, I'm afraid I must confess ignorance. I know disgracefully little about the past. Barnard, hearing a dissertation from Milbank, interrupted with a laugh. I'm afraid most of us find the present more alluring. He cast a swift glance at Clodagh. But Clodagh, still annoyed with him, and with herself, still puzzled by Gore's attitude, lifted her head sharply. At least, she said, we can be sure that the present is genuine. Gore turned and looked at her. "'Are you quite sure of that, Mrs. Milbank?' he asked quietly. "'Don't you think there is trickery and deception in the manufacture of many things besides the antique?' Her glance faltered. "'I have seen a lot of unauthentic relics,' she said with a touch of obstinacy, "'and I a lot of unauthentic life.' He looked at her with a slight smile. The smile stung her unreasonably. "'Some people can never become connoisseurs,' she retorted quickly. Gore laughed, but without offense. Not of treasures, perhaps, but with experience and observation surely anyone can become a judge of men 
and women. Clodagh forced herself to smile. You disapprove of women. Disapprove? Indeed, no. But here Barnard interposed with one of his suave gestures. He only disapproves of the modern woman, Mrs. Milbank. Gore turned to him good-humouredly. Wrong, Barnard, he said. I admire the modern woman, the truly modern woman. It is the society woman of any period that I lose patience with. Barnard smiled. The present-day woman is very proud of her complex life, he said smoothly, her big car debts and her little intrigues. Gore's healthy face turned a shade redder. I know, he said tersely, but to me, a woman with no higher ambition than the playing of cards winter and summer, afternoon after afternoon, is, is pitiable. Clodagh leant forward. Perhaps they play cards because they have no real interests. He looked at her quickly. And why have they no real interests, Mrs. Milbank? Isn't it because they reject all simple, natural, wholesome things? Such women do not know the meaning of the word home. They do not want a home or home life as the women of the last generation understood it. Ah, there you touch bottom, my dear Gore. There you are in your depth. Again Barnard gave one of his smooth, tactful laughs. This young man has a great pull over us, Mrs. Milbank, when he compares the present generation with the past. At the suave words Gore made a slightly embarrassed gesture and looked instinctively towards Milbank. Forgive my tirade, sir, he said a little confusedly. Mr. Barnard is right. I have rather a high ideal of womanhood. I am possessed of a, a very remarkable mother. A mother? Clodagh looked round impulsively. Oh, tell me what she is like. With a certain spontaneity, Gore turned to respond to her question. But before his eyes met hers, their glance was intercepted by a shrewd, amused, inquiring look from Barnard. The effect of the look was strange. His emotion, so suddenly aroused, died suddenly. His face became passive, even a little cold. He straightened his shoulders and gave the restrained, self-conscious laugh that the Englishman resorts to when he feels that his sentiments have entrapped him. "'Oh, you must not ask me what my mother is like, Mrs. Milbank,' he said. "'I could not give you an unbiased opinion. As it is, I have been wasting your time unpardonably. Barnard, do you think Mrs. Milbank will excuse you for ten minutes?' Barnard rose slowly. "'Do not put me to the pain of saying yes,' he exclaimed. Let me imagine that I am tearing myself away from Mrs. Milbank's express desire. Au revoir, Mrs. Milbank. Au revoir, James. He nodded and sauntered off in the direction of the hotel door. A moment later Gore shook hands silently with Clodagh and her husband and moved away in the same direction. As he disappeared into the hotel, Milbank folded his newspaper with interested haste. What a well-mannered young man, he said. Who is he? what is his name? Clodagh was sitting very still, her hands clasped in her lap, her eyes fixed upon some distant object. Gore, she said suddenly, Gore, Sir Walter Gore. Gore, Milbank repeated the name as though it pleased him, a fine young fellow, very unlike the majority of young men of the present day. Clodagh said nothing. Don't you agree with me, my dear? As if by an effort she recalled her wandering gaze, turned her head slowly, and looked at her husband. "'He... he certainly seems unlike other people,' she admitted in a low voice. After this rejoinder there was silence. Clodagh, her brows drawn together in a perplexed frown, relapsed into her former absorbed contemplation, while Milbank, having changed his position once or twice, shook out the sheets of his newspaper and buried himself in the lengthy report of a scientific meeting but scarcely had he reached the end of his first paragraph than a large shadow fell across the page, and looking up quickly he saw the ponderous figure of Mr. Angelo Tombs. At the sight of his hero he started, colored with pleasure, and rose hastily. "'Mr. Tombs!' he exclaimed. "'Clodagh, my dear, here is Mr. Tombs!' Clodagh turned without enthusiasm and looked at the loose figure and unkempt hair of the scientist. I do not think you and my my wife had met, Mr. Toombs. Milbank broke in with a nervous attempt at geniality. Mr. Toombs bowed. No, but I have many times seen Mrs. Milbank, he said ponderously. 
Floda bent her head, noting with the fastidious intolerance of youth that his clothes were baggy and his hands unclean. Milbank gave a nervous conciliatory laugh. I, I have noticed that great men are always observant, he said jocularly. Mr. Toombs smiled. That is scarcely a compliment to Mrs. Milbank, he interposed consciously. Cloda looked up and met his eyes. I don't wish to be paid compliments, Mr. Toombs, she said. Please don't try to think of any. Did you come to take my husband out? Mr. Toombs stammered, visibly crestfallen. Well, he began, there is a certain archway in one of the smaller churches which I think Mr. Milbank ought to see. But as an archway is not too weighty for a lady's consideration, it struck me, it occurred to me, but Cloda cut him short. Oh, Mr. Toombs, I'm much too frivolous even for archways. Don't take me into your calculations. I should only spoil them. Of course it's very kind of you, she added with tardy remorse but the experiment would be a failure. Ask my husband. Milbank looked distressed. Oh, my dear, he began. But Clodagh's nerves were jarred. I know, she broke in, I know it's awfully kind of Mr. Toombs, but I couldn't go to see an archway today. I couldn't, I really, really couldn't. Mr. Toombs relapsed into a state of pompous offense. Milbank looked from one to the other in nervous misery. Certainly not, certainly not, my dear, he agreed. You are tired. You have been doing too much. He peered at her through the softly falling twilight with a look of helpless concern. She felt rather than saw the look, and that sensitive dread of being rendered conspicuous that attacks us all in early life caused her to shrink into herself. Nonsense, she said a little coldly. I am perfectly well. Please go and see Mr. Toombs' archway. I don't mind being left alone. I would like to be left alone. Milbank stirred uneasily. "'Of course, my dear, if you wish it,' he murmured. "'Mr. Toombs, shall we—' "'Are you ready?' He waved his hand towards the canal. Mr. Toombs drew his loose limbs together and bowed formally to Clodagh. "'Certainly, if you wish it, Mr. Milbank,' he said stiffly, and walked off along the terrace. Milbank did not follow him at once. He stood looking at his wife in pained uncertainty. Clodagh, my dear, he began at last, if there is anything I can do. But Clodagh turned away. No, she said almost inaudibly. No, there is nothing. I'd like to be alone. I want to be alone. And Milbank, perplexed, embarrassed, vaguely unhappy, turned slowly and walked across the terrace after his scientific friend. Clodagh waited until the last sound of Mr. Toombs's loud rolling voice had melted into the distance with the departure of his gondola. Then with a stiff tired movement she rose, walked in her own turn across the terrace, and leaning upon the stone parapet gazed out into the purple twilight as she had gazed on the evening of her first arrival. How long ago, how infinitely far away that first arrival seemed to her! With the capacity for the assimilation of new emotions that belongs to all her race, she had lived more keenly during the last three days than during the preceding four years. To one of her temperament, life is not a matter of time, but of experience. At eighteen she had been a child. On her twenty-second birthday she had been a girl. And now, when that birthday was passed by but a few months, she was conscious of the stirring of her womanhood roused into swift activity by the first approach of the world with its men and women, its laxities and prejudices, its infinite potentialities for good or evil. Some vague foreshadowing of this idea was casting itself across her mind when the thread of her musings was suddenly broken by a quick step sounding across the deserted terrace, and with a slight involuntary movement she straightened herself and brought her hands together upon the cold surface of the parapet. Sir Walter Gore had parted with Barnard in the hall of the hotel, and now he crossed the terrace quickly, conscious of the last falling twilight. He was close to the flight of stone steps that led to the water before the flutter of Clodagh's light dress caught his preoccupied attention. Seeing her, he paused and raised his hat. "'You look very mysterious, Mrs. Milbank,' he said. "'Has your husband gone indoors?' Clodagh felt herself color. Unreasonably, and seemingly inexplicably, the motion of Milbank's name jarred upon her. "'My husband has gone to see an archway in one of the churches,' she said with a tinge of sharpness. 
caught by the inflection of her voice, Gore looked at her more closely through the gathering dusk. "'And you do not share his taste for the antique?' She turned towards him, her eyes alight with a sharp, cold brightness. "'I hate the antique,' she said with sudden vehemence. Almost against his will, Gore looked at her again. "'And yet you come from Ireland. Isn't everything there very old?' For an instant she looked away across the darkening waters, then her glance flashed back to his. "'Yes, old,' she said passionately, "'but so naturally old that its age is not thrust upon you. Where I come from there is a ruined chapel on the edge of a cliff that dates from the fourth century, and at the present day the peasants pray there, just as their ancestors prayed centuries and centuries ago. They don't stare at it and read about it and write about it like the antiquarians do. They pray there. The chapel isn't a curiosity to them. It's a part of their lives. Gore was silent. An unconquerable surprise, a reluctant fascination, held him chained, forgetful of the gathering darkness and of the gondola that awaited him at the foot of the steps. As he stood hesitatingly, Clodagh spoke again. Don't you believe that things should be lived, not merely looked at? she asked, her voice low and tense. Almost unconsciously, the desire to interest this man, to win his attention, to compel him to share her opinions had sprung into her mind. Gore answered her with directness. No, he said, all things cannot be lived. His voice was quiet and controlled. The pose of his body, the look in his eyes, all suggested a tempered strength, a curbed vitality. The desire to dominate him rose higher, overshadowing every other sensation in Clodagh's brain. She stepped nearer to him, her hand resting on the stone balustrade, her body bending forward. "'Don't you think that when life is so very short we are justified in taking all we can, when we can?' Her warm lips were parted, her eyes shone with an added light. She was walking on the edge of an abyss with the ardor of one whose gaze is fixed upon the sun. But Gore, seeing only the abyss, girded on his armor. No, he said slowly and deliberately, no, that has never been my standpoint. Then you refuse the good things of life when they come your way? Good is a very elastic word. He was fencing, and she realized it. With a subtle change of tone she made a fresh essay. Isn't the meaning of every word merely a matter of inflection? He hesitated. I, I suppose so, he admitted guardedly. She smiled suddenly, looking up into his face. Then to me the word good means all that is warm and light and happy, and to you it means something cold or unattainable? Indeed, no, you have made a wrong deduction. Well, what does it mean to you? Mean? I, I am not sure that I can tell you. Perhaps you have not found the meaning. Perhaps not. But you are seeking for it? He laughed a little constrainedly. I may be, unconsciously. Again she averted her eyes and turned towards the mysterious canal. Now I understand one thing, she said in a soft, slow voice. What is that? Gore was curious, despite himself. Why they call you Sir Galahad? There was a moment of silence. His face flushed, then turned cold. Indeed, he said stiffly. And if it is not indiscreet, may I ask who calls me Sir Galahad? At the tone of his voice, Clodagh wheeled round. "'Didn't you know?' she asked. "'I thought, oh, I was sure you knew.' He laughed. "'No,' he said with elaborate indifference. "'No. To whom am I indebted for the name?' But his companion was silent. Acutely conscious of having struck a wrong note, she felt angry with herself. Angry with him. "'Who gave me the name?' he asked again. "'I had better not say. I thought you knew of it then I am at liberty to guess. It was Lord Deerhurst. His tone was curt, even contemptuous. Clodagh flushed. It seemed as if, by a subtle insinuation, he had scorned her. And if it was Lord Deerhurst? she asked sharply. Gore made an exclamation of contempt. You dislike Lord Deerhurst? He shrugged his shoulders. You dislike Lord Deerhurst? She was persistent, remembering keenly and uncomfortably the favor she had shown the old peer in his presence the night before. Gore gave a short indifferent laugh, and the sound galled her. "'Lord Deerhurst is a friend of mine,' she said unwisely. 
he bent his head with a stiff movement. "'If I have transgressed,' he said, "'please forgive me. I have already trespassed on your time. Good-bye. Perhaps we shall meet later at the Palazzo Ugaccini.' His voice was cold and very reserved. The blood beat hotly and uncomfortably in Clodagh's veins, but she raised her head and answered in a voice as indifferent as his own. "'Good-bye. It is quite possible that you may see me at the Palazzo Ugaccini, but I can't promise more.' Gathering up her light skirt she turned and walked across the terrace to the door of the hotel. Gore stood and watched her until the last gleam of her dress was lost in the lighted hall. Then slowly, thoughtfully, almost reluctantly, he began his descent of the steps. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 Clodagh's mood was inexplicable even to herself as she entered the hotel, ran upstairs to her own room, and began to dress for dinner. She changed her dress with an almost feverish haste, giving herself no time for thought, and then, scarcely waiting to take a final look into the mirror, left the room and hurried down into the hall. There she encountered Barnard. "'I have just been speaking to your husband,' he said, greeting her with a smile. He has been lured into attending some secret conclave of Italian scientists. He asked me to make his excuses to you. Clodagh's glance fell. Oh, she said with a curious little inflection of the voice. Of course he knew that you were going out tonight. Oh, yes, of course. She kept her lashes lowered. Barnard smiled. Mrs. Milbank, he exclaimed in a cheerful voice, suppose we have a gay evening. Lord Deerhurst has asked me to dine with him and Sarah called at the Abadi. Let's form an even party. The old man will be absolutely charmed, and you have never dined at a restaurant. Say I may arrange it. For a moment longer Clodagh studied the ground. Then very quickly she raised her eyes, and in their depths Barnard read a new expression. After all, she said tentatively, why shouldn't we take what comes our way? He extended his hands. Why, indeed! let me spread the good news again she let her lashes droop very well she said very well say that i want to enjoy myself the dignified and placid serenity of venice had been intruded upon that season by the establishment of a fashionable dining place which under the name of the abadi restaurant had taken up its position in a beautiful old house on one of the narrower waterways its distance from clodagh's hotel was short and the journey thither, taken in Lord Deerhurst's gondola, in company with the old peer, Seracald, and Barnard, occupied but a few minutes. Clodagh's first impression on gliding up the still dark waterway and stepping out upon the time-worn garden steps was one of delight. As she stood for a moment in the shadow of the ancient wall, above which the treetops rose, casting black reflections into the water that ran beneath them, she was conscious of the subtle touch of the warm night wind upon her face, of the subtle poetry in the scent of unseen flowers, of the subtle invitation conveyed by the long row of lighted windows seen through a screen of magnolias. She had momentarily forgotten her companions when Deerhurst, the last to leave the gondola, stepped softly to her side. "'This appeals to you?' he said. She started slightly at his unexpected nearness. Then, with a quick impetuosity, she responded to his questions. "'I think it is exquisite,' she said. "'The light through the trees suggests such wonderful, mysterious things.' He smiled under cover of the darkness. "'It suggests an enchanting banquet. Let us find the presiding genius.' He laid his fingers lightly on her arm and guided her up the long, dim garden. Followed by Sarah called and Barnard, they traversed the shadowy pathways and emerged upon an open space of lawn that fronted the house. Three or four of the private rooms were already occupied, and with the faint streams of light that poured from their open windows came the pleasant murmuring of talk and laughter. As the little party stepped into the radius of this light a stately personage came forward deferentially, and recognizing Deerhurst made a profound bow. The old nobleman nodded amiably, as to an acquaintance of long standing, and drawing the man aside, addressed him in French. The explanation was brief, and almost at once Deerhurst turned back to his companions. "'Come, Mrs. Milbank,' he said, "'our friend Abadi 
proves amenable to persuasion, he will give us his prettiest room, though we are unexpected guests. Clodagh stepped forward with eager curiosity. "'I never thought a restaurant could be like this,' she said. "'Very few of them are, Mrs. Milbank,' murmured Barnard, close behind her. "'The usual restaurant is an ostentatious place of white enamel, palms, and lights, where a hundred tongues are vainly endeavouring to drown a band. This little corner will scarcely outlive another season. It's too perfect, too quiet to find favour with the crowd.' It was opened under the patronage, rather, at the suggestion, of Prince Munoff, a Sybarite millionaire temporarily out of sorts with Paris. But now Paris smiles once more. Munoff has wearied of Venice, and poor Abadi begins to tremble. Clodagh looked round. But could anything so exquisite be a failure? Easily, my dear lady. People like to eat their expensive dinners where others can comment on their extravagance it's a very vulgar world. The three men laughed, and Clodagh, slightly distressed, slightly puzzled, stepped through the wide hall to the room that Deerhurst indicated. It was a small chamber, long and narrow in shape. The walls were paneled in faded brocade, and the lights were shrouded in silk of some soft hue. The floor was covered with a carpet in which wreathed roses formed the chief design, and the furniture consisted of one oval table, four beautiful old chairs, and a couple of ancient French mirrors. As Deerhurst stepped forward to relieve Clodagh of her cloak, four waiters entered noiselessly, and almost immediately dinner was served. It was a dinner such as Prince Minoff would have delighted in. There was nothing tedious, nothing monotonous in the six or seven courses that comprised its menu. Each stimulated and gratified the appetite without a hint of satiety. It was an Epicurean feast, and it was interesting to study the varying ways in which the guest responded to its appeal. Barnard, placid man of the world, indulgent connoisseur of all the luxuries, openly lingered over the delights of the meal. Sarah called ate quickly and almost greedily, as many men of slight build and thin sensual faces do eat. Dear Hurst alone toyed with his food giving serious attention to nothing beyond the dry toast with which he was kept supplied, while Clodagh, young enough and healthy enough to have an appetite that needed no tempting, frankly enjoyed her dinner without at all comprehending its excellence. During the first portion of the meal conversation was fitful and impersonal, but as the waiters left the table to carry in one of the last dishes the tone of the intercourse underwent a change. Deerhurst turned to Clodagh with a sudden gesture of concern and intimacy. "'I see you do not endorse my choice of wine,' he said in a gently solicitous voice. She looked up with slight confusion, then looked down at her untouched glass, in which the champagne bubbles were rapidly subsiding. "'I—I I never drink champagne,' she said a little diffidently. "'Oh, Mrs. Milbank, and my poor uncle has been sacking the Abadi cellars for this particular vintage.' Saracald glanced up quickly and almost reproachfully. Barnard laughed as he blissfully drained his own glass. "'You are very unkind, Mrs. Milbank,' he murmured. "'You make one feel such a deplorable worldling.' But Deerhurst looked round towards a waiter who was re-entering the room. "'Bring this lady another glass and some more champagne,' he said. Clodagh turned to him sharply and apprehensively. But he touched her wrist with his fingertips. Please, he said in his thin, high-bred voice, please, I want you to taste this wine. I generally have some difficulty in getting it outside my own house. His pale, far-seeing eyes rested on her face, and it seemed to her excited fancy that their glance supplemented his words, that as plainly as eyes could speak they added the suggestion that some day she might honor that house with her presence. The idea confused her. She turned away from him in slight uneasiness, and at the same moment one of the waiters filled her long Venetian glass with a light golden wine. "'To please me,' Deerhurst murmured again, "'to please me.' She looked round, confused and still embarrassed, gave one unsteady, yielding laugh, then lifted the glass. "'If, if I must,' she said deprecatingly. Barnard and Saracald smiled, and Deerhurst raised his own glass. To the next occasion upon which you consent to be my guest, he said with a profound and impressive bow. 
On the surface this incident seems scarcely worth recording. Yet for Clodagh it marked an epoch, an epoch not evolved through yielding to her host's persuasions, not evolved through drinking a single glass of unfamiliar wine, but evolved through the fact that one item in the sum of her prejudices had gone down before that potent fetish, the dread of appearing conspicuous. With her action a fleeting shadow of self-distrust fell across her mind, but she swept it aside as she had previously swept the memory of her interview with Gore. Deep within her lay the specious knowledge that, for her, this bright existence was only transitory, that somewhere behind the lights and music and laughter lay her own individual groove to which she must return like a modern Cinderella when the enchanted interlude of brilliant days was ended and in this knowledge lay the secret of her greed for joy. Certain of the monotony to come, she caught passionately at every proffered pleasure. Ten o'clock had struck before the little party left the restaurant, and although she had drunk no more champagne and had refused the liquors that had been served with coffee, her eyes were excitedly bright as she stepped from the gondola at the steps of the Palazzo Ugaccini. Mounting the marble stairs with Deerhurst close behind her, she was filled with an exhilarating sense of confidence in herself, of defiance towards the world at large. The memory of the afternoon when she had stood on the dark terrace and listened to Gore's contemptuous voice had left her or remained only as a spur to her enthusiasm. The animation, the zest for pleasure was plainly visible in her eyes as she entered the salon and went forward towards her hostess. And Lady Frances Hope, looking round at sound of her guest's names, saw this peculiar expression with a stirring of curiosity. "'Where have you all been?' she asked as she took Clodagh's hand. Barnard laughed. "'We are shocking truants,' he said gaily. "'We have been dining at the Abadi.' She looked at him quickly. "'All four of you?' she asked shrewdly. He smiled. "'You have a suspicious mind, Francis. Yes, all four of us.' Lady Francis laughed. No, she said, I never harbor suspicions. It is Mrs. Milbank's air of having just discovered some delicious secret that is always prompting me to curiosity. How do you manage to look so triumphant? She turned again to Clodagh with a long puzzled glance. I wish you would impart the secret. Clodagh's bright eyes met hers. My father used to say that the secret of happiness is never to look beyond the present hour. A philosopher, murmured Deerhurst. I should say a bold man. Bernard looked from the old nobleman to his hostess. But almost as he spoke the name of Sir Walter Gore was announced, and Lady Frances looked sharply towards the door. With a quiet, unembarrassed bearing, Gore crossed the salon. As he approached the little group, Lady Frances stepped towards him with outstretched hands. "'How nice of you,' she said softly. "'I began to fear you had forgotten about tonight.' He took her hand calmly. "'But I had promised to come,' he said simply, and at the words his eyes turned involuntarily towards Clodagh. "'Good evening, Mrs. Milbank,' he added in the same level voice. At his glance and his words Clodagh's expression changed. The vague excitement of the past hours seemed suddenly to focus itself. She realized abruptly that she had not yet vindicated her right to the joy of life. With exaggerated difference she bent her head in acknowledgment of his greeting, and almost immediately turned to Deerhurst. "'Lord Deerhurst,' she said very softly and distinctly, "'I want you to do me a favor tonight. I want you to teach me to play roulette.' It was her declaration of war, the moment towards which she had unconsciously been tending ever since the interview of the afternoon. She knew it instantly the words had left her lips, knew it by the quick surprise in Barnard's eyes, the sharp curiosity in Lady Frances' hopes, the veiled triumph in Deerhurst, and the cold disapprobation in Sir Walter Gore's. Without another glance she turned away and walked slowly forward across the salon to where a couple of dozen people were grouped about the roulette table. As she moved deliberately forward many heads were turned in her direction, but she was heedless and almost unobservant of the interest she evoked her heart was beating fast, she was rejoicing recklessly in her vindicated independence. Deerhurst overtook her as she halted by the roulette table, and she was conscious of his presence without looking round. "'Will you stake for me?' she said in a quick undertone. 
You were lucky the other night. He stepped forward, smiling with a cold touch of wisdom, and took the coin she handed to him. What? A convert! cried Luard, who was again officiating at the game. Luck to you, Mrs. Milbank. He gave a pleasant laugh as her coin touched the table, and a moment later set the ball spinning. Clodagh waited, holding her breath. The ball slackened speed, hesitated over the gaily painted board, and finally dropped into its place. There was a general laugh of excitement. The little crowd pressed closer to the table, and she saw her coin swept into Luard's hands. The incident was eventful. Quite suddenly the color leaped into her face and her eyes blazed. In total unconsciousness of self she stepped forward to the table. Deerhurst, closely watchful of her, moved to her side. "'Shall I stake again?' he asked in a whisper. But she did not turn her head. "'No, no,' she cried. "'I'll stake for myself.' Her voice sounded distant and absorbed. It seemed in that brief moment that she had forgotten her companion and herself. Thrice she staked, and thrice lost, but the losses whetted her desires. She played boldly, with a certain reckless grace born of complete unconsciousness. At last fortune favored her, and she won. Deerhurst, still standing close beside her, saw the expression of her face, saw the careless, the almost inconsequent air with which she accepted her spoils, and noting both, he touched her arm. "'You are a true gambler,' he said very softly. "'You care nothing for gain or loss. You play for the play's sake.' and Clodagh, with her mind absorbed and her eyes on the roulette board, gave a quick, high-pitched, unthinking laugh. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 At nine o'clock on the night following her first venture into the world of gambling, Clodagh was again standing by the roulette table in Lady Frances Hope's salon. She had been playing for two hours with luck persistently against her but no one who had chanced to glance at her eager, excited face would have imagined even for a moment that the collection of coins in her gold purse was dwindling and not increasing. Deerhurst had been correct in his deductions. She played for the play's sake. The losing game, the hazardous game, was the one which appealed to and absorbed her. The savor of risk stimulated her. The faint sense of danger lifted her to an enchanted realm and on this night she made an unconsciously picturesque figure as she stood fascinated by the chances of the play. Her face flushed, her eyes intensely bright, her fingers restlessly eager to make their stakes. Round about her was gathered a little group of interested and admiring men, Deerhurst, Luard, Seracold, and a couple of young Americans who had come to Venice with introductions to Lady Frances Hope but on none of them did she bestow more than a preoccupied attention. She permitted them to stand beside her. She laughed softly at their compliments and their jests. But her eyes and her thoughts were unmistakably for the painted board over which Barnard was presiding. Another half-dozen rounds of the game were played. Then suddenly she turned away from the table with a quick laugh. "'The end,' she said to Sarah Kalt, who was standing nearest to her and with a quick gesture she held up the gold-netted purse, now limp and empty. With an eager movement he stepped forward. "'Let me be useful,' he whispered quickly. "'Or me. I represent your husband, you know.' Barnard leant across the roulette table. "'Oh, come, Barney, I spoke first. But Clodagh looked smilingly from one to the other, and shook her head. "'No, no,' she said hastily. "'I—I I never borrow money.' Sarah called, looked obviously disappointed. "'Nonsense, Mrs. Milbank,' he began. But Deerhurst intervened. "'If Mrs. Milbank does not wish it, Valentine,' he murmured soothingly, "'Mrs. Milbank, let me take you out of temptation.' He bowed to Clodagh, and courteously made a passage for her through the crowd that surrounded them. If any cynical remembrance of her first vehement repudiation of the suggestion that she should gamble rose now to confute her newer denial, no shadow of it was visible in his face. As they freed themselves from the group of players, they paused simultaneously and looked for a moment round the large cool salon about which the elder or more serious of the assembly were scattered for conversation or cards. Neither spoke, but after a moment's wait Deerhurst turned his pale eyes in the direction of the open windows 
and by the faintest lifting of his eyebrows conveyed a question. Clodagh laughed, then silently bent her head, and a moment later they moved forward together across the polished floor. As they passed one of the many groups of statuary that brightened the more shadowed portion of the room, she caught a glimpse of her hostess, once again in conversation with Sir Walter Gore, and she was conscious in that fleeting moment of Gore's clear, reflective eyes resting on her in a quick regard. With a swift, almost defiant movement she lifted her head and turned ostentatiously to Deerhurst. "'Is it to be philosophy tonight? she asked in a low, soft voice. He paused and looked at her, his cold, pale eyes slow and searching in their regard. "'Not tonight, Circe, he said almost below his breath. Clodagh colored, gave another quick, excited laugh, and moving past him stepped through one of the open windows. Gaining the balcony she did not as usual drop into one of the deep lounge chairs, but moving forward stood by the iron railing and looked down upon the quiet canal. The night was exceptionally clear, even for Italy. Every star was reflected in the smooth dark waters, while over the opposite places a crescent moon hung like a slender reaping hook extended from heaven to garner some mystic harvest. For a moment Deerhurst hesitated to disturb her, but at last, waving his scruples, he went softly forward and stood beside her. "'Are you offended?' he asked in a very low voice. "'No.' Her answer came almost absently, her eyes were fixed upon the moon. "'Then sad. I don't know. Perhaps.' He drew a little nearer. "'And why sad?' She gave a quick sigh and turned from the glories of the night. "'I have only two days more in Venice. Isn't that reason for being sad?' but why leave Venice? My husband is leaving. He smiled faintly. And is he such a tyrant that you must go where he goes? She laughed involuntarily. A tyrant, she said. Oh, no, I can scarcely say he is a tyrant. Then why do you go with him? She looked round for a moment, then her eyes returned to the pageant of the sky. Why does one do anything? She said suddenly in a changed voice. With a quick movement Deerhurst leant forward over the railing and looked into her face. "'Usually we do things because we must,' he said softly. "'But compulsion is not always disagreeable. Sometimes we are compelled to action by our own desires.' Clodagh, conscious of his close regard, felt her breath come a little quicker. But she did not change her position. She did not cease to study the sky." She knew that his arm was all but touching hers. She was sensitive to the faint and costly perfume that emanated from his clothes. But she felt these things vaguely, impersonally, as items in a drama unconnected with herself. When his next words came it was curiosity rather than dread that stirred in her mind. It is my desires that are forcing me to speak now, the desire to see you again after you leave Venice the desire to see more of you than a mere acquaintance sees, to be something more than a mere friend. Clodagh still looked intently at the stars, but unconsciously her lips parted. Why? she asked below her breath, and it seemed to her that the word was not spoken by her, but by someone else. With an eager gesture Deerhurst extended his hand, and his long pale fingers closed over her own. Then out across the darkness and the silence of the balcony floated the strong, decisive voice of Lady Frances Hope. "'Lord Deerhurst,' it called. "'Lord Deerhurst, so sorry, but Rose wants you to give an expert opinion upon one point in a game of bridge. It won't take two minutes.' The voice faded away as its owner moved back into the room. At the sound of his name Deerhurst had drawn himself erect. Now, bending forward silently and swiftly, he lifted the hand he was still holding and kissed it vehemently. The next moment he had crossed the balcony and entered the salon. Left alone, Clodagh stood motionless. With a vivid physical consciousness she could still feel the pressure of his cold lips upon her hand, but her mental sensations were benumbed. That something had occurred she dimly realized, that some point some climax had been reached she was vaguely aware, but what its personal bearing upon her own life might be she made no attempt to guess. With a dazed mind she gazed out across the quiet canal, striving to marshal her ideas. 
For several seconds she stood in this state of mental confusion. Then, with disconcerting suddenness, a new incident obtruded itself upon her mind. With a violent start she became conscious that someone had passed through the open window and was coming towards her across the balcony. She turned sharply, but as she did so her fingers slipped from the railing and all thought of Deerhurst's kiss was banished from her mind. With a sense of acute surprise she recognized the figure of Sir Walter Gore. Taking no notice of her dismayed silence, he came quietly forward. "'Good evening, Mrs. Milbank,' he said. "'Have you been enjoying yourself?' With a certain vague confusion she met his gaze. "'Yes,' she answered. "'I—I I suppose so.' There was a short silence, and Gore, moving to the balcony railing, rested his arm upon it. "'It is getting late,' he said. "'Time for all of us to be thinking of our hotels.' Again she looked at him in faint bewilderment. "'Yes, I—I I suppose so,' she said once more. Another pause succeeded her halting words. Then, with a gesture of decision, Gore stood upright, bringing his glance back to her face. "'Mrs. Milbank,' he said suddenly, "'let me take you home. I have a gondola waiting at the steps.' The words were so totally unexpected that Clodagh remained mute, and leaning forward looked down into the heavy shadows cast by the ancient palace. There was a strange sensation of triumph in this unlooked-for moment in this sudden capitulation of a man who had previously ignored her, a sensation before which all lesser things, Deerhurst's passion, Seracol's ardor, Barnard's friendship, became meaningless and vague. But Gore, guessing nothing from her bent head, glanced behind him towards the salon. Well, he said, may I be your escort? Under cover of the dusk, Clodagh smiled. Mr. Barnard generally takes me home. Involuntarily Gore's figure stiffened. But, she added in a low, quick whisper, I, I would very much rather go back with you. Under many conditions the words would have seemed bold, but the manner in which she uttered them disarmed criticism. Gore's face relaxed. Then let us make our escape, he said. Lady Frances is settling a bridge dispute, and quite a dozen people have slipped away in the last ten minutes. No one will question which of them has taken you home. And Clodagh gave a short light laugh of sudden pleasure. The small conspiracy made Gore so much more human, drew them so much closer together than they had been before. Yes, yes, she said eagerly, and I am lunching with Lady Frances tomorrow. I can explain then. Yes, quite so. Now, if you are ready. He moved to the window. Very quietly they re entered the salon and a flush crossed Clodagh's face as she saw Deerhurst bending over a card-table with the nearest approach to boredom and impatience she had ever known him to evince. Her heart, already beating to the thought of her new conquest, gave an added leap at this silent evidence of her power. In the corridor outside the salon Gore took her cloak from the servant and himself wrapped it about her as they descended the stairs. Then, passing to the flight of worn steps that led to the water, he signaled to a waiting gondolier. "'Mrs. Milbank,' he said as he offered her his hand, "'I am going to make a strange request. I want to talk to you for half an hour before taking you home. Will you give me leave to make a tour of the canals?' He spoke very quietly and in a tone difficult to construe. At his curious appeal her heart gave another quick excited throb though instinctively she realized that neither Deerhurst, Sarah called, nor Barnard would have proposed a midnight excursion in quite his voice or manner. But the very mode of the request enhanced its charm. She looked up into his face as she laid her hand in his. "'I give you leave,' she said gently. He met her glance but almost immediately averted his eyes, and as he handed her to the seat he turned swiftly to the gondolier addressing him in Italian. The colloquy lasted but a few seconds, and at its conclusion the boat shot silently out into the canal. "'This man does not understand a word of English,' he said, as he dropped into his place by Clodagh's side. Again his words were peculiarly suggestive, and again his tone was curiously frank. Why should he suggest that their conversation was unintelligible, and suggest it in so impersonal a tone? She leant back in her cushioned seat and let her eyelids droop. 
her mind was full of puzzling and delightful thoughts. Never had she tasted the mystery of Venice as she tasted it to-night. Every passing breath of wind, every scent blown from the dark and silent gardens, every distant laugh or broken word was alive with unguessed meanings. The feverish excitement of the past week seemed to fall away. This was romance. This drifting with an inscrutable companion through an unfathomable night. Her eyes closed, she lay almost motionless, filled with an aimless, vague delight. All creation, with all creation's limitless possibilities, lay in the warm darkness that enveloped her. Then, with the instinct of senses newly and sharply astir, she became conscious that Gore was watching her. With a thrill of expectancy and anticipation, she opened her eyes. There is something very curious something subtle and almost intimate in the opening of one's eyes upon the steady scrutiny of another. As Clodagh raised her lids, her glance encountered Gore's, but on the instant that their eyes met, her joy in the moment, her exultant triumph, was suddenly killed, for the look that she surprised was not the look she had anticipated. It was interested, it was attentive, it was grave but it held neither subjugation nor passion. As her brain woke to this realization, she involuntarily raised herself in the cushioned seat. At the same moment her companion leant slightly forward. "'Mrs. Milbank,' he said quickly, "'I have been watching you and thinking about you ever since I came to Venice, and at last I have decided that I must tell you what my thoughts have been. I am not very old, perhaps I have no right to speak, but a man sees a good deal of life, even if he wants to keep his eyes shut, and I have seen a great many people throw away their chances, take the false and refuse the true. I have seen some men do it, and I have seen many women, many, many women. He paused, but he did not look at her. It is a common, everyday occurrence, so common that one generally looks on at it with indifference. But sometimes, just sometimes, one stops to think. One feels the great, great pity of it. He paused again, looking fixedly down at the strip of carpet beneath their feet. Clodagh glanced at him, a swift, searching, almost surreptitious look. There are times when one stops to think. He raised his head and looked at Clodagh, sitting erect and pale, her large eyes wide open, her hands clasped in her lap. There are times when it seems cruel, when it seems a sacrilege to see a girl going down the easy road of lost illusions and callous sentiments. I know this sounds incomprehensible, sounds impertinent, but I cannot help myself. I must tell you what no one else will tell you. I must put out my hand. He paused, but Clodagh did not speak. You are very young. You are very high-spirited. You, you are very attractive and the world is full of people ready, waiting to take advantage of your youth, your high spirits, your attractiveness. You are not fit for this society, for this set that you have drifted into. This set? Isn't it your own set? At last Clodagh's lips parted. He made an impatient gesture. A man has many sets. Her pale face flushed suddenly. I don't think I understand, she said. No, but I am trying to make you understand. I am not disparaging Lady Frances Hope, or her social standing. She is a charming woman, a clever woman, but she is a woman of today. Her pleasures, her ambitions, her friends. Clodagh lifted her head. Her friends, she said faintly, are not the friends for you, for any inexperienced girl. Take them one by one. There is Sarah called, indolent, worthless, vicious. Barnard, decent enough as a man's friend, and as honest as his clients permit him to be, but no proper guide for a girl like you. Deerhurst, but Clodagh checked him. Lord Deerhurst, what about Lord Deerhurst? Her voice was high and strained. Gore made a gesture of contempt. Deerhurst, he began hotly. Then suddenly his tone changed. Mrs. Milbank, he said earnestly, whatever you may say, whatever you may do, I cannot believe that in your heart you are in sympathy with these people whose one object in life is to gamble, 
to gamble with honor, money, emotion, anything, everything that has the savor of risk and the possibility of gain. You have no justification for belonging to these people. You have the good things of life, the things many women are forced to steal, position, a home, a good husband. At the last word Clodagh started violently, and with a quick impulsive movement Gore turned to her afresh. You are intoxicated with life, or what seems to you to be life. You are forgetting realities. I have seen your husband. He is an honest, simple, trustworthy man who loves you. The tone of his voice came to Clodagh with great distinctiveness. It seemed the only living thing in a world that had suddenly become dead. While she had been sitting rigid and erect in the stern of the gondola, everything had altered to her mental vision. Everything had undergone a fundamental change. The purple twilight, the mysterious night scents, the breezes blown in from the lagoon had become intangible, meaningless things. She was conscious of nothing but Gore's clear words, of her own soul stripped of its self-deception. At last, with a faint movement, she turned towards him. "'Take me home.' she said in a numbed voice. I wish to go home. At the words he wheeled round in sudden protest, but as his eyes rested on her cold face a tinge of self-consciousness chilled his zeal. Self-consciousness and the suddenly remembered fact that his own action was, after all, unjustifiable. His own figure suddenly stiffened. As you wish, of course, he said quietly. I suppose my conduct seems quite unpardonable. For one fleeting second an impulse, a desire, crossed Clodagh's face, but as it trembled on the brink of utterance Gore leaned forward in his seat and gave a quick imperative order to the gondolier. A moment later they had glided up a narrow waterway and emerged again upon the great canal. From the door and windows of Clodagh's hotel a stream of light was still pouring out upon the water. As they drew level with the terrace she turned her face away from this searching radiance and rose quickly to her feet. "'Good night,' she said in an almost inarticulate voice. "'Good night. Don't stir. Don't help me.' But Gore had risen also, and in a sudden return of his earlier, more impulsive manner he forgot the self-consciousness that had chilled him. "'Mrs. Milbank,' he said quickly. But Clodagh evaded his eyes, and with a sharp nervous movement shook her head. "'No,' she said. "'No,' don't help me, I don't want any help. Stepping past him with an agile movement, she ran up the steps and across the terrace to the door of the hotel. Obeying a dominant impulse, Gore turned to follow her, but as his foot touched the side of the boat, he paused, drew slowly back, and dropped into his former seat. With almost breathless haste, Clodagh ran up the silent staircase of the hotel, and entering her own room, turned on the light, then, walking straight to the dressing-table, she paused and stared into the mirror at her own reflection. The sight of that reflection was not reassuring. Her face looked colorless, as only olive-tinted skin can look. Her wide eyes, with their narrowed pupils, seemed almost yellow in their intense clearness, while her whole air, her whole appearance was frightened, tired, pained. As she looked a nervous panic seized her, and she turned her gaze away. With freedom to look elsewhere, her eyes roved over the dressing-table, and suddenly fixed themselves upon a large square envelope bearing her name, which stood propped against the scent bottle. In nervous haste she picked it up and looked at it uncomprehendingly. It was unusually large and thick, and addressed in an unfamiliar hand. With the same unstrung haste she turned it about between her fingers, halting with new apprehension as she saw that its flap bore an elaborate black coronet and monogram. At last, with a strange sense of apprehension, she tore the envelope open. Circe, the letter began, I will not reproach you for deserting me. Life is too brief for reproaches, when one longs to fill it with pleasanter things. But be kind to me. Give me the opportunity of finishing that broken sentence. I shall smoke a cigar on the terrace at eleven to-night. If you are generous, wrap yourself up and keep me company for ten minutes. I shall wait and hope. Deerhurst. She read it to the end, and stood for a space staring at the large, straggling writing. 
At last, if suddenly imbued with the power of action, she tore the letter across, tearing and re-tearing it into little strips. Then, throwing the fragments on the ground, she turned and fled out of the room. Milbank's bedroom was on the same floor as her own, though separated from it by half the length of the corridor. Leaving her own apartment, she hurried towards it, and pausing outside the door, knocked softly and insistently. A delay followed her imperative summons, then Milbank's voice came faint and nervous, demanding the intruder's name. She answered, and a moment later the door was opened, with a confused sound of shooting bolts. Milbank's appearance was slightly grotesque as the open door disclosed him, silhouetted against the lighted room. He was garbed in a loose dressing-gown, his scanty hair was disarranged, and there was an expression of alarm on his puckered face. But for once Clodagh was blind to these things. With a swift movement she entered the room, and closing the door stood leaning against it. "'James,' she said breathlessly, "'you finished your business with Mr. Barnard today, didn't you?' Milbank, suddenly conscious of her white face, began to stammer. "'Clodagh, my dear, my dear!' But Clodagh waved his anxiety aside. "'Tell me,' she said, "'it's finished, isn't it?' "'Yes, yes, but my dear!' She threw out her hands in a sudden, vehement gesture. "'Then take me away,' she cried. "'Take me away. Let us go in the morning, by the very first train, before anyone is up.' Milbank paled. "'But, my dear,' he said helplessly, I thought, I believed. Clodagh turned to him again. So did I, she cried, so did I. I thought I loved it. I thought I loved it all, the music and the gaiety and, and the people. But I don't. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. In a strangled sob her voice gave way, and with it her strength and her self-control. She took a few steps forward. Then, like a mechanical figure in which the mechanism has suddenly been suspended, she stopped swayed a little, and dropping into the nearest chair, broke into a flood of tears, such tears as had shaken her four years ago when she drove out of Carrigmoor on the day of her wedding. End of Part 3 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com